Hello? Hello. Uh, good morning and welcome to Prague. Welcome to yet another cold run after a pause that we, I guess, didn't enjoy. But I'm really, really glad that you all, you all came in here. Um, as you know, you might be asking yourself, why am I talking to you and not Honza? And that is, uh, Honza's flight got cancelled yesterday, in case you didn't hurt yet. And uh, he got rerouted via Frankfurt. He's now watching YouTube, um, <laughs> attending the cold run remotely in, uh, at Frankfurt Airport. And he's about to board a flight fairly soon to Prague. And we should be able to greet him and give him a chance to welcome you again in the afternoon today when he will join us. Um, so yeah, it happened that I'm welcoming you. Um, we, this is a hybrid event now, so um, apart from us being here in person, we are streaming this uh, via Zoom. We are supposed to have Zoom participants, and we are also streaming this and recording this for YouTube. Uh, this means that uh, please make sure that when, whenever you are supposed to be heard as a part of a discussion that you use the microphone. If you ask a question um, and um, you're not talking to the microphone, the, the, the audience and the people watching the recording will not be able to hear it. I'm sure that you have all experienced that when watching various hybrid or, or remote conferences and it's not very nice. I know it happens all the time. Nevertheless, please try and avoid that. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if that was any other technical stuff that I was supposed to tell you? No, probably not. So I will not be prolonging this any longer. And I will invite Professor Neshat Till uh, on, on behalf of the faculty um, of uh, math and physics of the Charles University to welcome you also. So. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, well, it's a really pleasure to welcome you again here. I mean, I, despite of my old age, I still remember many, many faces which I have seen a few years ago, or some faces which I have met years ago. We are very happy that, uh, to, to, uh, to shelter this uh, and organize this meeting. I mean, my connection to it is that I, that, uh, I am a, a chairman of the DIMA, one of the organizations which is supporting it, uh, um, or which is sheltering it, uh, DIMATIA. And, uh, and we have this uh, Computer Science Institute of Charles University, which we have for about uh, 10 years now. And, uh, and this is a sort of elite, elite uh, group of uh, theoreticians, well, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, say. And uh, this is important meeting. I have a, I'm a mathematician, so I have a proof for it. You know, I, here on the, on the corridor is another meeting, right? Well, the, all the time meetings here, I mean, because people like this building. And, uh, and, the, and the first floor is basically uh, uh, for the conferences. And so there is a, uh, uh, another meeting, which is until today, and this is by astronomers. Maybe you have seen this, uh, they have some zodiac or whatever as a symbol. And uh, when we organize a meeting, the, uh, then usually if I tell what is it about, uh, then uh, people say, oh yeah, I mean, oh yeah, Ramsey theory, oh yeah, interesting. Uh, and, uh, but so I, told, I, told, I told him that, uh, that uh, I'm going to this other meeting, and he said, what is it about? Uh, I, I said, well, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, uh, software uh, engineering or uh, software conference. And I said, oh, I know, no, we, we are using NU, you know. <laughs> so so, so I mean, they know, certainly, what, what this is, or uh, they are your customers. You know? <laughs> so, 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 Maybe that's the first time that other group understood what this is. <laughs> so welcome, welcome to Prague. I mean, welcome to to this building. This uh, building has, of course, illustrious history. I don't know whether whether I told you last time. I'm not taking the time, but I will allow me a few sentences. This house is called uh, Prof's House. Yeah, what is it? This Prof's House. Well. This says it belonged to Jesuits. Jesuits are a religious uh, group, right? <laughs> a big religious group. And uh, 
and uh, prophecies uh, were uh, not professors or professionals. No, no, no. These were uh, general inspectors. I mean, they were uh, high in the hierarchy. In fact, were uh, directly subordinated to the general. And they, in, in anti-reformation time, in the 17th century, uh, they were uh, all-powerful. These guys were uh, really, they were uh, deciding who will be burnt on the stake or not, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and they were, uh, and they were uh, feared, right? And so they have a, around the world, they had a, a network of safe houses where they stayed, you know. They have one in France, you know, for the Middle Europe, it was, uh, it was here. Uh, and they have one in Mexico, you know, in Argentina. This was, uh, this was a global network of the thing. And uh, so because, uh, so these were uh, guarded places which were, uh, where they could safely stay, yeah, I mean. <laughs> In some sense, sometimes history is repeating, right? <laughs> okay, so welcome again. I'm happy that we were, have the opportunity to host you. I think it is for the first time, first time, right? So maybe let's face to the bright future. Welcome and thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. And before I hand it over to David, uh, I did forget one thing to tell you. The lightning talks that were originally planned to be right now in the room uh, above us have been moved to S10, which is, I, I suppose is the room right, right next to us. And they are going to be at 4.30 this afternoon rather than right now. So, so at you know, the first slot, uh, there is only one, and it's David talking about about, uh, yeah, of course, the analyzer. <laughs> what else? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, testing, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Um, hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Malcolm. I work at Red Hat on GCC uh, on, uh, on diagnostics, errors and warnings to the user, and specifically uh, on the uh, static analyzer that I added in GCC 10. And I'm going to be talking about um, what's new for in G the upcoming GCC 13 in the analyzer. And so I'll talk about what this is. I'm going to be a bit of a sidetrack. Uh, this isn't on serialization of diagnostics, being able to um, save them to a file and, and possibly replay them. And that's not just for the analyzer, that's for any warnings and errors coming out of GCC. Uh, I'm going to show you the, the new warnings we've added so far to the analyzer for GCC 13. Um, talk about some of the internal improvements I've made inside the analyzer. And uh, I've been trying to build and analyze the Linux kernel using the analyzer um, and it makes an excellent, I guess, torture test for the analyzer and hopefully find some problem, well, hopefully not find any problems in the kernel, I suppose, um, and, uh, and talk, so I'll be talking about that. So it, just to um, sort of give you an overview of the subject matter, uh, Dash F Analyzer is a GCC option um, as of GCC 10 onwards. <coughs> Although the implementation in, original implementation in GCC 10, was, I made a couple of fairly major design mistakes, um, but which I fixed in GCC 11. So I'd recommend don't use it until GCC 11. Um, it's a static analyzer, so it, um, it's a sort of a, uh, a warning on, I guess, on, it's like a GCC warning on steroids. It does a fairly expensive analysis of the source code being compiled. It tries to explore um, interesting for some definition of that word, interesting paths through the code, intraprocedurally, uh, using a technique called symbolic execution, where we basically essentially simulate what's going on inside the program. We have a symbolic representation of the state of memory. We can attach various, you can, various state machines for describing different APIs. For example, resource gets acquired, resource gets released, and resource gets acquired again, and oops, we didn't release it, we've got a leak. And so we explore the control flow, the uh, graph, the call graph, and sort of the data flow in one unified representation uh, to try and, and basically find problems and issue them as warnings to the user. It's, um, it uses various approximations and heuristics to try and explore the user's code, but of course there's no way of fully analyzing in, you know, precisely what a program does. So there are various ways in which there can be, we can miss 
things who have false negatives, and various ways in which we can report things that aren't really problems, false positives. Um, but hopefully the output is useful. And I get quite a bit of, I've had quite a few anecdotal reports from users that, oh, this found a problem in my code, which is, which is great. The main information page, or sort of a landing pad for, for information on it, is on the GCC wiki, on the static analyzer page. And that, um, and that has links to the documentation. And every time I add a new feature or fix a major problem, I, I put a note in there. There's a sort of history of the project in there. The initial release in GCC 10 added 15 warnings control bear, mostly related to memory, so memory leaks, use after free, and so on and so forth. And each release, we've added more warnings. Um, and currently, for GCC 13, um, 42 warnings, um, and hopefully more than that by the time we actually release. 42 is a good number, I agree. <laughs> but 43 would be better, uh, and, you know. Um, the more the better, I feel. Uh, so before I talk about um, the analyzer, there are various improvements I've made to the diagnostic subsystem as a whole. So this, the stuff I'm going to talk about now applies to all errors and warnings, not just those coming from the analyzer. Uh, in GCC 9, I added, well, traditionally, errors and warnings, the output from, to, the, to the user or to the, the from GCC has been, we spew out a bunch of text to standard error, saying there's a problem here, there's a problem there. And as we've made the output richer and richer and conveying more and more detailed information, it gets more and more unreasonable to exp well, that, that output is intended for humans, and people have written regular expressions and other type things to try and carve up that output and make it machine readable. But there's a tension between, as we make the, that information richer and more interesting, for example, we're showing execution paths through the code. You don't want to be parsing, uh, trying to parse that. You need a machine-readable format. So in GCC 9, I added dash f diagnostics format equals JSON. And if you use that, it, instead of the usual text format, it emits um, a JSON representation of the diagnostics to standard error. And that, that was just a custom format I invented that fairly closely re resembles the GCC's internal representation of the diagnostics. Uh, and so for GCC 13, um, I've added an alias for that, uh, diagnostics format equals JSON stood error, so that I can also, I found it was kind of clunky because you, in a build, you, you would have to kind of redirect things and capture it, um, the various outputs if you're trying to get the, what are all the problems across the whole of the build. Uh, so I added a format equals JSON file, which outputs to a file based on the source file name. So you could then go, go in and then say, what, write a script to gather all the problems in the build. And, and that's good. But the, um, there is a new standard, well, it's not so new anymore, that's emerging from uh, Microsoft have been championing this, called Serif, which stands for the Static Analysis Results Interchange Format, which sort of does what it says. Uh, it's a JSON-based file format. Uh, I think there's a 300-page specification, um, which arguably is 100 pages, well, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very detailed specification, but it has a lot of functionality in it uh, where you can express the results of analysis of a, both text files, such as source files, and also binary files. You can, say, you can do things like, if you're writing a virus checker, you can, you can express that these bytes here match a particular known bad signature. Um, so you can express ranges of bytes and things like that. Um, you can express fix-it hints for potential fixes to the code. You can, express you can express the sort of execution path information. You can even do multi-threaded execution path information. You can say, this stuff is happening on this thread, and then this thing happens on this thread, and boom, we've got a race condition or problem. And the idea being that you have producers of this of this information, static analysis tools, or just compilers, or you know, virus checkers, and so on. And, um, and Microsoft have added a whole bunch of, of tooling into GitHub, I believe, so that it's this. So it, seem, it seems a decent enough standard. 
and so it seemed a good one to support. And so I've added diagnostics format equals um, serif stood error and serif file, similar to the JSON options. And um, here is where I show you a screenshot of Visual Studio. So this is a um, Visual Studio code, in fact, which as I understand is the open source version of Visual Studio. And this is showing a double free bug where, um, so Visual Studio has a, uh, Visual Studio code has a serif extension for viewing, uh, a sort of a mode for viewing uh, serif files. And here it's showing, yeah, we've got the source code and at line five, um, yeah, if, we, if the flag, if flag is true and the fir you know, we go into the block, the free is called and then free is called again outside the if condition. And so this is output from the GCC static analyzer that's been emitted as a serif file being visualized and showing here's the, you, you can see the yellow text at the top is showing step one following the true path. So that's information emitted by the GCC static analyzer. And you can again see the analysis steps in a tab in the bottom half of the screen. Now what I'm hoping is that there, is, there are some Emacs hackers in the room who can implement an Emacs mode for this. Um, because hey, why, you know, Visual Studio shouldn't have all the fun. Um, so, um, but there are other things that it can do, like, uh, as I say, fix it hints, so that you can put little, it, you can, it, the IDE can put little underlines under the code, and you can say, there's a problem here, fix it, and you click on it, and it fixes it. Um, and, and in fact, if we wanted to do that in Emacs, there's already an environment variable we can set that makes GCC emit machine readable fix it information to standard error as part of its normal thing. So that's an easier way of doing it. Might be an easier way for Emacs to implement that. But if you're an Emacs hacker, please come talk to me because I'm very, I use Emacs and I want to be able to use this stuff. Um, so the, that was, that's sort of talking about GCC as a producer of this format, about being able to save um, diagnostics, for example, static analysis warnings, but warnings and errors in general in a build into a machine readable format. And sort of the other side of that would be GCC as a consumer of this information. Oh, sorry. And being able to play back, um, excuse me, being able to play back um, diagnostics. So, um, I pa I pa I, um, so the stuff I just showed you is in GCC trunk for GCC 13. I posted a patch kit back in June to try and do replay. And the idea is, so for example, here is a serif file from, I think it's ESLint, which is a JavaScript linter. And the, and the idea is, well, we can do GCC example.serif, and it replays using GCC's diagnostic printing routines. Um, like, and here is an error in this JavaScript file. Um, and there are some issues with it, which is how do you find, if, for, for example, quoting the source files um, and there's sort of a nasty logic about are the paths in the serif file relative to the build or are they relative to the path of the, the serif file? And exactly how do you express, like, I want to do a build, I want to gather all the information, and then, um, you know, do I want to present this sort of... Because I guess the idea for this is for generating reports about a build. You want to sort of gather all the information, all the problems in a build, and sort of gather them up and like present them in the, the use cases, like sort of presenting them in some sort of UI, so we can mark not a problem, not a problem, or and compare them against earlier runs and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and I'm not quite sure exactly how some of that patch should work. So I posted that, and um, I don't know if that's going to get into 13 because I'm, I'm not sure of some of the answers to that. But this seems interesting and worth mentioning. So that was talking about improvements to the um, analyzer, sorry, the improvements to the GCC diagnostic subsystem in general. And this applies to all errors and warnings. Now I'm going to talk about improvements to the static analyzer component. Um, and so we've got a whole bunch of new warnings. Um, I implemented four new warnings relating to um, var var variadic arguments in C, the studarg.h. Um, so, the, uh, hopefully that is readable. The, so, the first one is doing type checking of 
um, varags, where we have a, a function that um, passes, uh, I guess, a format string and a, an int. Uh, I guess 1066 was my int. I don't know why I picked that. And um, so a function consume long. And because the analyzer can analyze interprocedurally, it can analyze from the call site. It's been passed an int as a var arg. And then at the var um, thing, it's trying to consume it as a long. And as I understand it, it will just scrape data off the stack and get garbage. And so that's a problem for the, like, for, you know, it's, it, may, it might be trying to extract 64 bits of when there's only 32 bits there. And because we've got this interprocedural analysis, we can go from the call site, hopefully all the way down into the VARAG passing, and get that and, and find type mismatches that way. So it's sort of a way of getting dash W format for free, in air quotes, um, for, um, for general uh, but getting it from the source rather than from um, having to hard code it inside GCC's implementation of, uh, uh, of uh, say, this is a particular format string or, or whatnot. So that's the, sorry, that's the dash W analyzer VAR type mismatch. So my, my, my option names tend to be quite long, um, but, um, well, they're, they're descriptive, I guess. Um, and then the next one is VA list exhausted, where I, I have my, um, I'm passing it, consume n ints, and this one takes how many ints to consume? Let's consume two of them, and let's pass, oops, only one of them to the, the function. And you can see it goes into the loop and it analyzes. We go into the loop, we follow a true branch to there, then we follow back to the top of the game, we go the second time in, oops, no more arguments, one consumed. I think what I should be doing probably is showing each VARG call in that execution part. So you can see here's the first argument being consumed, and now we try and consume the second, and there isn't one there. And boom, we've, I believe what will happen is it will just read garbage from the stack. Um, well, I guess it depends on exactly how VARG is implemented on the particular target. But so it is a problem. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't, I don't complain about um, surplus arguments because that isn't a problem in general. But this will, um, as I say again, it's got that sort of interprocedural link between the call site and the implementation, assuming that the, the, the analyzer can see both, uh, both, uh, both functions. Uh, so now that's if you run out of arguments. The next one is. Yeah, you need to call VA end on any VA arg that you've acquired, either by VA start or, and here's an example where you, we do a VA start, then we VA copy it to create a second copy of the argument um, um, list. And when we fall off the end of the function, and it can say, yeah, the VA copy was called here at event one, and at event two, we fall off the end of the function, goes out of scope, and we've, but we've forgotten to call VA end on that one that was created at event one. Uh, so that's, we can complain about that leak, which depending on how VARG is implemented on the target, that could be a genuine resource leak. I think it, it's a target dependent thing. And VA list use after VA end, which is, yeah, you call VA start, VA, do some stuff, VA end, and then if you do a VARG after you've called VA end, we can uh, complain about that um, because presumably it might have been, I don't, again, this potentially is a crash depending on how VAR has been implemented on, and it, you know, it might not be on a particular target, but on other targets it might be. So those are the variadic argument things I've added. That's all in trunk for um, for for GCC 13. I've added a, a couple of new ones. I already had testing for jump through an uninitialized pointer, and then I realized, well, I probably should be testing for jumps through null pointers as well. So that was a fairly trivial one to add. Um, and I've got an, I have an example where I have a sort of a struct with lots of callbacks, and uh, what you can't see in here is there's a mem set to zero out the whole struct, and maybe there's some initialization happens, and then we call, a, call it the on redraw callback, and it hasn't been initialized. Well, it hasn't been changed from null, so it's a jump through null. I probably should show this is where the null comes from, and exactly how I'm generating execution paths to visualize in the, you know, to the user could use some improvement, and I've been dabbling with a rewrite. Um, right now, the way I do that is 
heavily favoring the sort of the state machine part of state tracking. It tries to visualize, it tries to show the user state changes that are, are, that are pertinent. And I've been sort of trying to refactor that, but um, it's a fairly major job. And I don't, well, I hope to do it at some point, but I don't know if I'll make it for GCC 13. So this is where the null comes from. Uh, but I'm, so I'm, as you can see, it, 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 it finds it, and hopefully the user can then figure out where that's coming from. But ideally, it would show that where the null value for that, um, that, that callback field would have come from. Um, and then um, this, 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 this is a shameless Clang does it, so we should do it too. Um, warning, um, put em of auto var. Um, and here we have, um, yeah, if you put em takes a pointer and it, as I understand it, 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 there's a global environment array of pointers inside a process and, and put em just puts a pointer into that array. So if you put a pointer into a stack-based buffer, uh, in this example here, as it shows you that buff is declared on the stack, and that's where it's declared, then the, um, when you, after you return from the function, your environment array has got a pointer to garbage in it, which is dangerous. Um, at some point, bad things will happen. And I have the suggestion, you set env, it, it's safer, as I understand it. And it, it, you know, if, it, it could be safe to do it if you update the environment before the, the function e exits, but it seems dubious, it seems risky. This, well, this slide demonstrates another general feature, not just for the analyzer, but for diag the diagnostic subsystem. If you look at the, um, the warning line, so um, put env on pointed to automatic variable buff, you'll see pos34c. Now, I think in GCC, 10, I added the ability for diagnostics to have metadata, um, but the only metadata I supported was CWE codes. CWE is a, um, the common, weak, common weaknesses enumeration, and it's a sort of a sister database to the CVE database, so it was the common vulnerabilities and exposures um, um, database uh, from MITRE. And, and CW is a sort of taxonomy of different mistakes that it's possible to make in, in, in code. The idea being to try and say, it, have a unique code for use after free or, um, I don't know, out of bounds access. And, um, but there are other taxonomies and there are, for example, there are coding standard guidelines. And so the one, one thing I've added in, G in GC13, and this is in Trump, is that the diagnostic metadata class can have just, you can add your own custom rules. And a rule basically has a name, which in this case is pos 34 c This is from the, um, what is it, the Carnegie Mellon Cert C secure coding guidelines saying do not, um, do not, which says, do not call, um, uh, what is it, put env with a pointer to the stack. And so, yeah, okay, we can say it's a, an instance of that, of, uh, it's a violation of that rule in that, in that coding standard. And so that, that the name, it also carries with it a URL. And if you're in a sufficiently smart terminal, you can, you can it, that will be underlined and you can click on it. It'll take you to um, Carnegie Mellon's um, page describing that particular problem. And also that information, because we have serif output, serif has support for taxonomies and rules and capturing that kind of metadata about a problem. Um, so we can say, here's a description of what's going wrong, here's how to fix it, here's, what, or here's why it's a problem, here's why you shouldn't do this, and, and how to mitigate it, and all that kind of good stuff. Where, and, that, and that's just like a click away in the terminal. I, for Google's Summer of Code this year, I've mentored two students um, who've both done a great job on, um, on their projects. Um, first, uh, first, I'll talk about uh, uh, Tim Lange, I hope I'm pronouncing his surname correctly. And he's been looking at, um, looking at implementing warnings sort of based around the tracking of memory inside program states that we track inside the analyzer. And he's been testing these on, yeah, as I say, uh, the four, uh, core utils, curl, HTTPD, and OpenSSH to try and um, to try and make sure that we don't we get a decent. Um, 
of what I call signal to noise ratio, not too many false positives on real sort of idiomatic C code from a bunch of different open source projects. And so first off, um, hopefully that doesn't get too small uh, on the font size. Dash W analyzer allocation size. And this looks, if you have an assignment to a pointer, and this is like, he's, if you're making this sort of int32 star, which he was, we, I guess we assume is a, a, an array of int32s, um, and we've got a malloc of n times size of int16, um, it's probably meant to be int32, not int16. Maybe there's a copy and paste error. Um, because that way you'll, you'll get this buffer that's a multiple, you know, an int32 star probably should be a multiple of four bytes in size. So you've got a, you know, an, a whole numbered set of int32s. But n times size of int16, is you'll, if, it, if n is odd, then you'll, the buffer will have only room for half of a int32 at the end. More. Okay, um, and um, I guess this is, I have, I, was saying, I have not implemented sound effects for GCC's diagnostic <laughs> subsystem. And that, that, that I feel would be, um, um, that, would, that would be suboptimal. Um, and, and, and so he's implemented this and you can see that the warning, and we're allocating n, well with a cast, n times two bytes and it's assigned to n32 star, which is size of four. And so that is bad. Um, and uh, is there a CW? there's a CWE code as well, as you can see, the, the metadata. And the, um, where was I going with that? that uh, and and he as I say, he tested this on a bunch of real world code. And so there are various, um, he's tuned the warning for a lot of common cases like the trailing array member of structs. Um, so if we see that, uh, we just don't issue the warning because um, uh, where you have a struct that might have stuff hanging off the end is a reasonably common um, idiom in C. Um, so, um, and so this warns for things that are wrong like that, but not for, uh, I don't, for the, various fun the, ver the various things he, uh, he tested it on. As he was working on this, um, uh, one of the test cases we came up with was with what happens if you have pass in a float, um, floating point number into how big the allocation size should be. And um, which, well, first of all, it crashed the analyzer with an internal <laughs> compiler error, which obviously we didn't want to do. And he said, oh, we can fix this and put in a check. And I thought, well, it seems really dubious to be using a floating point number to, count, you know, to figure out how big your buffer should be. Because floating point, there are all kinds of Problem, I mean, uh, all kinds of problems with floating point. Uh, I mean, I don't think, I don't fully understand floating point. I mean, hands up here and who in the room fully understands floating point? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm on the point in the, the Dunning-Kruger curve where I know that I don't fully understand floating point. Um, and um, so the, where was I going? The, uh, <laughs> the, yeah, so, so he, we, he, he implemented a, basically anywhere we see a value being computed that makes its way to a size calculation, be it for a, a size of a malloc or the size of a copy of bytes or something like that. If floating point gets used, that seems dubious. So we have this new, it was originally dash w analyzer dash imprecise dash floating dash point dash arithmetic, um, which would be the, the new record for the length of a GCC option. Uh, although to be fair, I had already created one that I think was only two characters shorter. So, but I, uh, so let's make it just dash FP arithmetic. So, so that's a, that, that one sort of fell out of that earlier patch. Uh, I don't know that if, if that'll ever fire, but it seems like don't, yeah, don't use floating point for calculating buffer sizes. That's weird and wrong. The, the, uh, but the thing he implemented that I'm most excited about is this dash W analyzer out of bounds, which is a bounds checker for the, uh, for, the, for the analyzer. Every single read and write to memory that's in the simulated, in the simulation the analyzer is doing, uh, is checked for, uh, is now bounds checked. His initial implementation was, uh, he's looking at the, or the, the analyzer is looking at for every, for every read or write, 
where is the where is the start of the access, where is the end of the access, and what is the relative to the memory region, um, I, and exactly what that means um, is complicated, um, because you can have um, sort of symbolic regions for, yeah. Uh, I could go on a great length of, talk to me after if you want to know about the implementation details of the analyzer, uh, but also the, um, how, what is the capacity of this region, because you could have a fixed size buffer, or you might know that the buffer is like four times n for some n that you've, that's a symbolic value, like the value of a parameter, or more complicated symbolic expressions. And the, um, his initial implementation um, checked for uh, out-of-bounds reads and writes where each of those three things, the offset for the start, the offset for the end, and the capacity of the what's being uh, um, accessed are Const, uh, sort of known constants rather than symbolic. But then he, he's generalized it um, for many cases of symbolic accesses. So here's an example of, um, we have a, a sort of a string struct, which is a length and then a variable length, um, a flexible array of char hanging off the end that we're allocating. Um, and so we have a malloc of uh, the size of that struct um, plus of the length of the string that we're doing. Um, I messed up the warning last week, unfortunately. You'll see those two messages about the capacity, and that, that's a bug I introduced, unfortunately, but I'm gonna fix that. But you so say the capacity of this allocation is len plus eight bytes, the, the size of. And then, yeah, we do the error checking to check that we got a non-null back from malloc. Um, and then, we, yeah, we populate the length field of the struct, and then, oh, let's set the the thing, the data field, this flexible array thing hanging off the end, and let's add a null terminator on the end. Well, oops, we forgot to add an extra byte in the malloc for the, for the, the zero terminator. Ah, oh, uh, Thomas, you have your, uh, various people have their hand up, and uh, I think if you pass the microphone. I was just curious why it's uh, highlighting event four here, the len store into the string class. Uh, why the why the analyzer is highlighting or I'm um, outputting the event for the len store into the oh, it, it's it's anal it's highlighting that there is a control flow it's following the true branch of the if statement to that statement okay um, and so it's um, ideally there will be some ASCII art showing an arrow showing it's going from here to there. Um, and that's the only reason why it's highlighting line, line 15, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Right. That, because that's not relevant to the yeah. actual problem. It's purely a way of showing that the control flow is you've got a, you're going from line 14 and you're following the if, ah. if the if straight is true, because true is, when true is non-null to line 15, it's mm -hmm. considering the case where the allocation succeeds. So that also covers line 16 then basically just to follow the, the execution Thread, yeah, yeah the, the way I print execution paths is I sort of, I try and show each event, and if the events are sufficiently close together, I just combine the, um, the, the, into a single, so you can see, here's a chunk of quoted source code to try and minimize the total amount of source code I'm spewing out at the user, although, I mean, it's often quite verbose. Um, but yeah, and at line 17, you see event five, it's the right of that byte is at offset len plus h8, which is one off the end of the buffer. And, and so this is in trunk, and so we have, and yeah, and I'd say he generalized it, and it covers many cases where the start offset and the end offset of the access and the capacity, all three of those potentially can be symbolic. So you've got a len plus eight, where len is a, it's a parameter passed into this function. Um, so this is pretty cool. We've got a, uh, like a, a off by one um, bounds checking. It violet, finds this bounds, out of bounds problem. Um, and, it's, and it's symbolic, which I'm, I'm not sure we had before in the um, existing middle end warnings. And um, the wording could use some improvement. And I've got, um, I'm hoping for, um, well, certainly before the release of GCC 13, to do a big 
overhaul of the wording and try and catch some of the special cases so we can say it's an off by one and nice tweaks to that, although there's a bit of a combinatorial explosion of all the different possibilities. But I've got some ideas. There's a bug in uh, Bugzilla about that. Uh, so yeah, so that, that's a feature I'm very excited about. Um, so the, my other Summer of Code student, I'm waiting for time here, um, Imad Mir, he was looking at, um, he's been looking at file descriptor APIs. And he's added five new warnings that are in trunk and three new attributes for describing so you can mark up functions to say that, they, that a particular int parameter of a function is in fact a file descriptor and expects a, you know, an open, sane file descriptor, or maybe one that's open specifically for reading or specifically for writing. And he's also special cased of a, in the analyze of knowledge about the behavior of certain common functions, open, well, the ones I show on the slide. Uh, and he, he's working on, I think, currently working on pipe. Um, and there's a bunch more in, in Bugzilla. So the first warning he's implemented, or he's implemented various ones. The first I'll talk about is analyzer FD use without check. So here in this example, line six, we have an old fire descriptor. We try and duplicate it. And, and then we use it at line seven on the read call, but we haven't done any kind of error checking on it. And so what we're doing with this sort of state machine is all file descriptors are being tracked with, and we know that this, is a, this has been attempted to be opened, but we haven't yet done any error checking on it. So it's in sort of in that state in the state machine. So when we see the read, it passed to the read call, we say FD could be invalid, it's unchecked. Here's where it comes from at event one. Um, so presumably you want to put some sort of error checking in, in between the, the dup2 and the read. Um, we're also within the state machine, we're tracking, if we know it, whether the file script was opened read only or write only. So we see at line six, f is opened read only. Um, and then we have various events where, where rather verbosely, we say that error checking has occurred, uh, assuming that it's valid when we follow the f is not negative one path. And then at line five, when we're trying to write to f, through f, uh, we can complain, well, it's a write on a read-only file descriptor with dash def analyzer fd access mode mismatch. So that's another new one that's new in GCC 13. We have a double close checker. So if a file descriptor gets closed, we transition it to the closed state in our state machine. And so yeah, we have the, the first close is at line seven. And oops, we close it again. Maybe it's a copy and we were a bit, um, we accidentally copied a line, or maybe it was a merge conflict, and uh, there's a second close, event three, and there's, here's where the first close was. Or maybe there's a more complicated control flow, and it will be showing you that and where the different closes happen. And finally, and this is, I don't know, and for me, I feel this is the most important one, is um, because file descriptors reflect a resource that is being, con uh, for the process, um, if you don't clean them up, that will, that's a leak, and that's a leak of a real resource that will gradually, um, you know, you'll eventually run out of them. And so at line six, we open um, a file script and store it in FD. And if we don't, and if that val symbolic value never uh, gets stored anywhere and we fall off the end of the function here at line seven, we can complain that FD is leaking here, and here's where it's opened. Maybe you have an error handling path where you forgot to clean up. Um, oh yeah, and use after close. If you, here's an example of one of the attributes where you, we, we've closed FD and then we pass it to function F, and we know that, and we're complaining that F is being called past this this closed file descriptor. Here's where it's closed at event one, and F and we note has been marked up with this new attribute FD arg, and what we're, that is saying is that FD arg one means that argument one of F is that is expected to be uh, an open file descriptor. And you know, it's expected to, and that actually says this, is expected, this int is expected to be an open file descriptor that's been checked, that's been error checked from wherever it came from. And we'll issue those other 
all the various warnings I've already showed you if, it, if it's already been closed or if, if it's the wrong access mode. Because yeah, there, there are three of these. There's FDR and there's also FDR read and FDR write to say this is expected to be, as well as being open and, and error checked, it's also expected to have be, been opened for reading or opened for writing so that we can complain if you... Um, so yeah, and, and it's, it's, I guess it makes it easier if, you, if you've copied and pasted and you've messed up, like you've got one file descriptor for reading and one for writing and you get them confused. Um, it, this, that, that would help with that. So th that's the file descriptor stuff. And all of this is in shrunk for GCC 13. And uh, I, I've been playing around with a few other warnings. Um, I've been playing around with the deref before check, which looks for if a pointer gets dereferenced, to basically say if that pointer that was dereferenced is then checked for, it was, was it null or not? Um, well, was, if, it's, if, it, if you're checking that it's null, maybe you shouldn't have dereferenced it already, um, because if it is null, you're going to get a crash. And also because the optimizer, GCC optimizers, I believe, will assume that if you're, oh, you're dereferencing that? It can't be null, and it might actually eliminate, optimize away the null check. Um, and which I, sus I think some of our users get unhappy with. But, so I've been experimenting with this, and unfortunately I, um, I haven't yet got it. I got it working for some simple cases, um, but there's a fair amount of work to do before it, I, I would want to... to for example, it, it doesn't work well with um, interprocedurally, because you might, might dereference a pointer and then call a support function where you pass that pointer in. And that support function might allow for accept null pointers and have a, ch a check within it, at which point you've checked something that you've already referenced. But it's in, a, it's in a different function. So there's a sort of aspect of what is the, sort of the, 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 the scope of that, of, of that warning. And also, it, um, I've got some implementation details where it explodes the complexity of the analysis. So I don't know if I get that in. Uh, next, um, I want to solve the halting problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> joke. Um, and um, so I work it, I've been playing around with a dash, yeah, a dash infinite recursion and dash infinite loop um, warnings. Um, and more seriously, um, the, 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 the case here is if you have Say you do, you've got, you, you write for int i equals blah, 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 i less than blah, 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 and then you say, oh, I'll, I'll do a nested loop, and then you copy and paste for j equals blah, 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 blah. And as, but in, within that blah, 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 I just said, yeah, you forgot to update the i plus plus incrementing i, and that you've got a second increment of i in the inner for loop. And so j in your inner loop isn't changing at all. And you'll never leave that loop. And uh, can we detect that statically? Um, and, and I have a prototype for working for some simple cases. The problem with that I've ran into was that sometimes you get, in terms of GCC's internal represent representation, just a basic block that's empty, no statements at all, with a um, just looping back on itself. And at that point, well, what's the source location of that when you report it to the user? There's no statements. And only some edges in our control flow graph have location information. I think, I think we have a location T value in our edge type for control flow graph. But we only ever populated it for a few things. And would it be a problem if, if we populated it more, because that might be useful for that. And I'm watching people's facial expressions, and I'm not quite sure if I'm getting a read. The other is I've structured inside the analyzer, I've structured the way I handle diagnostics. So everything assumes there is a Gimple statement that a diagnostic is associated with. And there's a bunch of other information. But I kind of feel I'm going to need to generalize it to just working on locations, because there might not be a statement for this kind of thing. It's more of a control flow graph-based thing. And um, one of my summer code students, Tim, ran into another issue where he wanted to say, I think it was, yeah, it was on, a, on a function call statement. He was saying, well, sometimes I want to express the warning on the parameter, and sometimes I want to express a warning on the assignment of the return code to the left-hand side of the call. And I, you know, and, and it's like, oh yeah, I, I need, I, you know, we need to overhaul this. So that, I'm, there's some sort of internal workings that I'm meant to do there. The, um, 
Tim, my summer of code student, also experimented with a, a, an analyzer version of the a restrict warning. And we ran into an issue. Um, so this isn't in trunk, this one. So say you've got this function h. It takes a size and three pointers. Now, if you ignore the function body for now, and you say, well, but you notice that the three func um, pointers have all been marked restrict. What does that mean? Um, and I'm not, and, I have, and we were looking at the C standard. We were also looking at this new draft um, update to the standard that has changed, uh, add, added some clarifying paragraphs to the meaning of restrict. Now, I believe dash w restrict currently will warn, if we pass h and say, let's call h and pass in 100, and we pass in a, b, and b again. Now, the, the, those final parameters have been marked restrict. Are we allowed to pass the same array as parameters three and four, given that it's been marked with restrict? Um, I believe GCC's current implementation of dash w restrict and, and Tim's implementation of dash w analyzer restrict says you can't do that because it's marked restrict and you've got an aliasing, but b and b are the same thing. But our reading of this updated draft of the C standard seems to suggest, well, actually, if you look at the body of H, those Q and R, those final things, well, they're only ever read from. There isn't a real problem, so this is well-defined, and you've got your hand up. Um, I knew this would get. <laughs> I just would add that in Fortran, this is correct. And hmm. Fortran was the idea to introduce strict pointers. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fortran, no, no. Do, Fortran does this much better. So, so the argument for this being correct is that B and B would be just read from, right? And not written to. Mm, yeah, they're, they're merely read from. But yeah. you need to see the inside of the function to know yeah, that. Which, yeah, I would agree with that reading. Yeah. It's, I'm sorry? I would agree with the reading uh, of it, so that, that... Which reading? That it is not worth a warning here, or that the warning would be incorrect here, because it's only read from. That we should warn or that we shouldn't warn? We should not warn. We should not warn. Yeah. Okay. Because that makes it much more... That was our feeling that well, we weren't quite which sure... Is often, which is, of course, surprising, indeed. I would yeah. Agree. And that's yeah. why this is not in trunk, because we got this... I don't know. Well, actually, and we warn about many things which, in fact, are correct to do, right? So we could warn because it's certainly uh, an, 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 uh, a bad style, right, mm. in this case. Yeah, uh, arguably, well, I think as a, we have this attribute access where we can document that this is only read from, yeah. uh, and maybe we could use that. I'm not sure. Uh, if I move on. Um, yeah, I've made some internal improvements to the analyzer. Um, i refactoring how I track call string, which is a detail of um, interprocedural analysis, which um, should hopefully eventually allow me to have a less bad implementation of how I summarize the effects of calls. That's a way of avoiding the, anal the analysis, ex anal analysis exploding. Um, I, the analyzer runs pretty late compared to most static analysis tools are sensible and run on as close to the user's view of the code as possible. Like basically, it, on the, they take the um, abstract syntax tree coming out of the, um, the, the front end and work using that. Um, I was lazy and I'm using the um, Gimple SSA representation at the point where um, LTO um, is either spat out or read from, because I wanted to piggyback on that sort of cross-translation unit um, LTO thing so I can do link time analysis. Um, but the, the, and that win buys me some things, because um, the optimizers have already gotten to work on the code a bit, and we can potentially analyze a bit deeper. Uh, but unfortunately, the optimizers have already gotten to work on the code, and, um, the, and it means, for example, some inlining has already happened. And so showing you those sort of interprocedural, this gets called and that gets called, in before GCC 13, that could look really confusing if inlining has happened. And so in trunk for GCC 13, I've done some, it does some fix-ups, so it can sort of look at the 
inlining, recorded chain of inlining information that we store so that it can sort of reconstruct and there's a call to this and a call to this and so on. So you can kind of get the sense of, uh, of, of what, the, what inlining was done. Um, and it, hopefully it may, it, it's closer to the user's view of the code rather than the, the optimizer's view of the code. Um, I've extended uh, the GCC, the plugin hook. So you can, a GCC plugin can now tell the analyzer, this specific named function behaves in this specific way. For example, it has to consider it has a success case and a failure case, and on this case, it does this to memory and has this recite, these constraints on the return code, and in the failure case, it does that. So you can, you can, if you have an API that you want to teach it about, you can, you can kind of go to town without needing, like, very, very custom attributes. You can actually just program directly into the analyzer's internals with a plugin. And I've also been trying to use std unique pointer because I have a bunch of places in the analyzer where I say, this, is owned, this pointer is owned by the thing, whereas this is merely borrowed. And now that we can use C11 internally, it seems, well, maybe we should use C11 for expressing that this is an owned thing, this pointer. Um, and, one, and that sort of stalled because C11 adds std unique pointer, but the very useful make unique is C14. And so we need a sort of compat thing there somewhere in our source tree. And we kind of got bogged down exactly where that should land. But I think we just need to decide which, which color the bike should, should be um, and, get that, and get that in. Um, actually, talking about that, um, right now, to use std unique pointer, you need to include memory. Now, but before you do that, you have to do this. We don't do that. We have to def do hash define include memory right at the top of the source, the particular CC file. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. And it's a major pain in the backside because um, if you change a header to use a std unique pointer, every source file that includes that header um, in G inside GCC needs to modify it because I think we're poisoning a a token. This is, I'm diving deep into the weeds, and I, um, we can t may, I, I'll bring this up on the mailing list, uh, but it, it annoys me. Um, and yeah, the other thing I've been doing, um, as well as all these sort of general improvements, is trying uh, to build the Linux kernel with Dash F Analyzer. And so I've been building custom GC, um, GCC anal analyzer trees and then hacking up the kernel adding at my custom attributes and whatnot, and um, trying to find problems. And um, I found lots and lots of problems in the analyzer doing this. The Linux kernel makes a great, um, it's big and complicated, and, um, it, and therefore it, it shows up lots of problems. Many, some false positives, some just crashes, and others where the analyzer would just go off into the weeds and I'd sort of kill it after 20 minutes going, yeah, something's, it shouldn't take that long. And I fixed most of those. Uh, the one outstanding one near the top 1062.18, where um, the kernel internally, it likes to do error handling, Why right? there are many functions that return a pointer, but also potentially an error code that's a small negative value that's been stuffed into that pointer with a cast. Hmm. Uh, Aldi, and you, you, yeah. Did you find any real bugs in the kernel with your with the analyzer? I found a, a, a exposure of un, uninitialized data. So the question: Did I find any real bugs? I found an exposure of un, exposure of uninitialized data um, from the user space, but only in a test a sample module. That's not in. There's not an actual production module. It's more example code. Although arguably the example code should be correct. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, I've got the one outstanding bug where I need to teach my constraint handler that, you know, we'll get a false positive because we see this path in the code and this path in the code. I need, and the, there's a component within the analyzer which basically decides that, no, the, the, that combination of conditions is impossible. Um, so I, I hope to teach it that, but we get a lot of false positives from that right now. I've also, you know, running out of time here, been looking at um, the boundary between user space and kernel space. So what kernel specific warnings can I add? Uh, so here's an example of um, inside a module, you might have a copy, copy some data command from user. We look at the, um, we do a bounds check to see is it 
um, below the size of an array, and then we write through the array, but oops, that command on index, it's a signed integer, not an unsigned integer. So an attacker could pass an un, a, a negative value and use that to inject a write um, to manipulate kernel memory. And so I can warn about that. And the question is, how do I teach, or how do, the, the, how, what, how do we mark up the kernel so that we know about that this is untrusted information coming um, in one direction, and then the other direction, an information leak, where this is, this is the, the last, I have an exposure through uninit copy, where I have a, <laughs> there is a strange Cylon it's, it's thing it's looking, it's thing. okay, whatever, um, where a, a buffer is being copied back to user space, and I'm noting there's like three bytes of, so I have a warning that can detect this. I'm checking whether things are initialized at the per bit level, into procedurally, and so that on this execution path, which is a very simple one, there's three bytes of padding that haven't been written to, and potentially that contains secret information that the attacker might be trying to get back out via a system call. And I, yeah, I had a, did a talk about this at LPC earlier this week, and there's a kind of question of how do I, how do we in GCC provide features that are going to be useful to the Linux kernel community? Um, and, and how do they consume that? I think we can't just throw stuff over the wall every year and say, here, have at it. Um, and I, ha my, I did have a huge, like, 2,000, 3,000 line patch, and the solution I've come up with is, well, I don't, they don't like GCC plugins. I don't really like GCC plugins, but at least it can, I can make it a small plugin, and by moving much of this functionality into GCC and the analyzer itself, hence we have this new warning, but you can't do it unless right now, get that warning, the info leak warning, unless you use a custom plugin to teach the, teach the, the, um, the analyzer that this function works in this way. And so I've been looking at, um, and the kernel has hundreds of thousands of annotations to talk about, is this a user space pointer versus is it a kernel space pointer? I've been looking at extending GCC support for custom address spaces to add that, and I got a couple of ideas, and I posted a bad patch for that back in November that broke a bunch of back-end code, or would have done, but obviously we didn't do that. I got a much better implementation that I haven't posted yet that I hope to get in for GCC 13, and maybe an attribute no D, I used to, it's no deref, not node ref, meaning this is a pointer that can't be dereferenced, and you have your hand up and the your microphone. But running out of time here. Very quickly. Uh, so you target uh, inputs that uh, are out of bound for things like get user, uh, copy from user. So you do you intend to cover things like uh, specter mitigations? Yeah, um, that would require yeah, the question: Could you do spectre mitigations using um, this taint analysis? I guess, and the answer is possibly yeah. Because right now I'm looking at it. Do you have a particular, yeah, are you checking using greater than or less than on, on the bounds? But I think for, you need a special um, custom thing to like do a, do a, um, do a spectre safe check of this, uh, of this particular index that, to avoid the sort of, is it side channel attack or I can't remember the um, And so that is a possibility, yeah. Um, someone brought that up um, after my talk at LPC actually, so um, great idea. Um, and so, yeah, so we're running out of time. So, yeah, in summary, yeah, so I talked about um, some general improvements to GCC's diagnostics, so serialization, being able to save and load diagnostics, metadata. Yeah, if you're writing a plugin that implements a, co you know, a coding standard checker, um, like one of the MIS or Watermotive things or whatnot, you could, you could mark up your warnings that way and with links to particular um, violated rules. Um, the new warnings. And, uh, very, and all of that. And I, I really enjoy the analyzer. It's fun. Um, if you're, if hopefully this is exciting and people think, oh, this is cool, I want to work on it. We have lots of ideas for new warnings in Bugzilla. Or maybe you want to add warnings for your own. Uh, you can think of an API that you, would be a good fit. If you can model it as a state machine or um, maybe it's a good fit for how we're tracking memory, that would be good. So come and talk to me uh, here or on the mailing list. So, um, kind of out of time for questions. Well, we had some questions along the way. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, Aldi. Or maybe we've got two minutes. Uh, well, it's two minutes till 11. Um, 
How many of the existing middle end warnings can you remove or replace with your, with your work? Um, so yeah, we have these existing middle end warnings like with this string op, um, overflow and so on and so forth. That, Array bounds that are, that are based on the Gimple SSA implementation and the value range information that you're tweaking in the Ranger work. And previously I thought that would be a big job, but I've been quite encouraged by Tim's work on his, the out of bounds thing to think maybe we can do, maybe we can replace them. Um, I, I want to try, um, but obviously it's a big job. Uh, I'd like to ask about the allocation size warning, if it's a good fit for, for analyzer, if it shouldn't be something in the front end, because in the front end, the optimizations has, haven't changed the expression, so, so loose uh, at, at the analyzer point, whether it was shifted by one or and multiplied by two or, or something similar. Uh, in the front end, you can see it was size of, of, of this type or if it was two or, and, mm. and usually people write the cast directly in the, uh, in the same statement, so. That may be a valid criticism, yes. Um, I'm, the one advantage of doing it in the analyzer is you've got potentially, you've got the sort of the path-based, um, well, I was gonna say you could also, there, there's some sort of compound expression, um, but you, you've got that in the AST as well. So, yeah, um, maybe it is in the wrong place. Um, but on the other hand, this, this is implemented and, and works. If you want to implement it in the front end as well, be my guest, I guess. That's a, that's a um, I know there's a bit of a lazy answer by me, sorry. <laughs> All right, and I think we're, well, it's 11 o'clock, so um, time for the so next one, session. So one last question, if there is any. Oh, yeah. right on time. Yeah, well, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I guess who's on next? Yeah, the next uh, talk over here is anatomy of GDB for AMD GPUs, and above we have hardening features for GCC. Now we're live on YouTube.
Un 2-1-2, un, deux, patate poêle. Unmuted. Oh, uh, you have mute button. Okay. Speaking in two or? Yeah. No, just, just, no, 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 it's just, just me. Hey, mute? It's red, it's mute, green. Okay, this is the camera. Okay. Hi. Everybody hears me fine with this microphone? Good. Uh, hi, and welcome, and thanks for attending uh, this presentation. Uh, my name is Simon. Uh, so, this presentation is going to be about a ROC ROC GDB, which is a GDB port that targets AMD GPUs. Uh, this work and this presentation has been have been prepared uh, by uh, so Pedro and uh, Zoran and Lancelot who are here and uh, as well as Tony and Laurent who are part of the team but are not here today. So yeah, we're here all weekend. If you have more questions about about this, you can come and see us. Um, so I'm gonna try to get used to this legal stuff. <laughs> I hope you all had time to read. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, so first I'm going to give a quick explanation of what Rock GB is, if, if it's not obvious. Uh, then I'm going to, to explain a few problems about GPU debugging speed challenges that we faced and what makes this a different port than most uh, CPU ports in GDB. Uh, and then basically we're going to go over all these challenges and explain how we how we tackle them, how we solve them in in, in RockGDB. Uh, and then if we have time at the end, a bit of uh, other tangential tangentially related things about other contributions and upstreaming status. Um, so, like I said, RockGDB is a GDB port that is uh, meant for users to. I click on a button. Okay, uh, this is meant for users to debug applications that offload work using the Rockem platform to AMD GPUs. Uh, the, Ro the Rockem platform is basically the equivalent of CUDA, but the AMD world. Uh, these applications can be written in different languages, but typically we we're talking about HIP, uh, Heterogeneous Interface for Portability, uh, OpenCL, and I think there's also OpenMP that's missing from this list, but I've, I've been told that it's supported as well. Um, Sorry? I think you need the microphone, but I okay, guess it's just the... Sorry, yeah, it's... Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and basically what, what this makes it a non-straightforward GDB port is that, as you'll see, we're dealing with more than one target, which is debug target, which is unusual in, uh, in GDB. One debug, multiple debug targets in the same inferior. Um, and also, the, there's new levels of parallel, parallelism that come from GPU debugging that are currently not understood by GDB. So we need modifications for that. Um, 
So a little word about HIP, I mentioned the HIP language. HIP is basically some APIs and language extension on top of C++. So it's C++ ex extensions that allow you to write code that's going to get offloaded to a target device. Um, the goal of HIP versus, for example, the equivalent CUDA language is to write a single source program. So single source as in you have the host code and the code that's going to get, to get offloaded in the same source files, but also a single source that can get compiled down to, uh, to run on Rockem devices, so MD devices, as well as uh, CUDA devices. So a bit like a C program, can com com you can compile it down to, let's say, ARM and AMD64, and compiler takes care of that. Here, you write one, one source file, you can run it on Rockem and CUDA. So it's very good to, so to or like, let's say, very good for people who don't want to be locked in in a you know, single company's environment. I can't scroll my, my notes here. Uh, and as you'll see, this, the, the syntax is very close to CUDA, so it makes porting from an existing CUDA code base quite easy. Uh, this is an example of what a uh, HIP, very simple HIP program might look like. Uh, so first thing to notice is that you have the main function at the bottom, which is what is going to get executed on the regular host, and the device uh, function called kernel at the top. And I think it's pretty descriptive what it does, but basically, for example, you have this HIP malloc call, which is a part of the HIP API, which allocates memory on the device. Then this kernel with the triple bracket thing. This is a kernel dispatch, so this basically sends some code to get executed on the device. Uh, and this syntax is actually the same as, uh, as CUDA, so for those who, who know it. Uh, this call is non-blocking, so it sends the thing to get executed, and it carries on. Uh, however, there are some means of uh, synchronization, for example, the him bem copy at the end, which retrieves the result from the device to the host, uh, does an implicit synchronization, so it will wait for the kernel to finish its execution before retrieving the result, which is what you want, because it doesn't make sense to retrieve the results <laughs> before they're, they're ready. Um, just be sure. Yeah, the, the two 16s in the kernel dispatch, 16, 16, this defines the size of the work grid. So here we want to execute a lot of work in, in parallel. So this, the, these 16s means that we are executing the kernel on, a, on 16 groups of 16 items each for a total of 256 work items. And what will happen, so you can imagine in one dimension a row, a line of 256 items divided in 16 groups. And what will happen is that the kernel function at the top is going to get called once for each work item for a total of 256 invocations. Um, and this is a simple example in one dimension, but that, that grid, so that line in one dimension, you can also have a two dimension grid or a three dimension grid for, depending on your problem. But for this example, we're just in the one dimension. Uh, so from the, point of view of the, from the point of view of the user, it's basically call kernel 256 times on all these, these items. Um, and so each invocation of kernel can, is able to know which item it's working on uh, using these uh, hip variable intrinsics that you see at the, at, at the top. So hip block index, block dimension, and thread index. Uh, there's, a lot of, anyway, in my, in my impression, there's a, it's a bit confusing because there's different terms used for different things. So I talked about work groups, and here it's, you, you see block, uh, like for block index, that's the same thing. And I talked about work items and trade index, that's also equivalent. So depending on who you're talking to or which, which, which project, there can be multiple terms used for the same thing. Um, so, what are the challenges that this kind of programming brings uh, to GDB? So, one of the things is that 
the GPUs typically have multiple memory spaces. So you have some memory that is shared by the target, and, or by the device and the host uh, that is globally visible, but on the device you also have some, some memories that are visible, uh, accessible only by certain execution units or certain, uh, certain parts. So GDB and Dwarf need some modifications to, to, to cope with that. Also, our 256 threads of last slide, they're not going to be executed all independently. So it's not like you start 256 P threads and they execute all independently of each other. They're, they're going to be mapped uh, to hardware, thread, hardware threads using the uh, SIMT execution model. And what that means is that one hardware thread will execute possibly in our in a typical case, up to 64 uh, of these source threads that we're talking about. So, uh, so yeah, for example, and, and how this works is that you have these big registers uh, on the right, it's called so VGPR01 and up to 255, that are really large registers and that, that are separated in, in this case, 64 slots each. And when the hardware thread executes, each slot of these vector register represents the data of, so we call them lanes, it, represents, it contains the data of one source thread. So let's say you have a variable x allocated on the stack in your source code, um, then each, in, in the column lane zero is gonna contain the, the data for one work item. So you'll have one instance of variable x there. In lane one, it's gonna be a second, the data of a second source thread, et cetera, up to 64. So, but the thing is that the hard, all, all the lanes execute in the same hardware thread, so they're all at the same PC, and they all execute the same instruction at the same time, in lockstep. Um, yeah, and so, like I said, because of the overloading of the term thread, which, you know, if you, if you look at the source level, maybe the programmer will understand one thread being one work item, and us, we look at the execution on the device, we look at the thread being one hardware thread. Um, in the GPU world, it's, or at least in the Rockham world, one hardware, twel, hardware thread is called a wave. And you know it's based on the image that all the lanes that are advancing together are forming kind of a, a wave front. So when I say wave, it means a, basically a hard, hardware, hardware thread. Um, yeah. uh, so this is the high-level view of how RockGDB talks to the other components on, in the system to, 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 to debug things on the, on the GPU. Um, to control execution, everything eventually goes through the kernel. So in the Linux kernel, you have this, here it's called KFD driver, but I believe it's a bit of a legacy name because right now, I think now it's all offered or provided by the AMD GPU uh, driver. Uh, but basically it provides some interface for user space to control, uh, control debugging of what runs on the, on the device. And in front of that, we have the AMD debug API library, which is conveniently named because it offers a debug API. And this hides the very big complexity of you know, scheduling things on, on the device and processing the events and all of that, uh, which is nice because, so it's used by GDB, but it's also used by many, a few other projects, uh, so other debuggers and profilers, resources and things like that. Uh, and it offers a very programmer-friendly interface. Um, and in GDB, there are multiple things that talk to debug API. So three main subsystems. The first one is the AMD debug API target. Uh, this is a target ops implementation. Uh, so basically to control the, you know, for execution control, reading, writing, registers, memory, things like that. And so when GDB wants to, let's say, resume a GPU thread, it calls into that target's resume method, which calls into the, 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 the debug API library, which then asks the, dry, the Linux kernel to, to, to do so. Um, then there's the AMD GCN GDB Arch, which is 
the thing that mostly provides kind of more static information about the architecture. So when we need to know the, the list of registers for whatever architecture we're debugging right now, we call into debug API, which has this knowledge. And finally, SOLib Rockem, well, it's a SOLib provider, a bit like the other shared library providers. Uh, when we execute a kernel on the device, the code gets copied on the, uh, on the device, and the SOLib Rockem is able to retrieve the list of loaded code objects from the card and make GDB load their symbol so that you can see the source, set breakpoints, load the symbols. So these are the three parts. And just a note is that the AMD debug API library is quite monolithic. So at the moment, it's one thing that runs all in one, you know, one process. Uh, this works fine for local debugging, but if we ever want to support remote debugging with GB and maybe GB server at the other end, uh, we'll need to maybe redesign this a bit because the AMD debug API target, would, that part would likely be shipped on the remote side, whereas the, the GBR should stay in, on the GB side, and the SOLib, not too sure, but you know, we'll need to find a way either to split that library or to run two instances, one remote, one local. So just all, all this to know that, uh, to say that it's local debugging yeah, for, for now. And just for completeness, the thing at the bottom, uh, code object manager, uh, that's a library that comes with Rockem to inspect and create code objects. And Debug API uses it for, I don't know if it uses for other things, but at least disassembly. So when uh, our GDB Arch wants to disassemble code, it calls into uh, lib debug API, and then it uses this code object manager thing. And in the back, it uses the LLVM disassembler. So we don't need to write yet another uh, uh, yet another uh, disassembler for, for that, that ISA. Um, so, oh, and just one note is that this is happening in parallel to uh, the, like when you're debugging a program, you, have, you debug the, the GPU, but you also debug the, the Linux host threads. So this is happening in parallel to GDB having the Linux native target loaded and talking to the Linux kernel for, uh, you know, with ptrace to, to, to debug uh, host threads. But it's not shown here. So what it, it would look like in a typical debug session to like this. So the first thing I want you to note is the fact that host threads and GPU threads appear in the, in the same inferior. And it was really a design goal for us because first, from the point of view of the programmer, the, it's all part of the same program. So even though they ship some code to get executed on a, on a GPU, they think of it as the same, you know, threads on the same, in the same program. Uh, but also, like I said, there's some memory that's shared between the two, it's visible, so, you know, we can have things read from and written from both sides, so it makes sense to have all of that in the same inferior. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and we'll see more about that later, but you know, we tried different designs, and the one that stuck is where one GB thread is mapped to one hardware thread uh, seen earlier. So here, one wave is executing actually multiple of the source thread or is working on multiple work items. Uh, so the, the, the numbers that you see here in info threads, uh, just a quick explanation. The first part with the columns, they basically tell you where in the system this wave comes from and where, where it is executing. So agent means basically which device uh, this is running on. So we can have multiple cards or multiple things that run, can run code. Uh, queue is because in each device you have multiple queues of, to submit jobs. This patch means one kernel call. So that thing with the triple brackets, that's a one kernel dispatch. Uh, so we can, can have multiple per queue. And finally, one kernel dispatch generates many waves, many hardware threads. So you have an, a counter for that. So this is a hierarchical identifier that uniquely identifies a, 
a, a wave in your program. This, uh, and yeah, at the bottom, to inspect those, we have info agent, info, queue, info dispatch commands if you need to drill down and see exactly what's, what's there on your system. Um, on the right, this gives you an idea, a rough idea of what this wave is working on. So on our grid, our 16 groups of 16 work items, um, the first part in, in parentheses gives us the coordinates, so up to three dimensions. It gives us the coordinate of the work group that this wave is working on. So one thing I did not mention is that we have we define groups. Uh, when, there's a restriction that all the work items a wave is working on have to belong from 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 the same group. So if you have groups of size, let's say seven, 70, and you have wave that can have up to 64 work items, then you probably have one wave with six, 64 items, and the last one is only six work items because it cannot f work on work items from two different groups. So it's, it will just use the leftover uh, work items from, from that group. So this tells you which work group the wave is working on, and the slash two is basically just a, a counter in that work group. However, however you, cannot, you cannot really, uh, I'm not sure. I was going to say you, can, you cannot know which work items this wave is working on right now, but I'm not sure, but that's not really important. Um, so, how do we achieve having host threads and GPU threads on the same, under the same inferior? That's kind of surprising if you know the internals of GDB. Uh, this is done by kind of hijacking the arch target stratum that's there in GDB uh, that exists for historical uh, reasons. Uh, so what we do is that we push our new AMD debug API target on, on top of the target stack, uh, on top of the inverse target stack, where it's able to intercept target calls and possibly override them or complement them. And so the arch rhythm layer, like I said, it's, it's historical. I think it was used for the SPU target uh, cell processor, which was removed a while ago. Uh, so. From what I look, from what I saw last week, it was actually not used anymore in GDB, so I guess it could be removed, but please don't because we're using it. <laughs> but I'll come to that later. And yeah, the slide says that currently we so we, we push our AMD debug API target on, on top of that target stack all the time. Basically when an inferior starts like a Linux process starts, we push our target and only when it dies we pop it. Uh, that's true for now, but it's in the process of changing. Like that was good for kind of up to now for prototyping, but we found that for upstream it was a bit invasive. Like if you have if you have that target enabled in your build and you debug a program that doesn't do GPU debugging or GPU processing at all, it wouldn't make sense to have this to push the target. So now we're changing things so that it's just using observers to monitor things, and only when the rock and runtime is activated in the inferior, then we push uh, the target. Um, and <clears throat> so this is how a typical uh, target method would look like. Uh, so like I said, it, it's able to intercept things if they belong to or if they target the GPU. Uh, so here we have, if it's a PTID that looks like a GPU PTID, we handle it, otherwise we uh, offload to the beneath target, which eventually is the Linux target. Um, but you might be wondering what, what this magic PTID is GPU function, how does this work? Uh, this is something that's not, probably not, hopefully not final, that's, uh, but basically, since we are in the same target stack as the Linux NAT uh, target, which you know, also creates threads and has its own set of PTIDs, we must make sure that our, the PTIDs we create, they don't clash with the Linux NAT's PTIDs. Uh, otherwise, if there's a target call for a PTID, we, we, we couldn't know, you know, is, is it the GPU thread or a, or a host thread? So what we use, we use the fact that on Linux, 
the init system is always PID number one. And so if you, like if you were to debug init somehow, the PID and the LWP would both be uh, one. And you know, init will never release the like, thread ID one. So it's impossible to have another process with a PID that's non one to also have the LWP one. So we're using this combination. So here's how we craft our PTIDs. Uh, process ID is the same ID as the, you know, the inferior's PID. And then LWP is one, and wave ID is just a, a counter. So we use the fact that the combination process ID none, not one, and LWP one, that's impossible to happen, for, for that to happen on, on Linux. So that's how we recognize a GPU PTID, and we're able to you know, choose if we handle it or if we defer to the target beneath. Um, just catch up, see if I don't miss anything. Yeah, so you know, this is not ideal. Really, we, we, we wish to make, we wish to make the debug API target a process stratum target because, you know, it would really make sense for it to be so. Um, and we would not need that PTIDs GPU function I just talked about. And we tried some quick, you know, quick refactors, see if, for example, we could have like different ways of having two process stratum targets in the same inferior. Uh, for example, a single stack, but with two process straighten targets in the same slot, or two completely separate stacks. Uh, we didn't spend much time on this, but we did some, you know, we just we did try it just in case it would be trivial, but you know, it was not. So uh, what we what we intend to do, because we'll we'll want to do such a redesign eventually, but it's kind of very hard to do down just downstream because first it's a lot of changes. Uh, it would be hard to like push just that change to upstream without the port because it's hard to justify having the feature without the port that uses it. And you know, so far the thing PTID as GPU works fine. And yeah, so our plan is to submit the MD GPU port upstream with that hack included. And then when it, once it's upstream, work with the upstream community to to see what kind of redesign. And it might be that there's other people who are, you know, who would like to do similar thing, will have their own ideas or will want to chip in. So, and the thing is that even if we upstream this, it's a hack contained in, in our target. If you're not debugging with AMD debug API, it's not going to affect you. So we feel it's, it's fine to, to push it and redesign later. So this was for the, how do we have host and device threads under the same um, inferior? The next challenge is how do we handle these, uh, SIMT, like this new level of parallelism that SIMT lanes bring? So when we did info threads, we saw that it showed, for the device, it basically showed us waves, and under each wave, we have a multitude of source threads or work items under that. And they all have, they all have their own data, so as a user, you want to be able to focus on one of the lanes and print the variables of, of, of that lane, uh, because it, you, want, you want to be able to inspect one work item at a time. Um, so, Basically, we added a, a, a new concept in GDB, a new concept of, of lane that's you know, under a thread. So now, in addition to being able to focus a specific thread in a specific inferior, now you're, you're able to focus a specific lane under a specific thread under a spe specific inferior. Um, however, even though you're able to you know, you have these different lanes. All the lanes are still always at the same physical PC because it's still one hardware thread underneath. Um, but as we'll see later with this thing that we call lane divergence, we have a way of giving the illusion that these, the lanes are executing at, are at different points, even though in reality they're all stopped at the same place. 
Uh, yeah. So by adding this new concept in GDB comes a bunch of new commands that are almost, you know, all inspired by their threads equivalent. So just like in four threads, we have info lane that gives you the lanes of the current thread that you're inspecting. Um, the thing I want you to note here maybe, because it seems quite self-explanatory, but it's the state column. So at each point, at each moment in time, a, a lane can be in a active or inactive. So when it's inactive, it means that it's following the rest of the group as, you know, because it's still executing the same PC, but the, 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 the instructions it executes, they don't do anything. They're, they're, they're basically no apps. So in the example here, they're all active, but just want you to know because I'll talk about that later. And yeah, if you note here, there's actually a numbering error. The, well, goes from one to 63, should be probably one to 64 or zero to 63. So before someone mentions it, safer. Uh, next, so just like there's a thread command to switch thread, there's a lane command to switch lane. And I want you to notice the, in the message that tells you switching to thread five, uh, it's been augmented to, to say lane, to get the lane number, uh, because now the, the, the focus context is now includes that. Uh, here when continuing and hitting a, hitting a, hitting a breakpoint, uh, the, the message about hitting the breakpoint has been augmented as well to, to say which lanes have hit the breakpoint. So here I said that some lanes could be inactive. Um, so when we hit a breakpoint, if there are some inactive lanes, then we consider that they, you know, they're not really executing the code at the moment, so they have not hit the breakpoint. So in this example, only the lanes 0 to 4 and 10 to 20 were active when hitting the breakpoint. So GB tells you that. And since, you know, it's kind of, it's as if you had the many source threads hitting the breakpoint at the same time, but G you can only inspect one of them, one lane, so GB switches to one of them, so typically the first one. So that's why it here it chose to switch to lane zero, because lane zero is part of the active lanes, but you know, it, it, would, it would switch to the, the first one that was active among those that hit the breakpoint. And lastly, you have a dollar lane convenience variable that you can use just like dollar thread and conditions and expressions. And other comments, yeah, so this on the left shows that the lane command affects your focus so that by, by switching to a separate lane, you focus a separate source thread. Uh, and so that, you know, the local per per lane slash per work item data changes. And on the right, you, it's an example of the lane apply command, which is also modeled after the thread apply command, which shows the same thing. Um, yeah, so when doing info lanes, you saw the, again, these big, big scary IDs. Um, on the left, the part with the colon is basically the same as before. It identifies the wave that this lane is part of, but now in addition you have also the lane index, so you know from zero to let's say 63. And on the right, it's interesting because you still have the work group coordinate, so it tells you which work group this lane, in which work group the work item that this lane is working on you know, isn't. But it also gives you the, the the work item coordinates in the work group. So this pinpoints exactly one work item. So using this, the programmer is able to refer or to make the connection with you know their mental model of you know they have this grid in one, two, or three dimensions, and you know this particular work item is giving me wrong, wrong results. So I'm able to to see which lane exactly is computing that particular work item, and I switch to it. I inspect that data and. So they, with this, they're connected back, connecting back to their you know, source view of things. Um, so with, you know, with having multiple source threads executing you know, in lockstep, always at the same PC, different, you know, on different data, you might be wondering how does this work when you have conditions, because you know, one lane might want to go into the then branch of the if, one 
one lane might want to go to the else, but if they have to all be the same place at the same time, how does this work? Uh, this is a technique that's you know, fair, fairly common in parallel programming, so you might have heard about this already. But it's um, basically the execution goes through both branches consecutively. So the compiler emits the code for the, you know, the then and the else branch, uh, one after the other. And you know, the hardware thread does both. But the lanes are appropriately disabled during either the else or the then branch. So for example, on the left, we have those lanes that evaluated the condition to, to false. While execution is crossing the then branch, they're going to be masked off, deactivated. Only the ones on the right are going to be active. And once we, we reach the, uh, you know, the other branch of the if, the roles are reversed. And once we end the if, then we, the execution mask, basically that defines which lanes are active, is reset to whatever it was before the if. Uh, and it's not reset to everybody enabled because it's possible that this if is inside another if that had already deactivated some lanes. So you want to come back to that state uh, when you're done. Um, so this way of implementing things, the conditions, they lead to the very surprising and unhelpful behavior that if you're stepping over an if it will look something like this. So you're on the line number one here, you do next, you're here in the else, I'll explain that after. Then you do next, you're here, and then you do next, you're here. So why does it go to the else first? That's just an implementation detail of our compiler. It, our compiler happens to generate the code for the else branch before the then branch. That, that's all there is to it. Um, but why is this unhelpful? Well, that's because when stepping, the user is focused on one particular lane, you know, that's executing one particular source thread. And that source thread is going to take only one of the two branches. So even though the hardware thread underneath does both, the source thread the user is looking at is only going to, uh, to, to, uh, to take one. So by going to both branches, it's unhelpful because I don't really know which of the two statements here my source thread really executed. So with lane divergent support, which you know, just, just needed the modification in GB itself, uh, we're able to do the, you know, the expected thing, which is you step, it goes through, let's say, the else branch, and then you step, it goes there. And this, to do this, it only required modifications in GDB because how this works is basically when we're here and we do next, execution will stop at the line marked with an X, but we remember that the, like which lane we, were f we are focusing on, and we notice, oh, we're stopped here, but now the lane is deactivated, it's inactive, which means we're in the, a branch that the lane does not take, so we're going to single step again until that lane becomes active again. And that's how we get this behavior, which is just what you would expect when debugging normally. Uh, yeah. Um, another aspect that we can improve uh, about you know, divergent, divergent lanes is to show what are the state of the divergent lanes. So this is something that requires modifications in GDB and some new debug info in Dwarf. But basically, without support, here we see that lane two is inactive, we don't really know, you know when it started being inactive, when it's going to become active again, w like where it's logically stopped at. So with this, you just know it's inactive right now. So not too helpful. Um, with such support, we're able to go back the, or, or, or basically to, to know where this lane is going to be be active again. So perhaps you know, we're executing the else of our if, and that lane is going to, to eventually execute that then, you know, one, once we're done with the else. Or perhaps when that lane has already executed the else and we're in the then, and we're, we're going to you know, meet with it again after the if. But basically, this, this lets us know where that lane is going to be active again. And 
we call this state divergent, so with a D, because you know, in the control flow, flow graph, this lane has taken, has, has diverged, has taken a different route than the one that we're in right now. And like just a precision, even though we show it stopped at a different place, a different PC, in reality, you know, there's only one hardware thread that stopped at, in this case, kernel.cc34. The kernel.cc41 is just a, an illusion we provide to uh, the user. So this means that in the GB code, we have this new concept of lane PC that's like not the threads PC, but like I described where the lane is logically at. So we have a bunch of new functions based on the existing PC functions, but that, that are now link functions. So depending on you know, what you want to show, the, where the hardware, the hardware thread is or the source thread is, you'll use one or the other. And so I said this, that this requires some additions in, uh, in the dwarf uh, standard. So this support for divergent control flow is part of a proposal that AMD has been working on for a while uh, to enhance the dwarf for GPU debugging in general. So it's, it's called a proposal for GPU debugging, but in reality there's aspects that are, are actually beneficial for, for everybody, even for you know, CP, CPU architectures. Uh, but so this is part of this, in addition to uh, other things on top that are mostly related to uh, changes to the Dwarf evaluator to let the compilers better express or just express at all some optimizations uh, it has done. So some things that Dwarf today are not able to, to express. Um, so if you want to, like, I'm not going to talk more about this, this proposal, but if you, if you want more details, uh, Tony Tai did a presentation last year uh, at the Virtual Cauldron about this, so it's available uh, online. Wait, what time is it? Great. <laughs> um, so last challenge, or that, you know, needs some need some, some, some uh, significant changes in refactoring in GB is the support for memory address spaces. So, like I said, there's, there is a global address space that's reachable by both the device, like the GPU and the host. But in addition to that, the, the, the device has some scratch memory area for its own use uh, that are a completely different address space. So if you're talking about offset 100 in the global address space and the offset 100 in that other scratch area, there are completely different memories. And the uh, thing is that this is, this is not a concept that is part of the source language. So when you have a variable, it's not like you mark your integer as I want this integer to be in this memory. It's more you allocate an integer in the stack, the compiler decides that this can be, let's say, on the local uh, memory. So it's not a source language thing, it's a runtime compiler decided to do this thing. Um, so basically th there's already some, I, I'm gonna talk about this a bit later, but there's already some limited support in Dwarf and in GB for, for something similar, but it doesn't truly really apply well in our, in our case. Um, and the thing is that, because they're not part of source source language, the, the address spaces are not exposed in user expression that a user would, for example, copy paste from, from the source language. Uh, yeah. So this is an example of different variables that could be placed at different places in memory. Um, so typically, the you know, the the, 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 the local var variables are placed in, a, in, a, in, a, sorry, in an address space called private lane. So it might end up in, you know, such a variable might end up in lane specific, you know, slices of, of, of these vectoral registers or in per lane uh, memory. Uh, but as you can see, there's a global variable here could be, you know, either in global memory on the device or global memory uh, on, the, uh, on the system. And as you can see, there, there's no mention of 
address spaces in the, in the source code at all. Um, so those who have worked with some, you know, some architecture that have multiple memory spaces in GB probably know that there's already some kind of uh, way to make this work in GDB that involves uh, using some, some, some bit hacks. So basically, the, the leftover bits on top of address, we, they've been used to store an address space identifier, so we stash it there, and we can retrieve it later, and before presenting an, an address to, 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 to the user, we, we strip it off. Uh, the problem with this is that it works fine for now, but it's, it won't, it won't be the case forever, because we're trying to compete for these upper bits uh, with other implementations, and in particular, the uh, pointer slash memory tagging that already exists in ARM64, but it's also coming to the various x86 uh, CPUs. So this is not going to work forever. And so the obvious thing is to keep core, the core address type to just represent you know, an offset in, in, any, in some address space and to carry the address space separately from that. So you know, the obvious thing to do is to introduce a structure that holds both. The only thing is that it may seem really daunting because you know, if you're thinking about replacing all the use of core address in GDB, you're, you won't be done soon. Uh, but what we found uh, is that there, there aren't actually that many changes required to get this working, at least in our case. So most of the things needed are when you have, say, a variable described by dwarf, then the dwarf tells you where it is, at which memory and which address space. So whatever is coming out of the dwarf evaluator, we need to carry the address space. And you know, when reading memory, but it's not all functions in GDB that deal with a core address that need to be changed. So it, for us, at least, it's a reasonable change. Uh, and also, there's user expression. So as we'll see on the next slide, uh, there's a way for users to, to you know, craft a, a pointer by specifying an, an address space. But pretty much the rest of GDB, at least for us, can keep working on using a, you know, the, the plain core address because by default it's going to refer to the default global address space, which is right most of the time. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, the, we need a way for users to, to, to print to the user and for the user to input address spaces, even though they don't exist in source code. Uh, because when you print an address, you want to, you know, you don't want, you don't want to just give the offset because you, then you don't know in which address space. So we need to wait to, to print it. And uh, then if the, it, it, if the user wants to craft a pointer to a specific address space as well, let's say they want to make a, you know, just inspect the memory there or create a watch point. They need a way to, uh, to specify that address space. So we came up with the, this new operator, the pound operator, or hashtag, depending on your age. And it's basically a combination of uh, an address space and an offset. And it does pretty much what you would expect. It, crea creates, it yields a pointer, so a pointer to void, but to an address in that address space. So this is how, when it's printed at the top, and then when this is how you input such an address. And so some of you might think about an existing operator, that's the at, uh, at symbol operator, and try to use that, but it's actually not sufficient for our users. Uh, first, it's in the, parse, in the expression parser in GDB, it's, uh, like at data or at code, those things can appear in when parsing a type. So it's basically used as a type qualifier. And like we said, in our case, it's not part of the type. It's, it's just the address itself that you know has this property of pointing to of being in, in a, a certain address space. So that's not great. And we couldn't have done, for example, 0x1, the offset, at uh, the address space because in expressions, the at is used for, again, it's a GDB invented operator called the, like, the array slice operator. So if you do 0x1 zero, zero at private lane, it would actually mean 0x1 is a pointer, and I want, me, I want GB to show, me, show it to me as a, an array of private lane number of elements. So 
it would be ambiguous to parse it that way. So this, these are the reasons why we came up with that operator, which was kind of temporary in the beginning, but I guess it's going to end up, I mean, unless somebody has a better idea, I probably can end up, uh, oh, anyway, looks good. Um, to support this, uh, so you know, to be able, for Dwarf to be able to express that a given variable, let's say, is, here's its address, but in a certain memory space, uh, we needed to add some, some new features in Dwarf. So first, uh, the operator form a space address, form a space address, which can be used in a Dwarf expression to do exactly what it says. So it takes an address, a address space identifier, smudges them together into a, an address that contains both. Um, you might think of, you know, there's already some things in Dwarf to cover this. You might be thinking of the xdref operator, but that's not exactly the same because xdref, what it does is, well, it dereferences. So using xdref on this will basically fetch the value at address zero in address space five and put that on the stack. But if what you want to return is the address containing the address space, that's not the same thing. So that's why this is, uh, this is useful. And then for, let's say you have, compiler generates a pointer, the pointer points to a given address space and it, you know, it wants to describe that. Uh, we have this new attribute, so dwarf LVM address space, uh, which uses, specifies the address, the address space uh, using those same num numbering scheme as, uh, as the operator, uh, which by the way, these address space IDs would be defined just like other things in Dwarf by the architecture in some document, like you know, where they describe register number and so on. Um, and also you might think about address class, which already exists in Dwarf, uh, but this more represents the kind of address or the kind of address space requested by the user at the source level. So I don't really know open, MP OpenCL very much, but I think you can use like the global keyword or local, something like that in the source. So address class which would represent what the user has written in the source. But the address space represents what the compiler, where the compiler decided to put the variable at runtime, which are two different things. Um, and maybe also mention there's also an attribute called WAT segment, which would maybe have been, we could have used, uh, but it's, I don't know the details, but basically it was not sufficient. Uh, this was planned to be used for like segmentation on x 6 like that, but it was added in Dwarf, and from what I understand, it was never used uh, ever by at least GCC, Clang, GDB, and others, so. It, I, think it, I think it's actually scheduled to be uh, removed uh, in the next world version. All right, so I'm going to quick over this. Um, in, by, by working on, on RugGDB, we, uh, we also already made a few other contributions. So things that we did for our port, but they were actually useful for everybody or for other, you know, not just, not, not just rug GDB. So we, you know, it's, it's things that we already either pushed or submitted on the mailing list. Uh, the first one I want to mention is the control server design. So there's a separate talk tomorrow by Pedro about this, which I invite you to go to. Very interesting talk. Uh, basically, the problem is that if you only have GPU threads running and the whole threads are stopped and you don't have the prompt, you know, you do, you do continue. If you do control C, the current, or Control C basically generates a segint that should be cut by the process but intercepted by GDB and it should stop. But if all your host threads are stopped, the segint is never delivered, so you cannot do Control C and stop. So that's a problem. So the solution is to make GDB always own the terminal and have the inferior use a terminal created by GDB. And it sounds simple, but it's not. So that's why there's a whole talk about this. Um, Next one is so performance improvements. Basically, GPUs tend to have a lot and a lot of threads, you know, massive, massively parallel. So 
this uncovered a few inefficiencies in GDB, like walking link list in O2 fashion, things like that. So that, you know, doing, like you take a breakpoint with 248 threads would take like 30 seconds to appear, or just doing continue and going over all pending events would take a lot of time. So these things are already been pushed, and you know, they're useful for everybody having a lot of threads. Commit resumed was a generalization of the already commit resume hook uh, that existed. And it's used so that when GB receives multiple events one after the other, it's used to, let's say you have multiple events that represent breakpoint hits, but they're all going to evaluate to false. So GB will want to resume the threads. GGB used to look at one event, say, oh, no need to stop, resume that thread, then look at the event, resume that thread. So we made it aware that there can be multiple events coming, so that if there are multiple events, it's going to look at all of them, and at the end, resume everything that needed to be resumed. Because for us, doing a single resume or multiple resume one at a time is very expensive, so it really it was really slow. And finally, so step over exit, which became step over clone and exit, uh, that's because in GPU code, at least in our GPU code, right at the end of your function, your kernel function, when you have re the return statement, right there, the compiler emits a an ex thread exit or basically thread exit instruction. So if you happen to do next over your return statement, your thread exits, and GDB was not able to cope with that, it would just wait forever for something to stop, and it wouldn't. And it turns out that there was, there was the same problem in, in GDB, but uh, in, like for, for x86 Linux code, but it doesn't happen that often, because if you're, you step past the end of your thread function with pthreads, you generally end up in the caller, which is the pthread runtime, and there you can like, continue or do what you want. So it's rare that you really step over the uh, Thread, thread exit says call uh, when debugging host code. But basically, this fixes it. And yeah, finally, the, uh, the upstreaming status of all those components, uh, the Linux kernel module, so KFD slash AMD GPU. Um, so yeah, the slides were done a few weeks ago. It says that, so support for running stuff, you know, it's. Some of it is already upstream, but for debugging, it, it's not yet. So we need to download it from the Rockem release. Uh, eventually, it's all going to be upstream in the kernel. But those patches that add debug support to the AMD GPU kernel module have been posted on the AMD graphics uh, Linux mailing list. So it's there for review. So hopefully, it will be there soon. Uh, the AMD debug API library, this is uh, like the upstream is AMD, so I can already say it's upstream. This is released at every new Rockem release, get a new, new version. Uh, the dwarf extensions, uh, this one's interesting. Uh, so this, this big proposal at the link, it's not there, but it's earlier in the presentation. Uh, there's the link to the, the, the proposal that AMD has for, like I said, GPU debugging, but not only GPU. And some bits of this, these were like, more dependent and agreed by, by many people. They're, all, they're already the object of proposal in the Dwarf Committee. Uh, but the rest of it is quite big. It makes some quite significant refactoring or changes in how the Dwarf evaluator works um, to, to, to you know, be able to support what we want. And being like a big change like this, we, we started talking about it with other players that might be interested. Like so far, Intel and Perforce, uh, we've met with them a few times, uh, and would be really interested. You know, if other people are interested in it, like go check, take a look at the at the, the proposal. And you know, we were having regular meetings to to talk about those. So if you have needs, like things that optimizations that cannot get represented by current dwarf, that might be good for you. Um, and finally, GDB, well, uh, there's already some bits of Benutil's BFD that we merge uh, for you know, support the architecture, but the main part of the, of the port uh, is going to come uh, eventually. Uh, we're working on it, but basically we want to base it on the next Rockem release because you know, when, otherwise, when, if we based on the already the previous one, once we post the 
<laughs> the, the, that we submitted is already going to be updated. So we're going to base it on the next Rockem release, but we have to wait for it to be public, and we don't know when it's going to be. So once the next Rockem release is public, the patches for GDB support upstream should come shortly after that. So that's all I have today. Thanks, Todd, for your attention, and I hope it was you learned something or found it, found it interesting. Uh, it's a bit past noon, but I give me we have time for a few questions. Uh, if you are, uh, just just take the mic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have used uh, RockDB for uh, debugging offloaded code from Clang and GCC, and I found it quite useful. So thanks for working on it. So uh, two quick questions. One was, uh, does the code dump work with it? If I have a crash in a kernel on the GPU, with the code dump, if I load it later, will be able to show me the call stack and stuff? I didn't get the, did you? Uh, code dump support. Oh, um, I give the mic to Lancelot, he's working on that. <laughs> Better if he answers. Yeah, as the answer is not yet, but we're working on it. Uh, it's coming. <laughs> I could have said that. <laughs> yeah, but like because of like AMD policy stuff, uh, I'm not think, uh, I don't think I can elaborate much yeah. more. But yeah, we're working on it. It's coming. Hopefully, when it. And the second yeah. question is: um, You show the syntax um, of using. Um, uh, looking at the memory in the different address spaces. Yeah. So instead of the, the symbol that you use, a private lane, can I use like uh, the integer, like zero hash, something like uh, the address space, generally are represented by numbers like zero, one, two, three, or something. Uh, so you're referring about this notation here? Uh, yes. Yeah. Instead of private lane, can it be some integer? In, in Python? No, sorry. Uh, like, I, if I type like p zero hash and next the address, will that work? So the, the, so oh, okay. Instead of using the the, the name, using an, a number for the address right. space. So the names are not; they're basically uh, target specific. So you can query the target to check which address space it actually supports, and then you need to use them. So the identifier, the numbers, doesn't mean anything because you would need to understand how the target. Enumerates them and handles them. So in a sense, it only accepts strings at the moment. The operator for for that site for the for the other space name. I don't think it would be. I don't think it would be impossible to make it work. It just. No, it, it, yeah, you can, but what would those numbers mean for the specific? Yeah, 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 yeah like the five. You could uh, you could run it. What we can do, what we could do is create a great API. And, yeah. Oh, thanks. So uh, as you said, we have debug API, which abstract everything. And it does have some endpoint to, uh, which are able to translate from a dwarf address space ident identifier we have here. So I think in the next time we use all five, something like that. So we do have endpoints we could query to translate from one address space identifier to an address space name. And that's probably how we would do it. <coughs> Uh, well, for now, we kind of do guarantee that mapping doesn't change uh, based on, on whatever under the debug API happens, but the idea was that will all the targets have that kind of guarantee, or, or maybe even us in some, in some version change for this version, these are other numbers. And yeah, I mean, it can be easily done, that, that's sure, but I think using the names is it's, it's a lot safer just for, you know, for the future proof and all of that, right? But yeah, it, it can be done, it's not a problem. There is the interface for it, so it just needs a bit, you know, changing of the yeah. operation. I think that one, one question would be if that would be ambiguous for the parser, but I don't think it would. Right. Like it's number, hash number, but I think it would work. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Hello, Tom. Hi. <laughs> Can already smell the food from outside, I think. Yeah, just one question. Uh, 
if, if I understood correctly, uh, GDB talks to a separate process that does the, the, the actual work of the debug AP, API? Uh, like the boxes I showed? Yeah. Uh, no, it's all in the same process, all it's libraries. It's in, inside the GDB process. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you. They have different arrows. Mm hmm? Arrows. That was a different, like the arrows. Uh. <laughs> uh, here. No. Oh yeah, the kernel is not in the GDB process. Sorry. <laughs> I'm curious, why do you ask that question? Is it NVIDIA based or? Yeah, I was. I thought if it was a separate process, whether it, it would be a daemon running on the machine or GDB would bring it up and, and bring it down. It was that yeah. kind of thing. Could have been, but it's not. <laughs> so yeah, to, to make it clear, like the bug API is running inside GDB. GDB loads that debug API SO library, it's all in process. And then the debug API SO links uh, with the code manager, it's the same process. And lib AMD code manager links with LLVM, but we shouldn't say that here. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, then talking with the kernel, and of course that crosses user space uh, to the kernel mode, and that goes via, via IO controls. So that's why the heroes are different. See the detail. That's <laughs> Thanks all for attending, and have a good rest of uh, Cauldron 2022.
Uh, Honda's flight got cancelled yesterday, in case you didn't heard yet. And uh, he got rerouted via Frankfurt. He's now watching YouTube, um, <laughs> attending the cold run remotely and, uh, at Frankfurt Airport. And he's about to board a flight fairly soon to Prague. And we.
to work? Yes.
All right, so uh, let's make a start. <clears throat> so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Alex. I'm an engineer on the GNU Toolchain team at ARM. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about Morello GCC. So we're going to start by giving a brief introduction to Cherry and Morello to explain what these are. Uh, then I'm going to be talking about what we've been working on uh, with regards to the toolchain and where we're up to. Then we're going to dive into some of the implementation details in GCC, and we'll, we'll cover some selected issues found in porting GCC to Morello. Uh, then Sabolsh is going to talk a bit about glibc, and finally, we'll have some time for uh, Q&A at the end. So the idea is to give a feel for the sorts of problems that arise in this area and the work involved in introducing capabilities to the toolchain. So before I start, uh, we need to acknowledge the contribution of a large number of people at the University of Cambridge, SRI International, and elsewhere, together with their backers, for the development of the Cherry architecture, since, as I'll explain shortly, the Cherry architecture is the foundation on which Morello is built. So first up, let's talk about Cherry. So Cherry is a research project that came out of the University of Cambridge. They've been working on this for about the last 10 years or so. It stands for Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Instructions. So to unpack this, we need to define what we mean by capability. In a very general sense, capabilities are communicable, unforgeable tokens of authority to access a resource. They're communicable in that they can be passed around within a system, and unforgeable in that they can't just be created out of thin air. They have to be derived from some valid means according to the rules of the system. In the case of Cherry, that means being derived in a valid way from another valid capability. So the idea with Cherry, then, is to take an instruction set and extend it with capabilities. We can then use these capabilities to implement some or all software pointers. So what's the point of this? Well, doing this allows us to achieve a couple of key security goals. The first of these is fine-grained memory protection, and the other is highly scalable software compartmentalization. Now, in this talk, we're going to focus on uh, the first of these two goals, since this is currently the most well understood with respect to how it can be deployed on today's software. So, specifically with respect to memory protection, Cherry gives very strong referential integrity and spatial memory safety. Uh, at this point, it's also worth mentioning a couple of underlying security principles. Uh, so, one of these is the principle of least privilege. This says that a given component of a system should hold the minimum privilege necessary to do its job. And in the context of Cherry, this can be implemented by a given software component being granted the smallest uh, possible capability that it needs to do its job. The other principle here is the principle of intentionality, or intentional use, which states that given multiple privileges available to it, software should explicitly choose which one to exercise. And Cherry forces software to be explicit in this way as to which capability it uses to perform a given operation. Okay, so Morello. Morello is an instantiation of Cherry uh, in an experimental fork of the ARMv8 A architecture. So it's also the name of a prototype board which implements the Morello architecture that ARMs developed. Concretely, the 64-bit general purpose registers in AX64 are extended to 129-bit capability registers in Morello. The capability registers hold an address in the low 64 bits and metadata in the upper 64 bits together with an extra one-bit validity tag. When capabilities are stored in memory, the tag bits are stored on the side. The tag memory itself is not directly addressable. It can only be accessed indirectly through capability loads and stores. And the validity tag is preserved only by valid capability operations. Invalid operations on a capability cause the tag to be cleared. And once the tag is cleared, the capability can no longer be dereferenced. For example, overwriting a capability in memory with a non-capability store, or taking a capability sufficiently far out of bounds would invalidate the capability. 
And that brings us nicely to bounds. So capability bounds encode a base and limit relative to the address, uh, which allows out-of-bounds accesses to be trapped in hardware. Finally, we have permissions. These limit which operations a given capability can be used for, such as load, store, and instruction fetch. So there are a couple of important properties of Cherry systems that are enforced architecturally. One of these is provenance validity. This says that every valid capability must have been derived from another valid capability. So you end up with a sort of tree of derivations going back to the, the root capability in the system. Um, the other property here is monotonicity. This says that capability derivations cannot increase in privilege. So on this slide, we've got a simplified illustration of how such a tree might look, uh, showing some of the different kinds of capabilities in a typical user space process. On the left, we have uh, heat memory. Um, so the, the libc will initially get heat memory from the kernel via a syscall such as mmap. And then when user code calls malloc, um, that will further narrow the bounds of the capability to the size of the allocation requested by the user. Um, at this point, I should also mention that each of, the, each of the solid arrows here is a monotonically decreasing capability derivation. Um, so then we have uh, stack variables where the situation is slightly different. Um, here, the compiler actually inserts instructions in order to narrow the bounds on, on stack variables. And finally, we can see how global variable access works on Morello here. Um, so initially, at startup, the kernel grants the dynamic linker the capability to the program's data sections. Um, each of the capabilities, uh, global variables, sorry, um, then has a, a capability size slot in the got. Um, and the dynamic linker can then populate those got slots with an appropriate narrowed capability. The, P, the got itself can then be accessed with a PCC relative load. Um, so just as a final note here, since the names CSP and PCC might be unfamiliar, these are just the capability versions of the AX64 stack pointer and program counter registers. OK, so now that we've introduced Cherry and Morello at lightning speed, we can now talk about how to take advantage of the architecture from C and C++. So to effectively map C and C++ to the architecture, there are some modest language extensions needed. The simplest way to take advantage of the architecture is with what's known as the Pure Capability API. This is where all pointers and references are implemented using capabilities. This includes implied pointers, such as the stack pointer, and vtable pointers in C++. Arguably, the biggest change with Cherry C and C++ is around the input a t-type. Clearly, the type has to be able to carry pointers, and therefore capabilities. However, the type also has to behave like an integer type and permit arbitrary integer arithmetic. To support this, we introduce a new int cap type, which is used to implement input a t in the pure capability API. So on the bottom of this slide, we have an example that shows some of the features of Cherry C. Line three illustrates an important point. In Cherry C, integer types such as long can no longer be used to hold pointers. When we cast from an integer type, such as long, to a pointer type, the compiler will warn that the resulting pointer will never be dereferenceable. At runtime, the resulting capability will be null-derived, meaning that the validity tag is cleared, and dereferencing the pointer will trap. Line four raises an interesting question. Should pointer comparison compare all 129 capability bits, or should it just compare the lower 64 bits containing the address? Uh, in Cherry C, we just compare the address values. This was found to give the least surprising semantics. Pointers that point to the same location will then always compare equal, regardless of their provenance. Line five shows an interesting case that arises with int cap types. Unlike with pointer arithmetic, int cap arithmetic permits binary operations with both sides carrying capabilities. In such a case, it is unclear from which side of the expression the resulting capability should be derived. So the compiler behavior here is to omit a warning, and by default, provenance will be carried from the left-hand side. Uh, yes, there's a question, I think. Yeah. Um. Um, uh, wouldn't it make more sense for the operation to result in the least capabilities, from comparing both sides and then taking the, the least permissive? Um, 
That's neat. I mean, I, yeah, I'll have, I'll, have to, I'll have to think about that and get back to you offline. But that, that, is, that is not how this, uh, yeah, how, the, how this is defined. Um. So one problem with that is you probably can't work it out statically. So there would be a performance impact. Um, but it's also probably pretty meaningless in most cases to actually add two capabilities together. Yeah, I suppose thinking about it more, if you've got, if you've got um, you, you, the case that comes up quite often is you have an offset and you have uh, a pointer, but both are stored in, 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 in cap types, then the problem is, yeah, like Richard says, you can't work out statically, which... which um, Yeah, exa exactly. So you, you have to choose one of them from. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's the pure capability ABI. Um, I'm going to talk about hybrid now. So yeah, in addition to the pure capability ABI, there's another way to map C to Morello, uh, the so-called hybrid capability mode. So one motivating use case for this is where you have, for example, um, a very large code base, which would be non-trivial support to the pure capability ABI but you'd still like to be able to interface with capabilities at some well-defined boundary. An example of this is with the Morello Linux kernel. Hybrid mode permits supporting a pure capability user space ABI without having to port the entire Linux kernel to PureCap. To make use of capabilities from hybrid C, you then have to explicitly annotate those pointers with underscore underscore capability, as in the example below. Um, and I believe the Linux kernel port actually uses the, uh, the user, underscore underscore user annotation to um, uh, define that to, to, to this capability um, keyword. Okay, so how easy is it to port code to Cherry? Well, it really depends on what sort of software you're talking about. At one end of the spectrum, you might have some high level standards conforming well written user space software. And this kind of software is typically very easy. Um, or, should require minimal porting effort. At the other end of the spectrum, you have low-level software, such as uh, compilers, operating system kernels, um, and language runtimes. These kind of software tend to require more significant porting effort. In general, any code that plays tricks with pointers and makes assumptions about their underlying representation is potentially problematic. Um, so there's an example here um, taken from GCC. So this is a merge sort, part of a merge sort implementation in GCC. Um, we're doing the merge set of the merge sorts. We have pointers L and R that point to our recursively sorted subarrays. Um, we do a comparison and we form a mask from that comparison. So in the case where, um, in the case where R compares less than L, uh, the mask is all ones. So we compute Ls or Ls or R. The Ls cancel out and we end up with LR holding a pointer to R. Otherwise, if the comparison falls the other way, uh, the mask is zero, so we compute Ls or zero, and we end up with a pointer to L. So ignoring capabilities for a moment, the code works fine, right? But we think about this in terms of capabilities. Uh, one redeeming feature of the code is that it actually uses input a T, so the type can at least carry capabilities. Um, the problem here is that when we compute Ls or R, the code is logically trying to create a capability that has the provenance of both pointers combined. Um, but this simply isn't possible with Cherry. Compiler has to choose one of the capabilities from which the result will be derived. In this case, the compiler will warn that the provenance is ambiguous and default to taking the provenance from the left hand side. In the case where we want to choose L, i.e., when the mask is zero, uh, the code happens to work by accident. So on line three, we compute Ls or zero, um, and since the provenance defaults coming from L, uh, we end up with the original capability we had for L. However, in the case where R compares smaller than L, things go wrong. The final LR pointer is derived from L, so although we compute the correct address value, R, the provenance is wrong. Um, the capability bounds uh, <laughs> permissions and so on are inherited from L. I think we have a question. Well, of course, in this specific example, the provenances of L and R will be the same because they are pointers into the same array because it's a sorting routine, right? So it always happens to do actually the right thing even if always taking the provenance from L, because it's going to be the same as R. So problem solved here. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, so couldn't this be, um, if you have, uh, do, the, do, do, do these necessarily have to be, um, 
allocated to. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on from that. So, um, so now that we've uh, had a little look at Cherry C and C++, we can talk a bit more about what we've been working on with our port of the GNU tools. So to give some context for the work, uh, Cambridge University have already developed a relatively mature software stack for Cherry based on LVM and a fork of FreeBSD called CherryBSD. Um, so this means we have a reference implementation of Cherry C and C++ in the form of Cherry LVM. Initially, ARM software efforts focused around porting LLVM to Morello, together with an Android-based software stack. And to further prove out the architecture, we've been working on a port of the GNU toolchain, and elsewhere in ARM, a port of the Linux kernel. In addition to proving out the architecture, it's also useful to show the notion of Cherry C and C++ is actually portable between implementations. So we've been working on the GCC port since around August 2020, so for about two years now. Uh, we also have ports of binutils, gdb, glibc, and ulib. Uh, so we, port, we support hybrid capability code gen from C, and GCC can build the Morello Linux kernel in this mode. And we support pure capability code gen from C and C++, and GCC can build ulib, glibc, and libc++ for pure cap. Uh, so due to time constraints, there are some features that we don't currently support, such as OpenMP and the sanitizers. And then at the bottom of the slide, we have some pointers to where you can find uh, the work in the various upstream branches. Okay, so I'm going to talk about capabilities in GCC. Um, so at this point, uh, I should note that Richard Sanford did the design for GCC. Um, so we're indebted to him, and I can't take any credit for what follows, except for all of the mistakes, of course. Um, so introducing capabilities in GCC presents several challenges, and addressing these requires changes across the code base. We have to break two very widely held assumptions in GCC. The first of these is that pointers and scalar integers are interchangeable. This is no longer the case with capabilities. The second of these is that addresses and address offsets have the same mode. So breaking this assumption particularly affects the RTL parts of the compiler, where we have to tease apart which components of an address calculation are the offsets and which is the base address. We also have to ensure that all pointers are well-derived and that they have valid provenance. In practice, this means you can no longer just convert from an integer type and expect to get a valid pointer. We forbid such conversions in the compiler, and the compiler will ice if they're attempted. The point that we mentioned earlier is that the Cherry C and C++ semantics for pointer comparison just compares the address values as opposed to entire capabilities. So we have to make sure we do this correctly whenever we form comparisons on capabilities in the IR. So to represent capabilities in RTL, we introduce a new mode class. Capability modes are defined by their size in bits and the mode of the address value, also known as the offset mode of the capability. For Morello, we define the cap capability mode caddy mode as a 128-bit capability with a DI mode address value. To get the address value of a capability, an offset mode low part subreg is used. For a pure capability target, we then set P mode to be a capability mode. We also introduce a new macro called PO mode, which is the offset mode of P mode. For non-capability targets, these modes are the same, but the distinction is important for capability targets. Of course, we then have to update the usage of these macros throughout the middle end and the AX64 backend as part of this work. We also introduce a new mode classification, scalar adra mode, which is the set union of capability modes and scalar integer modes. Finally, we introduce some new RTL codes. Const null is used to represent the null capability. So arguably the most important feature of the const null is that it has a mode, so we avoid all the usual pain of GCC modeless constants. Um, pointer plus is introduced to be used for capability pointer arithmetic at uh, the RTL level. So unlike plus RTXs, this RTX requires its operands to have different modes. And as a consequence, it's also non-commutative. Replace address value is mainly used to implement int cap arithmetic, although it does also have other uses. 
And finally, we have a line address down, which really just does what it says on the tin. OK, and of course, we also need to introduce capabilities at the tree level. So a tree type is considered a capability type if its type mode is a capability mode, and the type itself is not an aggregate. There are two main kinds of capability types, pointer types and ink cap types. So we introduce a new tree code to represent the language level cherry ink cap types. The address value of a capability can then be obtained directly by just converting to its non-capability type. However, as I mentioned earlier, conversions in the other direction are forbidden. So attempting to directly convert from an integer to a capability will lead to an ice. So instead, we introduce a new internal function, replace address value. This takes a capability C from which the result should be derived and sets its address value to the integer CV. In the case where there is no valid capability from which to derive, for example, if user code converts an integer to a capability, then we derive from the null capability. The result won't be dereferenceable, but it will have the correct address value. At the bottom of the slide, we show some key functions that we introduced in the tree API. Uh, so unsurprisingly, capability type P simply tests if its argument is a capability type. Uh, Non-capability type, when given a capability type, returns the type of its address value. Otherwise, it just returns the argument unmodified. And drop capability uh, forms a conversion to uh, the address value, given a capability argument, and otherwise just, again, returns the argument unmodified. And so this drop capability is mainly intended for use in the front ends. And then we also have a folding version of that, which is used uh, mainly in the middle end. Okay. So we have an example here, kind of an end-to-end -end example, um, with some ink cap arithmetic. So you can see the C front end uh, initially builds a replace address value call to implement the ink cap arithmetic. Um, then we, f we have to decide first from which side the provenance comes. So in this case, it's from, from the left-hand side, straightforward. Um, then we drop the capabilities on both sides before, before forming the expression for the new address value. Um, another thing to note here is that the save expras are quite important. So when I initially added this support to the front end, uh, we didn't have any save expras here. So any side effects on the ink cap C would then get evaluated twice. Um, but yeah, that's fine with those in. And then we have the gimple on the bottom right and uh, the Morello assembly we produced finally in the bottom left. Um, the SC value instruction here is short for set capability value. OK. Now, one of the interesting things we learn while doing this work is around the notion of type precision, which is used throughout the compiler. So we learned that uses of this macro generally fall into two different classes. Sometimes code uses type precision when it wants to know precisely how many bits are needed to represent a given type. Other times, code uses type precision when it wants to calculate the range of values that can be represented by a type or indeed the precision with which arithmetic occurs on a type. So typically, these two notions of precision are one and the same. So certainly for integer types, um, the, its size and bits also determines uh, it's the same precision as at which arithmetic occurs, and it also determines the representable range of the type. Um, with capability types, this is no longer the case. Um, so in particular, with 128-bit capabilities on Morello, the precision is in the size of the capability. is of course, 128 bits. However, the precision with which arithmetic occurs um, and the precision which determines the range of representable values is only 64 bits. So really, we have a dichotomy of different notions of precision, and we have to tease this apart throughout all uses of type precision in the compiler. Uh, to, facil to, to facilitate this, we made the compiler ice if type precision is used directly on a capability type. And instead, we forced the use of one of two new macros, uh, type cap precision and type non cap precision. So these names could be changed later down the line, but for now, having these two new macros helps us to indicate clearly where, where we've made an explicit decision in, in the code. So as mentioned previously, uh, introducing capabilities to GCC involves significant changes across the code base. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a question over there. So from the point of view of things like read, copy, update, right? we need things like the uh, C++ language, uh, the, the, C ato the, the atomics. Um, so do you see uh, that w you would need like 128-bit load and store in order to be able to support the, the C language atomics, to, to load and store those pointers? Um. I'm not actually familiar with that part of the architecture, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. The I architecture that supports 128-bit atomics, and yeah, it works. Okay, <laughs> thank you. 
Okay, so um, yes, as mentioned previously, uh, introducing capabilities to GCC introduces significant changes across the code base. Uh, so to simplify the task and gain confidence in the approach, we introduce a development aid in the form of a flag called mfake capability. This flag causes all pointers to be represented using capabilities in the IR. So this aspect is similar to the pure capability mode, but the difference is that we're still only generating AX64 code. The fake capabilities are still only 64 bits. So use of this flag allowed us to decouple introducing the concept of capabilities and the new IR constructs to GCC from the Morello-specific aspects, uh, such as having 128-bit capabilities and implementing the pure capability PCS. Um, it also allows for straightforward testing using uh, stock AX64 hardware. So once the test suite was mostly clean with m capability, we could then start on pure capability enablement. And more recently, we've now gained C++ support. Um, we also managed to get the compiler bootstrapping with this flag. Uh, so yeah, now I'm going to talk about just a few issues that we ran into when trying to port GCC to Morello. So first off, a little bit about bounds on Morello and how that affects the toolchain. Morello encodes capability bounds using a floating point style compression format such that the capability can fit into 128 bits. So as a result, not all combinations of base, address, and limit are representable. So this has implications for any software that allocates memory from Morello. In order to ensure we get tight bounds on capabilities, software has to insert padding and or increase alignment uh, such that the overall allocation size is exactly representable. This has implications for many toolchain components, including GCC, when it allocates memory uh, for both stack and global variables, as well as the static linker, which has to ensure that the span of the PCC within the DSO um, is precisely representable. It also affects glibc malloc and the various allocators in libc++. Okay, so here's an example of a transformation that GCC does, which is valid for integer pointers, uh, but it's wrong for capabilities. So this occurs due to an optimization in the AX64 backend called AX64 anchor offset, uh, which tries to create anchor points for address cal calculations that are out of immediate range uh, in the hope that the same anchor point can then be reused for other loads or stores. The problem is that, as I mentioned earlier, cherry capabilities can only be taken so far out of bounds uh, before they lose the validity tag. On Morello, capabilities can only be taken 12.5% of the allocation size below the base uh, without getting invalidated. So in the example here, we would likely end up dereferencing an invalid capability and trapping. So to fix this, we currently disable the optimization um, for capabilities given a negative offset, and we adjust it for positive offsets to avoid using anchor points that would take the capability out of range. Um, so it would be possible to use a sort of round towards zero behavior here for negative offsets, but we, we don't do that currently, just to try and keep things simple. Okay, and this is an interesting problem that we hit with the uh, C++ front end. So we have a nice, simple C++ program here, right? Nothing could possibly go wrong with this code. Well, as I mentioned earlier, with Cherry, comparisons on capabilities must compare only the address values, uh, not the entire capabilities. So therefore, when we build the IR for this uh, comparison, we first convert both sides to unsigned long, so the IR looks like what you see in the middle. Um, C++ then says that converting pointers to arithmetic types is invalid in a context for a context. So Morello GCC actually ends up rejecting this code, which is not so good. Um, so the problem here is that we, we can't really distinguish between uh, conversions that the user wrote in the original source and conversions that GCC inserted in order to get the correct semantics for capability comparisons. So to fix this, we, um, we use a C++-specific tree code to represent these implicit conversions uh, in the C++ front end. Uh, the context for interpreter can then distinguish these conversions um, from those written by the user and avoid diagnosing the implicit conversions. So when genericizing, we then lower the implicit conversions to convert expres. So this has no real impact outside of the C++ front end. One implication of doing this is that we also have to do some opportunistic lowering of the implicit conversions uh, in order to restore the folding that we would usually get with the front end. So of course, the generic match PD folding uh, will only work on generic conversions. It, will, it won't recognize our C++ specific tree code. Interestingly, this context for a case seems to be the only case we ran into where making this distinction between user, user conversions and GCC inserted conversions uh, is important for correctness. Okay, um, so that concludes this part of the talk, and now I'm going to hand over to Sir Volks. And um, before I do, just a quick note that you can try out Morello GCC on Compiler Explorer, so please have a go and try to break it. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Yeah, so I will have a few slides on glibc, um, <clears throat> and then hopefully we'll have some little time at the end for questions. So the first thing I want to note is um, the starting point where the Morello glibc porting uh, started. Um, it was not the usual, uh, we have a working GCC and then start the glibc porting work. Um, instead, uh, because of the, of the history of the project, we already have a good LVM-based toolchain, but not yet a GCC. And uh, we decided that we want to start GLIP supporting work as early as possible. So uh, it was a bit, we had to do a bit of extra work inside GLIPC to support Clang, LLD, uh, static linking, linking only in GCC, GLIPC. And also we had to work with the uh, uh, emulating Linux system call layer. At this point, uh, Linux kernel is 64-bit, user space is 128-bit pointers, so you have to translate types. Um, so yeah, it was a bit slow start. Um, um, the port, um, well, two important, one, one important thing about the port is that we keep it in a separate branch, so we're not intending to upstream it, which means, in principle, we could do all sorts of nasty hacks because upstream reviewers uh, don't have a say. But um, we try to make the patch set very clean because it makes it easier for us. Uh, only a few places where we cut corners. The other thing I want to mention is that in a norm there, that um, we essentially reuse a lot of code from AR64 because Morello is pretty much and like AR64 just with capabilities. Um, so some of the normal porting work, we didn't have to do much work because it was, uh, it was uh, already there, just little changes. Um, However, that we still had a lot of work to do, but not the usual uh, kind of back-end uh, porting work. Uh, we had to change the generic C code um, quite a bit, but these, um, so some of the changes are very s small changes, but at many different places, and mainly because the Cherry C language is a different language from standard C. Um, as Alex mentioned that um, there are problems with integer types that represent capabilities. Um, somebody said it never makes sense to add two pointers. Well, sometimes it makes sense to add the pointer plus offset, and sometimes the offset is stored in the uint ptr for whatever reason, and then you have uint ptr plus uint ptr. So these kind of situations happen in the uh, glibc source code. Um, we also have issues because 128-bit uh, pointers uh, size, uh, GLIPS is not always prepared for that, and you have to change the atomics, as was mentioned. Um, yeah, so there were some small changes. Oh, and yeah, GLIPS ha GCC has warnings about some of the issues. I decided to not try to make GLIPS clean off uh, the cherry specific warnings because there were lots of false positives and it required me to change the code in unnatural ways to silence all the warnings. And uh, yes, yeah, so the warnings at this point is, was not super helpful. Um, now another <coughs> class of problems that you might be wondering that the previous set of things were glibc internal little changes just to make capabilities work. But sometimes we have to make changes that uh, the public interfaces are affected and that's uh, more, can be more interesting because that affects uh, uh, user code and the portability of user code. We only had to introduce one new interface, get, uh, essentially get Auxval we want GetAuxWall to be able to return a pointer and we introduce an interface for that. 
and we did some minor change in printf to be able to print uh, uh, capabilities in a pretty format. Uh, okay. Um, just qu curious, uh, does the implementation of the load and store of this 128-bit uh, pointer use the equivalent of link load store conditional, or does it use the atomics of the, the architecture? So my, I just read a few bugs on the GCC uh, bug tracker. So my concern is that you might be using uh, something that is an atomic operation for storing or loading those 128-bit value, but that the microarchitecture does not do it uh, atomically. So you might be having races in, in software code that expects atomics. So the 128-bit capability load store is an architecturally uh, built-in thing, and the atomics are for that is also built in to the architecture. So uh, I would expect that to work because, yeah, software relies on that. Um, anyway, we have a lot of problems before getting to such details. So um, yeah, so we only need. So we only need a little bit of changes, a new interface type of change. But the more important thing is that there are behaviors that were, oh, the capability architecture doesn't allow this, and this will be exposed to users, so user code have to be now careful around that. One obvious case is when you copy pointers in memory, memcopy has to be special, and uh, uh, we had to change memcopy to be special, but user can also copy uh, pointers, and uh, and similarly, there are point, problems with pointers in shared memory. People use that, and passing pointers around uh, one moment around uh, 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 I/O or file descriptors. So I'm I'm probably not not really sure. Is the the when when I. I have a structure in, G, in, in, in C, and there's a pointer in it. Will that be 128 bit? So is the capability stored in my user memory? Because at the very beginning, I thought the capabilities were only accessible via some special. So, so, so I, I can actually like store a pointer with capability in memory, then use some character stores to mangle the capability and load no. it back, and what if you, if you use character stores on the on, on, on the capability, then then it will invalidate the capability. So you have you can only use capability loads and stores to, to load and store from uh, capabilities to and from memory. Um, so you, we have a full set of loads and stores that you can use when, in the PureCap API. Uh, can I? Okay. Can I pick up on one of the first? It was actually on the previous slide. You've said you're going to keep this all in a branch. Um, I always worry about things that live in a branch and never see, you know, become part of mainstream. I think you're doing three things. You're providing generic support for Cherry capabilities. You're providing support for Cherry um, ARCH64. And you're providing support for the Morello board that supports ARCH. So you've got a board, you've got an architecture, you've got a general yeah. functionality. Now, I understand, and for those who don't know, the, the British government's put about 170 million, I think, into this project. It is a big national strategic event. The Morello board's only going to last for five years because it's a research project. But the idea is that Cherry, Cherry, I mean, capabilities have been around for 30 or 40 years already. Yeah. Um, it seems strange to not at least get the, the core Cherry stuff upstream, uh, fully into right. the main so, branch. Yeah, OK. So. Um, the, so all of the stuff we've done in, in GCC is, de is uh, designed to be uh, target independent. So we've, and we've written the code in such a way that we hope it's of the kind of quality that could be upstreamed. Um, but the reason we're not upstreaming it right now is because, um, well, Morello is a fork of the architecture. It's not, it's not the mainstream um, ARM V8 architecture. So it's, it, that's, that's why we've kept it in a branch for now. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. Do you have 
Um, so there's, uh, we've, yeah, this ARM has fast models for um, emulating, but there's also, um, I believe Cambridge University have a, a, a port of Quemu to uh, Morello and other Cherry targets. So. All right, I will try to speed up. So there are some things that become clear during, during the zero runtime porting that will be visible to, to uh, users. Uh, so, uh, something that I haven't mentioned is some types change. It doesn't affect many interfaces, but a uh, few interfaces. Uh, of course, if an interface has different type uh, as the documented type uh, for current targets, uh, then portable code might be affected by that. And there are also system call APIs that have significantly different that might be visible in user code. Uh, yeah. All right. So, so far I mostly talked about like little loc uh, localized issues inside uh, uh, GLPC, but there were a few uh, bigger changes where we had to do some design work or uh, 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 yeah do some uh, bigger changes. Uh, the first issue is how all the capabilities get derived at program startup. Um, the current kernel um, gives us user space a capability that essentially covers the ad entire address space, which means any time we have an address, we can just turn that into a valid capability. So we don't have to very too much at this point, uh, at the beginning. So we kind of did a two-phase implementation when first we tried to make the Morello port work with 128-bit pointers, and if there is any point where we really need a capability, we can just make that up. And then there was a phase two when we use the real root capabilities that um, that are there, that, that will be there in the final, uh, final kernel, where there are narrow capabilities that come from AUX vector, PCC, or stack pointer. Um, a bigger issue is the dynamic linker. What do we do? Uh, how do we handle capabilities in a dynamic linker? Um, one problem there is the dynamic linker works a lot with addresses and assumes that 64-bit addresses on a 64-bit LF platform can be just cast to a pointer and it will work. And of course, we want capability. Um, and most of the time, these, when in an ELF module, we want a pointer somewhere inside the ELF module, the computation that uh, the dynamic linker is doing is have a base address plus some offset. So the natural thing to change was to make the base address a capability, and then base address plus offset immediately gives you uh, a capability that kind of works. Um, so that, that was the phase one uh, dynamic linker work. We just f changed a few types from 64-bit address into unit PTR, essentially. And then phase two is when, um, in the final um, design, we wanted two separate capabilities uh, for covering um, the, the load segments uh, of an ELF executable, but only with read execute per permission, and, and another capability with read write permission that only covers the, the writable segments. And uh, then we had to make a bit more changes to ensure that the, all the pointers are derived from the right capability within an ELF module. Um, another big area uh, where there, there are more changes needed is, is the malloc design, because you would expect malloc to give you, uh, give you user a pointer that has only able to access the, the, the allocated area. Um, in the first phase, when we 
uh, work the malloc. We just wanted to make it work because there are internal integer casts inside malloc which are not perfect. Just clean that up, make malloc work, and no bounce narrowing. Then the second step was, okay, implement the bounce narrowing where we had the problem of representation. Not all sizes can be represented, so sometimes the malloc size have to be increased a bit, so it's representable. So now there is the security property that the user gets the pointer with the right bound, but we have a problem at free, because in free you get a user pointer and you want to access the malloc metadata, and the pointer do doesn't have access to that metadata. So we have to somehow create a cap capability that does have access to the metadata. So the phase two is just to make sure that, okay, we can access the metadata. And there is a phase three when, when actually we change the free that we don't rely on a, a, a magic global capability that has access to everything. Instead, uh, we have some data structure to, to do this kind of transformation from user pointer to an internal some capability that has access to the metadata. Ideally, you would design malloc very differently for Morello, but we wanted to kind of do this the minimal design, and we are currently working on phase three. So at, from this slide, um, everything phase two is already implemented. Uh, it's not yet all in the branch, but yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so the status, uh, I run the test suite, as, although uh, this test suite run was done uh, with a GCC that haven't yet implemented the stack bounds. If I, if I use the stack bounds, then there are more fa failures. Apparently, glibc have some out of bound access on the stack. And uh, yeah, and there is the list of the failures that are currently present in the test suite. Uh, it's some L features are missing, uh, uh, profiling is missing, there is an unbinder bug that we know about and know how to fix, but we just haven't fixed it yet. And so there are a number of known issues and those are the remaining failures. So most things work at the current kernel, uh, but there are no strong security guarantees. So like um, we haven't went through the uh, see on time to narrow all the all the object bounds. Like there was this question about Q sort passes down the pointer to the compare function. Does Q sort narrow down the pointer before passing down the compare function or passes down the array pointer? The Cherry people has some work on this. Uh, I haven't went through that. What what uh, is there? Uh, 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 yeah, we haven't went through all the security hardening that they propose. So, yeah, and that's it, I think, and uh, these are the people involved in the porting work, and uh, yeah, I think we have time for questions. Um, I remember you mentioning about the capability that it has 188 bits and one tag bit that is not accessible. Uh, when debugging using GDB, would we be able to see that tag bit? So the way GDB works is you can print out capabilities in a pretty format, and it prints out the capability, the bounds information. Capabilities also have permission information, read, write, execute, and a bit more, because for whatever reason. And, uh, and it also prints out if the capability is valid. So it's just, you can print out if a capability is valid or not, and GDB knows how to query that bit from the operating system. So I just want to validate my understanding of, of the attack scenario that you care about. So if I get it right, so if someone gets a pointer and start flipping those capability bits in user space to try to make the access, you don't care about that kind of attack scenario, right? You just care about, I guess, someone getting the pointer and using it in the rightful way with the right accessors to modify it. But I mean, it, I have access to the binary representation if I'm a program, right? I could flip the bits. If you flip a bit and not using the architectural load store instructions that are capability load stores, 
then the the capability valid validity bit, which is stored elsewhere, that will be invalid. So as soon as you try fiddling with the bits of a capability, it becomes invalid. Yeah, and to, to be clear, you can't set the tag bit from, from user space. Um, but user space, there's no instruction to do that. So is it kind of, if, if there's a pointer in memory somewhere, there is, for each memory location, there is a bit somewhere telling, uh, is there a valid pointer there or not? Exactly, except um, one thing is that the pointer alignment requirement is 16 byte. So for every 16 byte, the capability is 16 byte, for every 16 byte in memory, there is somewhere a bit that says, is this a valid capability or not. Yeah. So if the memory is, is like stored to with any invalid instruction, then the bit is clear. Yes. Yeah. Uh, So I, I was curious on earlier points of one of them was the mem copy has to be special case. What does that exactly mean? Like, do you look through the types and what exactly do you do? Yeah, so mem copy simply goes, does the copying, but for every 16 byte aligned, 16 byte has to go through a capability load and capability store operation. And that means if there was a pointer somewhere in the copied struct that it remains valid on the output. And you somehow force the library memcopy implementation for all the internal copying by GCC because GCC has many ways how to expand a copy yeah, of so something we either piecewise or yeah, we, we had to fix the inline mem copy expansion as well to preserve capabilities. So, it, yeah, it, it, either approach should work. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you sure, if you spill a if you spill a pointer to yeah, um, that that has to use capability loads and stores if it's a capability pointer. Can JDB forge capabilities? Can you give it the address of the belts or whatever you want so that it forges a capability through P-Trace or something like that? I think the Cambridge people, uh, university people really don't like that idea, but uh, there is a setting in uh, like a proc file system or proc sys sysfs some setting on Linux that allows you to forge capabilities in a P-trace setup, and uh, you can turn it off or on. Um, I think that's the situation. Yeah. I was wondering if the semantics of the restrict keyword need to change in any way for, for this to be, if you have two pointers which were, which were using the um, capability semantics and they are now just declared restrict, does the compiler need to do something extra or do the semantics have to change? I, I cannot reason it out, so I thought I'll ask away. <laughs> I don't think we had to change anything around restrict. No, I don't, well, it, yeah, we haven't, I, pers I haven't thought about that, but we, I don't think we made any changes in that area, yeah. Um, I, I don't think off the top of my head they would need to change, but, yeah. Um, so the we can't, we, we can't assume that they're, sorry, do you, do you want to go shambles? If you have some, go ahead. Um, Maybe a repeated question for the okay. audience. Okay, so the question is uh, pointer LES or not LES, what 
what does that happen? What, what happens then with capabilities? How does capabilities change those situations? So, and uh, I think capabilities just ensure that each pointer can only access its own, within own, own bounds. And uh, if there's some aliasing issue that's separate, like aliasing issue uh, that happens without capabilities and uh, with capabilities, that capabilities doesn't, don't change that. Uh, yeah. It just prevents you to do out of bound access. Yeah, I think if you've got two pointers that could uh, point to the same place but have different provenance, then we have to assume in the compiler that they, that they do alias. Um, it doesn't change that, um, so even if they have different provenance. So, so maybe a related question, the, the bounds, are they so that two capabilities are either completely distinct or can they overlap partially or can they only be contained or inside each other? So are they really r random ranges or are they in, in some way form a hierarchy or so? Yeah, each pointer can have its own bounds and as, as long as it's representable, that pointer can have whatever bounds. Um, and uh, yeah, that can be two different pointers that have overlapping bounds and things like that. However, if you have two pointers that have overlapping bounds, you cannot turn them into a super pointer that has all the bounds of them. So even though in principle you have a capability to access the entire range, you can create a single pointer for that. Yeah. And obviously a, a well-behaved allocator should make sure that they're destroying the capabilities that it allocates, so you shouldn't have overlapping. So, is it possible to like use a fat use capability pointer to iterate backwards through a buffer somehow? Because the pointer has the address and the range like next to it, so intuitively it shouldn't be possible to iterate like down. Is it right? Yes. Yeah, so the capability has essentially, in principle, three pointers the actual value of capability, the begin and the end. It's just compressed representation, so not every combination of three 64-bit pointer is representable. Uh, so it's perfectly possible that uh, have a capability that has a value that points to the end of the range of the accessible, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so just last question, I guess, is from Sadesh online in Zoom. Can some of the pointer arithmetic cleanups in malloc be upstreamed? Um, potentially, yes. Um, there are a small set of uh, cleanup patches, patches that I think are actually upstreamable, but we do have a long list of patches that I think are very cherry-specific. Yeah, that's great. Thank you.
Ah, that's better. Hello, everyone. So I give uh, 30 seconds for the people at the back to settle down. We are already five minutes into the presentation, so let's start, please. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mathieu Desnoyers. I am CEO at Efficios. Uh, so I maintain quite a few things now. Uh, the restartable sequences system call in Linux, um, the membarrier system call in Linux, uh, the uh, part of the LTTNG project uh, for kernel and user space tracing, as well as, as, well as the user space RCU library. Um, and now I want to specifically discuss with you uh, how we can improve the GNU C-like brewery with restartable sequences. So in a nutshell, what is restartable sequence? Uh, it's a system call in Linux. It, it allows, uh, for instance, libc to register a per thread area at C startup and at pthread creation. And that then allows user space to create small sequences of code, which you could see as transaction, uh, that are managed by the kernel. Uh, so in those small tra transactions, few instructions can do fast access to per CPU data in user space. Uh, so uh, it's currently used uh, since uh, the GNU C library 2.35, which integrated support for restartable sequence, and it's used in the implementation of SCED get CPU, especially to speed up uh, architectures like uh, ARC64, which do not provide a VDSO for getting the current CPU number. So we actually have the kernel always keeping up to date the current CPU number in this per thread area. So we just load it. That's very, very fast. So there are many general use cases uh, that can apply to uh, RSEC, such as uh, resource allocation, memory allocation, uh, ring buffers, I, use, I want to use that for tracing, uh, counters, uh, I have counter libraries, a part of my tracer which can really benefit from this uh, using split counter schemes, and as well for synchronization. So the adoption status of restartable sequence, uh, so in the Linux kernel, the architectures that are implemented and for which there are tests implemented, uh, we have, uh, so all of those are both 32 and 64-bit supported. So ARM, MIPS, Power, RISC-V, S390, x86. So uh, there, I've seen that CSKY and LongArc have the RSEC, AVRSEC, Thing enabled, and they do have the, the, the code in the signal handler, although I, I spotted an issue on, uh, on CSKY that has been fixed by the maintainer, but they never implemented the test. So the architecture-specific header code that go along with the kernel self-test. So this is untested on those architectures. I don't, uh, I don't like that. I've asked the CSKY maintainer uh, to either provide test or revert the support for RSEC on his architecture. I prefer to have an architecture not supporting RSEC than having it supporting, claiming to support it without test. And for long arc, well, I mean, it's their decision, but I don't quite like it. So on the GNU C library uh, side, it's been used since JLibc 2.35. Uh, as I said, used to implement get, get CPU. Uh, and I want to discuss other use cases. Uh, it's used by Google's TC malloc now. Um, the CRIU, the Checkpoint Restore project, supports RSEC, uh, so they can save the state and restore it, uh, the, the needed state. Dynamo Rio, I think they disabled it, though. I mean, they, 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 they looked into supporting it and everything. Oh, no, no, actually, they do the execute twice approach. Yes, yes, so they support it. So they execute it once without the side effect, and then they re-execute it all at once with the side effect. So because usually those small sequence of code, you have many instructions without side effect, and then it ends with a commit instruction, which has the only side effect of the critical section. So you are, you're either aborted before you reach the end, or you do it completely. Uh, so uh, there's been uh, various seccomp allo lists that were that needed to add the restartable sequence support. Uh, so uh, that came uh, that became clear when uh, the GNU C library started using it. So that's good. It it paves the way. Um, 
So, and I, I do develop a liber sec, which is mainly, mainly a set of header files that implement the most common, let's say, primitive operation someone might need. Things like a, a compare and exchange and things like that. Uh, so, we need to implement uh, inline assembly code for every architecture that we support. So, I think uh, libar sec currently supports something like six, seven architectures, but yeah, it's a big list of uh, inline AS ASM. Um, so now, more to the point of this presentation and discussion. Uh, here are the use cases uh, that I pinpoint that are ahead of, or ahead of us uh, for the GNU C library. So one is uh, using it for a get CPU. So the get CPU, um, um, uh, well, I mean, part of it is a syscall, and I think the libc exposes an, an API for it. Uh, a symbol. So there's uh, the last parameter that the tcache pointer is documented as being unused. Uh, so the first two is what we care about. The CPU number, we have it very quickly from the, the RSEC structure, the per thread structure. The node ID is something I want to add to the struct RSEC so that get CPU could be implemented purely in user space uh, from a glibc perspective. So. Uh, one thing that's kind of important is that we want to load both of those values with a kind of RSEC load U32, U32, so that within a RSEC critical section that will complete atomically from the point of view of the scheduler and migration, we, lead, we load both fields so that the, the, the mapping between that pair of values stays invariant for the whole lifetime of the process after that unless there is, let's say, a new topology reconfiguration on architectures like uh, PowerPC. They, they may do that on CPU Outlook, but this is really something that is atypical. So, um, extending the RSEC structure, I just want to make sure, one second, that I have all the content. Yeah, okay, it's not so bad. Let's have a look. Sorry about that, I just changed the slide size, so I want to make sure that everyone sees. Okay, there we go. This might happen a few times. Uh, it, I was in 4-3 four, four ratio, uh, and then I just changed it, so uh, let's have a look. Extending, yeah, there we go. Okay, extending struct RSEC. Um, I want to make the RSEC ABI extensible. Uh, currently, it's just a few fields uh, and padding at the end. Important point there. Um, so how I plan to do it is to use the ELF auxiliary vectors, and this is actually an idea from uh, Florian. Uh, so uh, I want the kernel to let user space know about the supported feature size. And this is not really the same thing about, uh, as the size of the RSEC structure, because the current size of the RSEC structure is includes padding at the end. We really want to know how many of, of uh, how many of the fields are actually semantically implemented by the kernel, and those padding fields at the end of struct rsec. I I want to make use of those. I mean, this is prime real estate, right? This is cache hot cache lines uh, that that I want to make uh, the the best use out of. So I don't want to leave that as as padding. It makes no sense. So, um, yeah, so uh, the idea there is to have the GNU-C library, so the original RSEC size was 32 bytes, uh, so GNU-C library could either register that size or a larger size that would be large enough to accommodate the, the, the supported feature size expressed by the kernel. And then the GNU-C library could expose two applications, because currently uh, there's an RSEC size symbol exposed by the GNU-C library to applications. But the thing is, I mean, currently it, it, it says, well, okay, 32 byte is a size, but it, it has no meaning in terms of feature set that is supported. So this is where I would like to add a new RSEC feature size symbol. I mean, having thought about this extensibility scheme well enough ahead of time, that would, I mean, the RSEC size would have been the feature size. So, Florian just raised his hand online, and um, I'm kind of watching the online Zoom as well, because I think the one thing we've probably left out in each of these rooms is that you need a, we actually need a watcher for each room to watch the online Zoom stuff to see that if people have their hands raised, 
Um, Florian writes, we already have our sec flags. The kernel could tell us to register with extra flag bits, then we can use the padding. So. I'll, ha I'll have to think more about it. Uh, yeah, but okay. maybe, yeah. It's because we, we already have our sec flags in, in glibc. So I guess the point is, you know, the kernel through whatever uh, AT flag coming down or something coming down could tell us to register with the extra flag bits and then then we can know something. Oh, you mean, it. okay. So f from a glibc ABI perspective, when we are using the RSEC size as a feature set, then there would be a RSEC flag raised in the RSEC flag a a a symbol. I guess that's a possibility. Yeah. Oh, Hold question. On. Michael. Um, I don't know about the specific, uh, what, what, what Florian said, but in any case, I want to raise the general thing that it should not be a data symbol, it should be a function returning something, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that the size of something should not imply any features. If you want to enumerate features, define maybe a bit. <laughs> no, no, no. It, okay, in this specific case, uh, I've had this, this discussion many times with many people. In this speci specific case, this structure is ABI in user space, well, between the kernel yes. and user space, but my, also my, my within point user is, space. My point is the size is not the ABI, the contents of the structure are the, are the ABI. Yes, then if, you if do you want switch, to. If you switch to fields, the size No, you cannot. You can never do that, and once they are implemented, yeah, they need to stay there should, and unchanged. That's why you should add a bit no, you cannot. It's, it's this version of no, the version. No, 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 it cannot. Because within well, one, can. one second, within one process, that structure is shared between glibc, application, and various shared objects. Yeah. They all need to agree on the content, which means the layout may never change. It becomes something else. But it's not a version. It's not bits saying it's enabled or disabled. It's there. It's going to grow. But it can never either change or once a feature is there, in order to have the following features, you, you need to implement the prior ones. Yeah, I understand. But, that, but the point is that you can't protect against this with just the size. You need to know more about that. So it, it, the size works for that. <laughs> Not really, no. Uh, because if, it, if, it, if you have an, I don't know, let's say a random shared library that allocates the RSEC sequence statically, right? And, dot RO data, then something needs to make sure that this was not too small in the actual runtime when it's Wait, 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 wait. So, uh, so struct RSEC is a communication channel between the kernel and applications and libraries, but it's owned by glibc. And it's allocated by glibc uh, in its own uh, struct pre-tread or, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. uh, the, the, the TCB, near the TCB, yes. Okay, okay. So it's not owned by applications. What the applications own are small descriptors of their critical sections, which describe, let's say, the abort IP, the beginning and the end, tiny, tiny. And then when they start a critical section, they store a pointer to this small descriptor in the uh, thread locals, okay. in, in well, the per-thread if, if everything is owned by glibc, why do the, I don't know, what, what is actually supposed to check the feature size symbol then? If, Sorry? You know, if everything is owned by glibc, why would there be a need to export the feature size? Because the feature size in, is an agreement between the, what the kernel supports and what applications and libraries can use. glibc does not have to be in the way. The only thing that glibc needs to do is to allocate a size that is large enough to hold all those fields. That's it. It has okay, no. But, but you're no saying that is done by glibc, right? Yes. Okay. So why does it need to export any information of that to any library or other libraries or executables? Because they want to know what features it has. Yep. Well, okay. If they want to know features, I'm again saying that maybe that the size is not the good representation of, you know, giving you the set of features. <laughs> but it should then be some, you know, more. Yeah, but I mean, it, it is a, a feature set that needs to only grow. I mean, if, if you start wanting to peek all in that and say, oh, this one is not implemented, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a struct RSEC2. It's not the same. It's, it's a new ABI. It's new symbols. It's a new thing. Yeah, well, um, in any case, I, I raised my concern, so. <laughs> okay. Thank you.
All right, uh, we have a lot of stuff to cover, so but we can discuss offline uh, during the weekend. I, uh, I, I'm here, I'll be happy to discuss it more. Uh, okay, so idea about using flag for size, okay, yes. Um, now, okay, sorry, I'll have to. I just hope I don't have to do that for every slide. All right. Yeah, okay, memory allocator use case. So uh, one problem with the per-CPU arenas is that they do not perform better than a global or per-thread arena in all cases. Uh, for instance, uh, you waste memory if your number of threads uh, is lower uh, than the number of cores. Uh, let's say you have a single threaded process. I mean, you'd be good with a single arena if you're per-thread, so why allocate arenas for every core on the system? And that becomes especially painful if you take a system on which you apply CPU sets and then kind of uh, partition your system in smaller subsystems. But I mean, each of those uh, container can see the, the whole number of CPU on your system, right? That's unfortunate. So I mean, one thing that can be done is to use rather complex heuristics to figure out, okay, so uh, is it, uh, do I need to do arenas per thread? Do I need to go for a per core approach? Or do I need to have a global arena? So, uh, but I mean, cases where such complexity is unwanted might be real-time systems where memory and arenas should be, uh, I mean, they would like to be able to prefault everything, right? But if you start doing things per thread, then I mean, new threads can come up and everything. So it's ra rather hard to, uh, to do that. So what, I'm, what I did present earlier this week at Linux Plumber Conference is a scheme that uh, uses the scheduler knowledge of the amount of concurrency within a process to allocate virtual CPU IDs. So, uh, and, and the ger general problem that this solves is the need to configure user space data structure partitioning based on uh, being global per thread or per core based on the ratio of threads versus, versus cores uh, in, the, in the process. So that's the link to the presentation. Uh, it, quickly, uh, so the original, uh, or, uh, original idea comes from Paul Turner. Uh, we discussed it in uh, 2015, uh, 2019 at the Linux Plumbers Conference. And uh, the idea is to allocate virtual CPU ID within a process, uh, which can be uh, limited by the, no uh, bound by the number of threads that run concurrently. And the scheduler knows that, the Linux scheduler. Uh, so the Google implementation was not made publicly available, so I did my own implementation. Uh, and from the user space point of view, it adds a new field to struct our sec, which is a VM vCPU ID field. So you'll have, so you, as you're running, you run on a, a given CPU number. Let's say you have the node ID now, and then you have this VM vCPU ID number. So the, the, the nice thing about it is if you're a single threaded process, that value is going to be pretty much always zero, right? Uh, if you are, even if you're a multi-threaded process, if you run, let's say, uh, in a container that has a CPU set of five CPU, it's never going to go be, uh, be uh, beyond five. So it, it keeps things nice and small. And, but it keeps enough entries so that you, each of the threads that run have their own bucket, their own entry. So they can do per CPU data, but I mean, it does not need to be the actual core index on the whole system. It can be limited. So uh, that's an example. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about memory allocator, arenas. So the idea I have, and this is something I discussed earlier this year uh, with Carlos, um, Something I'd like to see happening is to have the memory allocator arenas for glibc uh, be based on the memory hierarchy. So the idea I have in mind is that there could be one arena to allocate from per virtual CPU. Then there could also be one arena at the NUMA node level and maybe one global. And then what can be done, and this is just a rough sketch of what the API could look like, but a thread could state, okay, I want now to allocate from the per node arena. I want to allocate now from the per vCPU arena or the global one. So it could tune from which pool memory should be allocated. 
So there, when you have workloads where uh, some pattern, uh, workload patterns where you have one thread doing all the allocation, a different thread doing all the free. So, I mean, it's kind of useless to allocate from a per v a vCPU uh, arena. So they might want to specify, I want to allocate from the per node arena instead. So everything, I mean, we know we're going to hit that same per node arena, but at least we're not going to be playing in each other's by backyard. So the, um, Per virtual CPU, uh, yeah, okay. That's another thing that would be interesting. Um, so rather than saying, okay, each time I want to define a per CPU data, let's make a big array of data or an array of pointer that, that is indexed by virtual CPU ID. So it, if, if you do an array of actual data uh, and that data is, is relatively small, you'll want to put some, some additional padding to eliminate false sharing. So that's wasted space, that's wasted cache lines. So one thing uh, that we could do is to flip things around and basically have a dedicated memory allocator mode that could allocate per CPU data. So let's say I want to allocate a 20-byte object. It would allocate 20-byte objects into each of the per vCPU arenas, and then basically at the same offset within the arenas. So then we just have to figure out a way to do the offset calculation eff efficiently, uh, and then we could have per, uh, per vCPU data accesses. So I think that could be quite nice to keep things really packed in terms of memory allocation and don't waste, sp waste space uh, for, um, uh, for, for, uh, due, for padding to eliminate false uh, sharing. Uh, and I mean, that's a concept they use in the Linux kernel, so why not do that, uh, do something similar in user space? Um, another thing that would be nice, uh, or that can be done actually with, uh, with RSEC is uh, doing a statistics counter. So now I'm in the use case I want to bring where I think there may be uh, benefits for, for GLibc. So it's up to, if, up to you guys to tell me whether there are actual benefits or not. Um, so rather than using global counters when you want to do some resource accounting, using per virtual CPU ID counters scales much more nicely because you're not hitting a global cache line on, on multi-core systems. Uh, so the, the performance is similar to per thread counters, but the aggregation is much faster, especially, I, I mean, if you run thousands of threads, if you want to aggregate those per thread counters, you have to walk over many of those threads every time you want to aggregate. But with the per vCPU approach, then you're, you're bound by the, well, worst case it will be the number of cores on your system, but it, if you're fine, fine to fewer cores, then it's even less. So uh, uh, it, it's a way to have fast and cheap counters. So having those counters much cheaper may make them more useful. So maybe, I mean, it does not become only, let's say, a, a, a debugging thing that's only enabled with tunables. I mean, it could be run onto real workload and be used for uh, uh, feedback-based uh, uh, tuning of, of the algorithms for each application or things like that. So it, it opens door to various things. So, um, I, I plan to use this eventually also in user space RCU. Um, so currently the flavors of RCU that are implemented in the library are ba the, the grace period tracking is, is per thread. But I have prototype branches where the grace period tracking is done uh, per CPU. So with the virtual CPU IDs, then the per CPU becomes even cheaper. Um, and uh, by using RSEC as well, then I can skip atomic increments on the, when I, so, so basically I use atomic increments to, to signify the, re, the read side begin and end. Using RSEC it can be made much fast, faster than atomics. I use the member system call, uh, which is done by the grace period, which can then in turn, in, in turn eliminate memory barriers on the read side, and I can replace them by compiler barriers. 
So all the building blocks are now there uh, to have something that is fast uh, in terms of synchronization for RCU. And I, I know that Carlos at some point might be interested to implement RCU in uh, LibC to speed up many use cases that currently rely on reader writer locks, but that would be made much faster, uh, faster and scale much better with RCU. So um, there's one thing that's nice to do per CPU grace period tracking, tracking rather than per thread, is that with the per CPU uh, GP tracking, then you can allocate multiple RCU domains. So you're not stuck at having, let's say, one single linked list of thread that you iterate on, and then if you, so as you do a synchronized RCU, it only interacts with, with, with your own domain if you are our multi-domain RCU. Uh, if you're single domain RCU, there are cases where interaction between mutexes, RCU, and a synchronized RCU, so if you take a mutex within a read side, you could trigger deadlocks. So by splitting things into multiple domains, then you eliminate some chances of dead deadlocks. So that, that's a nice thing about multi-domain RCU. And then the call RCU callbacks actually could be enqueued into per vCPU list rather than per CPU. Uh, so that's also a nice thing uh, that can be done. Other things um, that can be done with, uh, with RSEC. So having a, so the node ID, if you have a fast access to the node ID through RSEC, then you could use it very cheaply to say, well, rather than having every thread on every NUMA node trying to hit the same cache line to get a mutex, then you could have a first level where they basically agree together with a ticket per NUMA node, okay, who's going to be the next to try to take the resource and then do that hierarchically and then so one win, one wins, and then each NUMA node is going to try to take the resource. And then, so, so rather than having every thread on the system trying to hit that same shared uh, cache line across the entire system, you could start by NUMA node and having one elected representative going to the, the, the shared resource at the time. Another thing that could be done, and this is further extensions I have in mind, which I have not done yet, but it would be to do fast signal blocking. So rather than doing p thread sig, uh, sig, sig mask uh, set and things like that uh, to block signals, what could be done here is to let the kernel know that the signals need to be blocked for a short critical section by just storing to this RSEC, uh, to this RSEC area in the thread local, well, in the, in the per thread area. So user space would just set the mask of signal that need to be blocked when entering the critical section. Then at the end, so it would clear the, the blocked mask. Then the, so there would be another mask which be, would be set by the kernel read by user space. It would be a signal pending mask. So the kernel, while the critical section was executing, if it attempted to deliver a signal but noticed that they were blocked, then it would set the signal pending mask. Therefore, when user space exits the critical section, it should check the signal pending mask, and then if, it's, if something is set, it should call a kernel system call, and perhaps a new system call there, to say, please deliver all signals now. And we could probably piggyback on some existing system call as well to do that. So another thing I noticed, um, so the stack cache in glibc. Uh, so this is, as far as I understand, so glibc, when you exit a thread, so it, it does not let the memory go back to the kernel, especially for the, the, the stack, right? Which includes space for your stack and for your thread local storage, mostly, and the process descriptor. So it's keeping that around because, I mean, it's, it's nice, nicely laid out, it's, uh, it's cache hot, uh, it's, uh, it's everything. So it can be reused by an upcoming thread. So that stack cache is a global resource per process. It's protected by a, stack, a DL stack cache lock. Well, I mean, but it's just a cache. So we could make it per virtual CPU. So all the accesses would be local, would be extremely fast, and we'd el eliminate a global lock. So that, that's the kind of thing we can do with the per virtual CPU uh, IDs. So I have some references, but yeah, I mean, if. If you have question, uh, I'm uh, I'm listening, and we have plenty of time. Yeah. 
Yes. Microphone. So is that a checkpoint restore issue that there was some checkpoint rest issue with checkpoint restore? Is that resolved now? Yes, it is. So they've added a, a getter in the ptrace system call to get the RSEC state from within the kernel so that they can then restore it. Yes, that, that, that part that was missing, it's been contributed. I guess in your suggestion about glibc memory allocation malloc and distributing, there's recent discussion, even more so about tiered memory in Linux kernel stuff at the, the last Linux file system memory management conference. So I was wondering, are you, is there a way to utilize, or were you suggesting using restartable sequences specifically with the kernel to be able to communicate the tiered memory plans that are already in the Linux kernel and apply that to glibc, or are you just defining a completely parallel implementation of tiered memory, of, of pooled memory node specific NUMA hierarchy memory separate from the, what the kernel is planning? So, I mean, I cannot say I can fully answer your question uh, because I, I was not present in those presentation of that track. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, but I mean, the, the core idea there is to allow user space to make the best choices in terms of uh, closeness of the memory allocation yeah. based on its own need, and that's user space that know it, right? And, and it's even the application that knows it. Uh, hence the, the API to set, okay, do you want to allocate per, at, in the vCPU arena, in the, in the NUMA arena, or the global one? So that's the intent there. Uh, and uh, and my, my other intent is to, yeah. But I mean, in terms of tiered memory, I may need a very tiny refresher before I, I can fully answer your question uh, without uh, being too vague. No, no, no I, I understand. Thank, thanks very much. I mean, but I, I, mean, I guess what I, I mean, probably what I'm saying is I'm not certain how much um, the user, I mean, I cl clearly understand for the case where the user does know or has specific information about the NUMA nodes, but there are cases that it might not, but the kernel does because of all this other tiered memory work that's doing, and so I'm just curious whether these restart okay. sequences can somehow communicate that separately to glibc that it can utilize better allocation of, of its memory. Actually, that touches a thought I had this morning when I prepared the slides. So if, so, so, if, in, so, in some rare cases, the user space might be, uh, so a thread might be interested to say, I want the memory to be allocated for a, from a specific arena. And that might come from a specific set of hardware memory. So maybe this is what you have in mind in terms of tiered memory, right? So, so it might not be from the current NUMA node allocation. I mean, it might be something completely separate. It might be uh, persistent memory. It might be other things. Yeah, I mean, CXL, I mean, all these tiers. Yeah. That yeah. So, so here, I mean, it might, might make sense to, in addition, so, and this is, let's go back to this, uh, this slide, the set thread malloc arena. So I made it simple, right? It's a small enum, but it could be an attribute descriptor that can contain the enum about, oh, please use the current vCPU arena or node or whatever, but it could also be overridden to say, please use, well, so it could come with an API that says, I want to create my own arena. Please put it right there in memory as the kernel for AM map, and th this is where it goes, right? Some information about it hand that over to glibc, and then it could be passed as an argument, please, for the next allocations, I want to allocate from that arena. I don't know if it answers your... Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, I, 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 that, that's yeah, exactly, that, that, that's part of it. I mean, I guess what I'm asking is specifically in your, you know, talk about restorable sequences, does restorable sequences specifically give you better information about that or provide a communication mechanism from the kernel f to implement that? It's almost... I'm trying to tie these together. Yeah, not really. And this is why okay. I did not put that in my slides, because that's kind of an orthogonal problem. Okay. But it kind of makes sense. But it, 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 yeah, it's not related to the vCPU node or global or the hierarchy. It, 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 it is something that should be, I think, something that the user could override and say, oh, yeah, please allocate from there. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. I was going to say that. Um, you know, the, the tiered hierarchy, there was a talk there, but I missed it. I didn't get a chance to watch that. I was watching a different talk. But I think per, as long as you can express that as per vCPU data, 
then restartable sequences can get it to the allocator quickly, and then the allocator can make decisions on the data that it sees when it's in that CPU. Um, the like uh, PMEM to DRAM hot page balancing, if we already know what node we're on and we're already getting local memory, then there's never going to be wasted work doing balancing for that thread as long as you pin that thread. And if you have multiple threads in producer consumer model, who cares? You pin them all to that CPU and you're getting node local memory, then hopefully that the balancer never has to do anything to move those pages, right? Because that's an expensive operation. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that, that brings an interesting point. How do you combine tiered memory and v per vCPU indexing? Um, I, but I mean, like, if you can individually request that tiered memory, the API becomes really different. Um, Intel has a NUMA where allocator built on top of JM malloc, and that allocator's in, uh, in alpha, and like, I, I don't think it's, yeah, I think their docs say it's not intended for production uses. It could have changed the last time I looked at, that's what it said. Um, but the APIs become very different if you're trying to allocate like yeah. tiers and classes of memory. I think Jay Malloc has a concept of, you know, like kinds of memory. And the, so this allocator is called memkind, I think, which is the Intel-based allocator, which you can ask for kinds of things. Yeah. By the way, I mean, one thing I did not state is that the way I designed the, the, the virtual CPU IDs and the Numa node IDs, I made sure that the mapping between the vCPU ID and the node ID stays invariant for the lifetime of the process, unless, of course, there's a kernel level Numa node reconfiguration thing uh, due to uh, CPU outplug. But otherwise, you get, so as long as your allocator, so, your allocator would have to do that lazily. I mean, uh, you might want to pre-allocate for a, a couple of vCPU IDs, but I mean, keep in mind that you might go beyond if there's a configuration change, so you allocate up to max number of possible CPUs. But then the nice thing is, whenever you hit a virtual CPU that was not used before, then you can do this, uh, well, with RSEC, you both read the virtual CPU number and the NUMA node ID. You use that NUMA node ID to do your NUMA node, uh, your, your memory allocation on this specific NUMA node. And then your NUMA local for, and then you don't need to care about the NUMA node number. For all the following accesses, you just care about the virtual CPU ID and you are accessing NUMA local memory. Yep. Any uh, other questions? Other questions? Nothing on the uh, IRC or uh, it's all good? Let me check. Um, no other questions on Zoom. Oh, wait, Florian has his hand up. Florian, I think there's like a 100 millisecond delay between here and the broadcast. Can you hear me? Oh, my goodness. Yes, we can hear you. Voice yes, of God. Very well, very well. <laughs> OK. Um, do you think we need compiler support for writing restartable sequences? Uh, the implementation side? Yes. Like enhan an enhancement of the flatten attribute, yes. which forcefully tries to inline all called functions into the same function so that you have a contiguous instruction sequence required by RSEC, something like that. Uh, I'll ask Carlos to just r repeat because, I mean, with the, it's very loud with the speaker. So if you repeat this question, I'll be able to answer it very easily. So um, Florian is asking about something that we've been talking about all morning, actually, leading up to your restartable sequences talk. Um, and the, the question is, do we want compiler support for writing the restartable sequences? I'd love and, that. And <laughs> Florian's comment is specifically about, like, you uh, mark the function in such a way that the compiler brings everything into the function so that there are no like external calls in that function. That function is basically the restartable sequence that's either going to get executed accessing vCPU data quickly, sorry, per CPU data quickly, or it's not, right? Yeah. And then there's a restart. So. It should also warn if there are side effects before the end and yes. things like that. So the, it can get complex, though. I, absolutely, because the restartable sequences look a lot like software transactional memory, which, um, Ray, which Aldi raised a question and said, we should go talk to Richard Henderson, who'd written libitm, and have a conversation with Richard about what he thinks about these core concepts and how we can expose them in the compiler. Um, so, Florian, did we answer your question, and did we get that right? Yeah, I think so, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to pass this to Zabosh. 
At some point, there was something about using restartable sequences for asymmetric barrier kind of thing, like uh, yes, the RSEC fence. So it's it's in it's in uh, the membarrier system call. So you can call membarrier and asking to issue a RSEC fence, and it's going to restart all the ongoing RSEC critical section. So I guess that's another thing that we might can use in glibc somewhere. Well, there's a there's actually a use case for that. So we discussed uh, earlier, uh, Carlos and I, about the use case of uh, the stack cache, uh, and that's a that's a point where you want to be able to uh, free the, all the stack caches at program teardown before things like Valgren uh, actually try to figure out if there's been a memory leak. And there's actually an API that JLibC exposed to free up those resources. But at this point, you may want to support that, okay, yeah, maybe concurrently there's still a thread running or something doing some allocation. So, but the thing is, uh, in order to do this synchronization, we may want to go from a state where we are fast and we use RSEC to do all the updates on, on local data to a state where, okay, we want to do the heavy stomping and, and iterate on everything from a single thread and just touch every per CPU data. So this flip of mode could be done and then in the heavy mode you use, a, a, you use locking, right? But this flip, you know, the way you could protect this flip and make sure that there's nobody in the old mode while you're using locking now is by using RSEC fence. So with the RSEC fence, you could make sure that everyone who was in the old mode who may not have seen this bit being flipped on are going to abort and retry and oh, do the locking. So, so this can be useful for that kind of thing. Yeah, so the, the issue, the concern here, and I think it's a, a concern we've talked with Rich Felker about, which is exit handling during concurrent uh, pre-thread create, and like, what's your forward progress guarantees on exit? But in this case, like in glibc, we're, we just tear everything down, and it's like, it's your fault if you're trying to make threads in the middle of another thread calling exit. Um, but if that's the case where, uh, as you're leading down this path, you want to just stop everybody from using restartable sequences, I think, in this case, and switch to locking, because then, yeah. I mean, the, the exit's not going to happen, because I think the Valgrind thread takes over, and it wants to call uh, libc free, uh, free res, right? So either way, this, that whole transition point, I think, has to happen somewhere during exit, if we're going to start freeing all the thread resources that we had left over. Other questions? Oh, yeah, there's one, actually. So, yeah, so is it, uh, is, are these VCPUs guaranteed to be a small number, and is yes. it a known small number? So fixed the, for the lifetime of the processor? So the maximum value is the number of possible CPUs on the, on the system. So uh, it's uh, the number of configured CPU. From a user space point of view, it's called the number of configured CPU. Uh, yes, uh, Carlos, you want to answer? No? Oh, after, after, sorry. Uh, so, it's, so there's an upper bound to that, right? But let's say you're in a process that is uh, where either uh, SCED uh, set affinity or CPU sets have been used to restrict you to run, let's say, on five CPUs. So the worst case is that you have one thread per run queue running actively, so it's five. So the maximum index number you'll get is four, so zero to four. So it really keeps you compact near zero. And if you're single threaded, it's gonna be zero. Um, Florian just raised online saying, uh, revocation of biased file pointer locks could use this kind of mem barrier too, I think. Uh, and he also notes parenthetically, fopen really should produce a file pointer biased towards the current thread. Mm. So, 
Okay. So additional use cases. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Good. Use Good. cases are never ending. So that's perfect. That's why uh, that's why I'm here for. Uh, I yeah. I think I'm excited because as of 235, we have the APIs in place, and we'll have we have kernel support for it, and then we can start looking at how to use these operations, and and the performance of them, and benchmark them. Great. All right. If there are no uh, one more question over there. Uh, so, uh, sorry, this is going to be a very basic question. I feel like a lot of people here have a lot of background on this, but um, in my mind, I make an, I don't know if it's correct or not, I make an association of restartable sequences as being, having some similarities with uh, transactional memory. Uh, in some way, yes, so, but yes. So my question is, uh, uh, hardware transaction memory was, was implemented, but uh, was, I don't know, people decided that it wasn't uh, worth it. So what is different with restartable sequences that it's now um, uh, worth it to, to do them? So as far as I understand, and I'm no expert in hardware transactional memory, but a uh, few paper I read, I mean, comparing RCU with software transa transactional memory, you ended up with RCU being much faster than uh, HTM. So HTM consumes hardware resources as well, and it is aware of what is happening across the entire system, right? So if you're multi-core, HTM is going to snoop around and check, oh, are there updates on other cores and things like that. For RSEC, it's purely per CPU. We don't care about the other cores, single core at a time, and it's mitigated by the kernel in software, only on preemption, so almost never happens. So the, the, the overhead in the footprint is extremely small, and we're, and we're using um, standard loads, loads and stores. So, I mean, a RSEC increment is pretty much storing the, the, the RSEC critical section descriptor pointer. So, storing a pointer to the portrait area, ink, and we're done, pretty much. I think there, yeah, there may be a, a load current CPU number and a comparison in some cases, but uh, you, get, you, you get the idea. I mean, it, it's standard in instruction on Intel. It takes fractions of a nanosecond, and they are heavily optimized. So it's very hard to do faster than that. Well. I guess I'll just sort of mention that the hardware implementation of hardware transaction memory hasn't met expectations, and, and leave it at that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I guess the approach there is to try to do something similar, but limit the scope, and and do I mean and redesign the data structures in user space to take I mean to partition them in such a way that we can have the benefits of transactional memory, but in a much more localized fashion. And software and fixable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other, other questions? Oh, Carlos? Um, no, I'm, just, I'm relaying a comment from Florian here. He says, hardware transactional memory is prone to speculation vulnerabilities. RSEC automatically inherits any speculation hardening for user space because, as Matthew says, it's just non-atomic instructions. So I think that's a very good point, that if there are speculation attacks against that, we're just inheriting all the protections that user space already has for the existing set of instructions. Yep. So. Good security story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, no other questions? All right, one, two, three. OK, thank you.
Hello? 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 Do you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, sh should, I, should I talk louder or it's okay? Okay. Do you have, no, no, let me share my whole screen. Okay. Do you have my white screen? I see just the black screen now this. from you. This is One Zoom. Time, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So okay. I'm sharing, but nothing is there, right? Yeah, it works. I don't see. Mm. Again. So I I see the mouse, Hers. but I didn't see any any window. Oh, yeah, the and yeah. Now it's better. Okay, and this is the way. Okay, so I go there, and then I put this one. Yeah, it works. Nice whim. I like whim. So, create some a few slides and say something. Yeah, okay. Uh, do, do you have my screen or not? This is yes, we do. Black thing? Good, good. No, but now this, I'm... Uh, oh. Yes, we do. Good, good. But now you can see the text and things. Okay, so how to get rid of this? Minimizing it? This is usually what you see, yeah. And this is the start. You will switch. Now it's my screen. Uh, Mohammed, what? Okay. Can you can you stop sharing your screen until it's time for you to avoid people in okay. get confused? Okay. Okay. Good. So, back to scene, back to mm -hmm. HDMA VGA. Okay. Thanks. So I I, I will let you Great. know, Mohammed. It will be around four. Yeah. Okay.
Hello? It works? Yes? Okay, so let's start because we only have one hour to break GDP. <laughs> Should I close this? All right, so, so this uh, uh, presentation today is about um, how can we actually make GNUPOC to help the tool chain in general. We will see that it's about integrating POC in some of the toolchain components. In particular, the first victims are GDB and the assembler, but we will continue. Um, but also we will see that POC can be used for, with good effect also to other purposes which are related to the project, like helping with documentation, like documenting formats and binary stuff, and also with the testing for generating this data and so on. Um, GNUPOC, I have made so many introductory talks that I can't, I can't do it again anymore. So you have all the resources there. It is a binary editor, but more. Um, some people like it. And um, POC is, uh, is, is growing. As you can see here, um, there is POC the application, which, oops. <laughs> There is POC the application, um, but there is LibPOC, which is what we use, which is basically what implements most of the functionality, the incremental compiler for the POC language, the POC virtual machine, the input output subsystems and whatnot, the binary utilities that people write with POC itself, the pickles, which are the descriptions of formats written in POC, in the POC language. Also, Linking to lipoc.so, then you see now the GDB, gas. The gas part is vaporware, as we will see, but it will happen. Uh, the POC daemon. Uh, we are starting writing uh, user interfaces like the Emacs mode, which is a user interface for the so binary editors like uh, that people can use directly, other than the command line interface. In Emacs, also graphical user interface and so on, they use uh, the POC daemon which links with LibPoc with the library. So this is the POC sphere, whatever you want to call it. It's growing out of control. So what is the plan and the approach of this? The thing is, um, POC is good as, at poking at binary data, describing it and modifying it and reading it and so on. Now, um, this, is an, this is an activity that happens in other activities, like debugging, like doing reverse engineering, like uh, designing new formats, right? Everyone needs a good binary editor from time to time. Now, when it comes to, to, to expansion, um, there are, I think, two, two main approaches. The first one is to make, will be to make POC, a debugger, a reverse engineering suite, um, a decompiler, a network analysis tool, but I don't think that's the right approach. This is, by the way, the approach that the POC competitors are all taking, like Radar2, like uh, Kaita Extract, and so on. They try to be everything, right? So instead, we are supporting basic capabilities in POC. For example, with POC, you can actually POC at the memory of a running process, but in a very simple way, you know? If you casually have to do it, you can do it. But if you really want to poke at the memory of a running process, use GDB, don't use poke. Because GDB knows about processes. GDB uh, knows about different targets, platforms, whatever. And the same can be said, you know, for the assembler, for the disassembler, for the compilers, and so on. So instead of trying to, to make poke all that that it is not, we basically, we infect those, uh, those, those, uh, those applications with POCIS capabilities, right? That's the approach that we think it's, it, it's better. So here you can see something that I think it's important to know before we get into the integration part. How POC works um, in terms of, uh, of, of, IO, of, of doing IO, right, of, of accessing data. At the top le left, you see the application could be the POC command line interface, or a graphical user interface, or the POC daemon, or GDB. No, well, GDB is in the, but yeah, or GDB actually, yes. Um, then you, you issue some POC code that happens to access the whatever file or memory, whatever you are editing. 
So this code, which is written in this domain-specific language, it gets compiled into, um, into PVM, POC Virtual Machine Instructions, right? This PVM is the POC Virtual Machine, which is part of LibPOC, like all that. Um, and those PICPOC instructions actually work on a bit addressable uh, space that you can see down here, you see, um, that is built on top of a, the, the usual byte-oriented space that provides the operating system provides, right? So then the PVM issues uh, works with this bit addressable I/O object uh, space. Then the I/O subsystem, which is also part of LibPOC, translates that into byte operations. And the byte operations, which is the underlying device you are editing, like if you are editing a, a binary file or, a, or, a, or memory or, or a socket or whatever, they are implemented by those IODs, IO devices, which could be a file, a memory, a process, like I said, in a very simple way, the process. Uh, and the last one is the foreign support for foreign IO spaces, which is, we will see, what GDB, for example, uses to integrate with LibPog. So when you use POC from within an application like GDB, it goes all the way there, and then it goes back to you. And that is what you can see here. So we have GDB, right, at the left. And GDB links with libpoc.so. That has, it has the, the POC compiler, the POC virtual machine, and the IO subsystems and everything. Now, GDB registers handlers to be itself one of those IO devices, a foreign IO device. So when you, do, when you, you use PK execute from GDB, that is one service provided by libpoc, you compile, you evaluate, compile, and execute POC code, and that may result in IO happening, right? In picking or poking. And that com comes back to GDB through callbacks, and this is the way GDB can use POC to poke the memory of the, of the inferior that GDB is debugging. It is very simple, and it works, so what else can you ask for? Now, the, the, the part in the top is the terminal. Also, there are some hooks in libpoc for integration of applications where you define the terminal stuff, right? GDB just prints in using the print unfiltered or print, I don't know, the, the GDB printing internal stuff. So this sort of, this kind of integration achieves the approach for global pocation, right? Which is GDB is good at what it does, and with POC, we are adding something to it, right? Which is a carefully designed domain-specific language for poking at data, painfully designed, right? There is no other programming language that, that, that doing what POC can do. Trust me on that. Um, GDB-specific pickles, so that is POC code that is specific to GDB that could be useful, you know, to work in GDB. Actually, well, okay, no, I will not go there. Um, and also general purpose pickles, because debugging a problem is fine, but if your program is, is handling data for which you don't have C type de definitions in DORF or in whatever, then what do you do, right? Imagine that you have a program that has TCP packets in some buffer, and your program has a very simplified or a very superficial or even no uh, type definitions for the contents of the buffer, but still you want to look at that. What do you do? Well, you will need to get that buffer to dump it into a file from GDB, then you will need to, to use some binary editor, some analysis tool, whatever. With this, you just load the TCP pickle, which is a pickle that something, someone wrote, wrote already for you, for other purposes, most likely, and you can use it from GDB. So you win, and it costs you nothing. Oh, this is not merged yet, but because we have problems uh, <laughs> But um, there is a prototype there that you can use if you want to play with all this. So how this looks like? Well, the most basic thing that you can do, well, there is a new command in GDB called poke. Everything you put after this command is poke code, right? Um, you can do simple things like two, two plus three. It works. It gives you five. That's good, I guess. And then, but for example, let's do something more sophisticated. Load. MPR for master boot record, this is loading a pickle that someone wrote, not me, someone, for editing and poking and vandalizing master boot records. So 
Then you load it automatically. You have all those definitions available for you. And then this uh, uh, MBR PT brace brace is the syntax for constructing a new poke value. Um, it is constructing one with default values. And the last command here is basically uh, writing a master boot record that you just constructed in that address in the memory of the inferior that you are debugging with GDB. This is the most basic usage, right? However, um, the master boot record types, someone wrote them, for, probably for some other purpose. But when you are debugging something with GDB, most likely you have some debugging for, for it, DORF, CTF, whatever. And you want to look at the data structure that your program actually understands and deals with. So for that, um, this patch includes um, a capability that this is a struct person, this is C, right? So with poke add type struct person, uh, it adds, it transforms, translates the GDB types, which it themselves come from DORF or whatever the back format or stabs or whatever. No, stabs no, but okay. Um, into poke types and evaluates them. So this poke dump types tells you all the poke types that has been added to the poke subsystem by this. So for example, this extract it uses this uint 16 and some other basic C types. The basic C types, as you see, well, uh, I mean, it is, it is uh, uh, depth first, depth, 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 well, you know what I mean, yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, short and sign in, and then you can see there, you can dump, you know, the poke definitions. Once you do this, you can poke at the same data structures. As you can see, um, the poke one has labels because it, it, you know it uh, because of the padding and everything, it, it's reflected. It's, it's better than the C extract in that sense, right? Ooh. Okay. Um, but also, you know, um, you may say, okay, well, yeah, but I, if, I, if I am using GDB, if I want to dump, if I want to poke, poke at, or if I want to work with data, how to find that data, right? And well, yeah, w w where is that data? It could be in automatic, so in the stack, it could be in the heap, it could be here or there. So you need a way to actually say, okay, if I have a buffer, if I have a buffer in, in my program, I have a pointer to that buffer somewhere in my program, well, I could just in GDB print that pointer and then copy and paste, nah. So, as you can see here, uh, in the top you have two, two, two global variables in a C program, this counter and this struct person, which is an, uh, a person from the struct type that we saw before. And then, as you can see, if you use a dollar before the name of a POC variable, then it is an alien variable in POC, right? Um, GDB, in the integration with POC, you can also define handlers that, are, that go to the lexer level. There is a paper coming on this. I call this lexical cuckolding. Um, it injects, so you can actually inject tokens in the poke uh, compiler, right? So for example, here, dollar counter refers to the GDB symbol, or I don't know, how are those things are called in GDB? Variable symbols? Because they are not variables, they are more general. How do you call them? No, 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 this is not a convenient variable. This is, this dollar counter is, is, is it, when you do GDB, you do print counter, and counter corresponds to a variable in your program, for example. How do, how, variables, well, whatever. Um, and also you can get the address with dollar address colon colon of any GDB symbol. So for example, this is used in the example here in the, on the bottom to map, this is a poke mapping, this is pure poke mapping, to map a struct person at the address in the pointer P in your program. You see? So we achieve bidirectional communication here. Um, so this is the GDB integration in terms of uh, how, it, how it works, right? And what, what it does. Um, yeah. Now, the next one. The assembler. Um, we have a problem with the assembler, which is that there is no way, there are not, we don't have portable data directives. 
And this is something that maybe not everyone realizes, but it's a problem that exists, and it is a bad problem. And you find this kind of problem when you try to do things like, for example, generating CTF or DORF or whatever for every target, you know? Uh, it does not work. It does not work unless you... So, um, basically, this integration that I am proposing here, which is not done already, I have some, something, but it's not quite working because uh, have problems with the frags, and as you can imagine, um, is that to add a new data directive called .poke to the assembler, in which you can actually introduce, uh, write any poke expression, and the same way that in GDB, uh, it picks and pokes from the inferior memory, right? When it, in the same way in gas, when you write to it, it will actually add fragments to whatever will be emitted at the end in the second pass of the assembly. So instead of, yes, do you have the microphone? I don't know where the microphone is. The, micro, uh, the microphone is. Huh? Disassembler. So I like your idea, uh, Jose, but I would like to have it also for disassembler. Okay, I'm, inter so I'm interested. So when I disassemble the text, I want to see the same thing with the poke expression and the same, uh, the same uh, uh, variables there, nicely layout. Okay, so you assembly this? I assembly the one which you wrote down. Yeah. And I want to, when, this, uh, when I disassemble, I want to see the same thing. Can, is it possible? I, I can't see why that would be possible with, uh, unless you actually uh, include those strings in the, in the object file. Of somehow. course, we need a, a special section, I think, yeah. I guess it could be possible, yeah. but is this not a general thing? I mean, there are so many things that get lost, right, when you assemble something to binary. I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, yeah because I see a lot of uh, uh, um, potential here. Uh, what I think is that the code at the top, believe it or not, is not portable, right? Which sucks, and it's surprising, but that's how it is. And also, I don't know, I mean, it's, I think this is much more readable, <laughs> to be honest. Particularly because if you change in that pickle PSXX that does not exist, this is something, this is an example I don't remember where I got it, but the, the, the stuff at the top is, is something that people actually do. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's done. Um, well, uh, it's, it's obvious what are the advantages of doing it, like in the bottom, right? So. In the case of gas, the alien tokens, like this dollar main, will refer to the gas symbol with the same name, right? So if you have full colon before this, then you can refer to it as an offset of bytes, you know, uh, in your poke code. So this is what I propose to do for the assembler. We will have discussion later. Actually, I'm going fast because so we can discuss later. Or do you have any comment? Yeah, I was going to, like, What's the advantage of this compared to, say, using a separate poke invocation and then using ink, ink pin? But now I see that you have access to the symbols. And yeah, of course, like of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Actually, probably it will excite you more if instead of this PSXX that I think that people hacking uh, video games stuff use, imagine that this is, for example, a dwarf die that you want to put to assembly for a test. We will talk, see more about this uh, a bit, little bit later. Yeah. Anyway, this is the, the gas integration that I am proposing. But POC can be used for other things too. For example, documentation. Um, recently, we have been designing Adora called the support for the CTF frame format, which Indu designed. She's there, and she's the. She's the, the, the mastermind behind CTF Frame. And while doing it, uh, we, we have seen that it is very useful to actually, as you are developing the format, 
In this case, it's a format for stack, stack tracing, the stack tracing, and she will be talking about it here in Plumbers. Uh, in Plumbers, you know, I'm so sorry. In Cauldron. Um, it is useful to document it using pickles. So this is, for example, the POC definition for um, uh, an entity in CTF, which is the CTF info thing. Because it is easy to read, it is totally and completely not ambiguous, it is designed to not be ambiguous. By looking at those few lines, you can tell, for example, that CTF info is 32 bits long, that it has three fields inside it, that they are, those fields are to be interpreted as unsigned values. The first one is six bits, the second one is one bit, the third one is 25. And also, since this is an integral struct, which is a concept in the POC language, you know that this struct should be stored in the same way that an integral value of 32 bits gets stored, including NDNS and byte ordering and whatnot. And all of that is in this simple definition. You know, it is very simple. Another advantage, you can create prototypes super fast with this. For example, uh, before uh, we added support for, C for dumping CTF uh, uh, in object dump in binutils, that you have to edit in C, you have to blah, 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 blah. You can write a pickle CTF dump that uses the CTF pickle uh, in what? In literally in, 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 uh, in one hour you can write it. It's very fast, you know, I mean, and execute it. So it pays back, that's my point, to actually document your format using POC. Mm. Um, now, the question I have now for the community, can we actually create a pickles directory in Binutils GDB? Because at least we are maintaining two formats in the sense that the implementation in Binutils, which is CTF and CTF frame, the implementation in Binutils is the authoritative uh, implementation, so to say. Right now we have them in POC, the, the POC distribution, like POC the program, but maybe it will be good to move them to Binutils. Um, and finally, um, POC can be also used for testing. And this is something that my colleague Mohammed, who is in Zoom, in five minutes he will actually show you how, an example of this. Um, so, Right now we have test suites in the assembler and in the linker that either ship raw binary data for the expected values, right? That's the typical example. It does not have to be encoded in binary. It can be an S-rec or it can be, you know, but it's the same thing. It's maybe more convenient for Git and for diffs, and, but a diff of an S-rec file is not that, uh, <laughs> that useful as it could be, right? Um, also, we have the problem in those, uh, in those test suites. Sometimes you have raw data because you cannot rely on the assembler data directives to always behave the same in any target. Because you could say, okay, we can use dot war, dot by, dot whatever to encode dwarf, for example, in some test. It will not work, right? So that's not good. Um, sometimes people like me are lazy and then you involve the compiler. So, for example, if you want to add tests for, for DORF or for CTF or so, for something that the compiler happens to generate, then you put there the C files. Yeah, we all do this, right? You put there the C file and then you put rules to generate the .s or the, or the .o and then you use it. But this is not a good thing because we are not testing GCC, right? So if we want to be strict, we should not have in the assembler, you know, uh, or in the linker uh, test suite, in my opinion, eh, I don't think we should have uh, C programs built with GCC like that. So, if we had pickles for DORF, and actually we have, I wrote them, they are in part of the POC distribution. If we have pickles for DORF, if we have pickles for CTF and for CTF frame, if we have pickles for the, for the formats that we want to test, why not using them to generate that test data? Right? in a way that is portable and blah, 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 blah. So um, now my friend Mohammed, who is also, a, he works in POC2, he's gonna show around here. Uh, okay, and now I have to do something. Let me see if I can do it right. I will try. Um, Mohammed, are you there? Manifest yourself. Yes, I'm here. Cool. Okay, so I have to put this in Zoom. 
Aha. And then I have to put this in PC1. Yeah. Can you share your screen? Uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, do you see something? Uh, uh oh. Let me do it again. It's, yeah, the show. Oh, there it is. No, no, I just <laughs> disabled it. Okay, again. You have it? Ah, it's there. It's there. There. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got, we got you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, in this part of talk, I'm going to uh, talk about how can we use uh, GNU Polk as a tool for testing the tool chain itself. Uh, my case study is RISC five uh, RB thirty two I base integer instruction set to see uh, to see what Polk can do for it. Uh, this is just an example. You can imagine other architecture. It's just uh, I chose it because it's simple and easy to understand and uh, show. It. Okay, Polk can be useful for documentation. You can uh, the RISC five instruction set is extensible, so you can document your extensions. Uh, and it, it's a very intelligent kind of documentation because it, it runs its code. You can uh, run, you can generate test data, you can generate uh, stuff for your assembler, for disassembler, for your extension, and things like that. You can use it for testing. Uh, you can generate valid or invalid ELF files or uh, instruction uh, instructions because uh, Poke understands ELF. It understands uh, the instruction set. You can do whatever you want to do, and uh, it, use, it is useful also for debugging uh, because, uh, as I said recently, Poke is. Uh, uh, it knows about the ELF file. You can use it as an assembler or linker or whatever to. Uh, Create some something and then feed it to your uh, something in the tool chain and see if it works or not. And because it uh, it has a fully programming language itself, so you can do analysis and statistics. You can look at your uh, generated code and uh, look at the uh, register allocation. You can read. You can uh, investigate your jumps. You can do analysis. It's it's up to you. And there are more. Okay, what kind of test? Uh, for gas, I, as I told you, you can generate some stuff and see if uh, Polk and gas can agree on something. Uh, in GCC, we can ask questions like, are all dumps PC relative? You you uh, you expect it? Okay, now GCC should uh, emit codes that are all PC relative, or something like that. Or you are uh, Sorry, we searching will for. Interrupt you for okay. a brief moment. We got. Uh... Problem? Problem with the YouTube. Apparently, people on YouTube don't see anything. Uh, one. Okay. But it is Zoom. It says Zoom. So they should see. All right. So the thing that we thought, thought was wrong is actually not wrong. So we will probably just let you <laughs> continue. Good. Uh, just a Can I continue or I have to just wait? A, just a, We, yeah, apparently we, we didn't manage to fix it. So sorry for, pe yeah, we, our apologies to people on uh, YouTube. Um, yeah, you can continue. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, you're you're uh, searching for some a specific sequence of instructions. You want, you expect GCC to uh, emit those kind of uh, patterns or you expect to not emit those kind of patterns and you can test them using uh, poke and uh, you can ask elf related questions um, sections and stuff that is inside them and etc it's up to you now let's focus on risk 5 pickup in uh, what is a pickle in GNU poke terminology we call pickle a logical component that provides a set of related functionality we the risk 5 stuff instruction set stuff is uh, is there any problem or? But it's okay. Okay, it's okay. We, we can okay. see it. We just don't have it on the screen. Sorry. Go on. Okay. 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 The uh, this uh, the types, functions, and variables related to RISC-V instruction set are defined in RISC-V or RISC-V.pk file, 
and it uh, currently only supports the RV32i instruction sets, and uh, in which all instructions are 32 bit bits, and we have 32 registers uh, of uh, with 32 bit. Uh, so, so the most important type inside this pickle is RV32 instant which is a union, you can see, uh, and as like C unions, uh, at the time only one field can be active, R-I-S-P-U-J. And uh, we have six fields because there are six types of instruction formats in the RISC file. And so let's uh, look at a few uh, types of instructions in the RISC file. Okay, this is an R type instruction uh, it is uh, useful for register to register uh, functionalities. Uh, it's a 32-bit number. We have a seven bit uh, on the uh, on the most significant part, and then RS2 uh, register source two and register source one. A function three-bit functionality, and destination register, and opcode, which is seven bits. Uh, here is the uh, poke description of uh, this specification. Okay? We are defining a type here, which is uh, integral struct. It's not a struct. It is an integer, unsigned integer of bits 32, in which we want to group bits and give them names. Like here, uh, we have a uint 7, funct 7, and uint 5 for registers and stuff. And you can see that we have uh, weird uh, uh, integers in the in the poke and one uh, thing here is that uh, we call them here uh, 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 constraints you are constraining this uh, to you accept this as an r type instruction if and only if the o code is in in this array which is a set of all valid uh, of codes which belongs to this family of instructions and uh, Union uh, uses this uh, constraint to actually find out which uh, field should it select. And uh, because of some working with th these raw things, like uh, Uint uh, 7.5 is not very uh, user-friendly, we can define type aliases where IV, RV font 7 reg and R R code and so on. Uh, here is the uh, I type instruction. Uh, we have a, a register, an immediate, which is a uh, 12-bit integer, signed integer, and a destination register and all code. And you see that uh, it's very, uh, there is a direct correspondence between the description and the specification. Uh, here, I want to uh, show you, I'm adding another uh, constraint here. You can add as many as you want. Uh, this is the uh, operation uh, logical implication. If opcode is uh, jump and link register, then functionality three should be zero. You can uh, restrict your uh, definition of types and and make it more restrict uh, if you want. Okay, this is the S type. Uh, here, uh, the immediate is divided into two parts. Here, the upper part and the, the uh, lower part, and we see here and here. So we need, uh, we are adding uh, here a get im method because it's a synthesized field. We use the get underscore prefix. It's a convention in the Pope community. Here I'm concatenating, bit con uh, concatenating these two integers, bit concatenating and cast them as integer 32 bit and shift them to sign, to extend the sign. And there are other BUJ uh, formats which uh, I will not talk about. Now, let's uh, instantiate an I-type instruction, okay? Uh, here I'm using add I, uh, which is add uh, this uh, immediate to this instruction, to this register, and put the result in the X10 register, okay? Uh, this is the format for uh, I-type instructions, and here's the value we expect to put in, in those fields, and this is the uh, instantiation of this uh, RB32 instrument I in poke, which is fairly uh, readable. Okay. And we can put uh, put it into inside an RV, uh, the, the our union, the, the only type yet, and uh, we can active the I uh, field. But it's variables, we can use helper function. This is the syntax uh, for calling, it's alternative syntax for calling 
functions with uh, parameters, uh, with named parameters. You can see here we can use, um, uh, it is all, these are all defined in the risk3.pk uh, file. Or you can use the old, old school um, function called syntax. Uh, here I can uh, create uh, an instruction and put it into a variable. And I can print it. I, there are two uh, useful uh, methods for all of this instruction, as as and as poke, which generates um, assembly representation of the instruction and poke representation of the uh, instruction. These are very useful for generating. This. So here um, uh, I have three wind uh, three windows here. This uh, uh, left top window is my input. This is my pokelet for. In, uh, inserting data, communicating with the POKD. The uh, right top is the output, and uh, the, the bottom one is the presentation. Okay. Um, here I can write my POKE code I0 uh, RV32 at I RD10 RS110 and, or 11 and immediate 42. Uh, here my, in my REPL, uh, uh, Jose uses Emacs interface. He uses different uh, convention. But here in my REPL, I uh, use this convention that if a command starts with semicolon, it means that uh, show this uh, the value of this uh, expression in the output. You can here see that it's a uh, I form uh, I format instruction, and you can see the fields that are here. Uh, we can call other like printf the instruction. We can see what's going on. Yes, uh, it prints it on a single line. You can add, tell the print to use tree mode. It generates this output. You can see here, and uh, the uh, i zero dot as as it creates the textual representation in, in assembly. And we can have as poke this syntax, exactly the thing that we use to create this instruction. And we also support the other uh, syntax. This is These are useful for generating text files, which contains, um, uh, which will generate our test cases for our thing. And uh, here, if you see, uh, I'm uh, creating a bunch of um, assembly strings. This is an um, array of string. I'm uh, I'm covering all the possible immediates, and I'm generating the instruction, uh, and then uh, changing to a string and put it into this thing. Uh, we can actually run this, and uh, here now I can. Uh, as code, this is, and and we can it, uh, we can get the length of an array and so on. Um, also, there is a point that this uh, i zero is a union, as you already saw, and the active field is i. It shows the thing. If you use other uh, field, it will give you an error, and. Uh, uh, an exception that it, the the field you're access, trying to access is not uh, active, and this uh, I zero is a is a struct uh, is a integral struct. So you can use it. Uh, you can be it behaves like an integer. If I put a unary plus in front of it, it will give me the number. This is the machine code, the 32 bit machine code. That uh, if you want to. Uh, Make it more beautiful. You can change the uh, base to 16 and see this thing. The nice thing about poke is that you can use these uh, numbers and cast them to uh, instant font i. Cast them to in, uh, integral structs. Uh, the only problem is here is that you cannot do it for the instant because it's a union. For that, you have to do uh, map, memory mapping stuff. You can see here. I will not go into them. Uh, now, let's uh, test the guess. Okay, uh, here I'm creating a bunch of instructions. 
and I am and this is an array of 32 bit uh, instructions okay and uh, let me take everything is okay yes uh, and here I'm uh, creating MEDS from uh, I'm, I'm using this uh, for loop you can see okay I can select this and execute it now I have these instructions lengths it's an okay I can change the base to 10 and see the length it's 80 it's which is exactly what I expect so we have we can uh, look at the instructions zero this is the instructions we generate okay that's okay in this part I'm going to create a file like test zero one the bin which I will copy all my generated instructions into this file okay let's uh, okay now if I go here I see this test one the bin file if I do hex dump I see that it's a uh, binary file but the nice thing is that you can use object dump to actually dump uh, this assemble this uh, I save the array of instructions and I'm using object dump to disassemble it. And here you see that li load immediate is a pseudo instruction. It's an uh, synonym for add i t six zero twenty three. Okay. Now let's move on to the next part. Um, now I want to create uh, an assembly file. Okay. I'm looping over my instructions and putting the strings there and put a, a, a new line at the end of each line. Okay, let's run this code. Okay, now if I come here, I have a test uh, one, but if I open that, it's a normal thing. I can actually compile this fun uh, using the assembler. Okay, risk the 32 elf s with this uh, machines and I'm creating a test.l file okay here we have it um, and then I'm uh, copying the dot text section of my l file into this file dot alpha bin and I want to show you that both of these files have the same uh, length and also they are the same files. The I the the gas generated exactly the instructions I expected. I, I generated using the Pope. You can see here if there is a difference here. So there's a bug either in Pope or in gas. Um, next one. Okay. I just showed you that you can use. Uh, uh, No, you can use uh, uh, Opt tool to think that. And uh, in the beginning of my talk, I told you that Elf on uh, Poke understands it. So here I'm uh, loading the Elf pickle, and then I'm opening this, uh, this Elf file which I generated using the, uh, and I'm interpreted as a Elf uh, 32 file uh, from this IO space at this offset. I'm getting the text section, get text sections by name, and uh, because there's only one uh, section, I get this first one. So if I go here, you see that uh, E text is it actually a ELF uh, 32 SHR, which uh, I can extract the offset and size of this section. And uh, let me here. I can save this into these variables okay now I I can use text off and size okay and uh, here I can get the instructions from uh, the file L file inside it I'm telling poke that okay give me an array of this size I'm bounding the array using the size uh, of this kind of instruction and uh, at this offset and because I just instructions links 
it's 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 AD, uh, and I can verify that okay, these instructions is what I generated in the for loop in poke and e instructions is what I I'm reading from the L file, and the result is e one means that they are equal and everything is good, and. Uh, uh, I want to talk about bulk against and showing Steve, which is a structured diff, uh, because uh, Poke knows about the structure of binaries. It can generate more useful information and differences uh, at this stru uh, structure level. But because uh, we don't have en enough time, we want some discussion. So I have to tell you thank you. And uh, if you have any question, you can ask. Thank you again. Well, I have one question. Okay. Is it me or you turn poke into a, a into a presentation tool? <laughs> I'm, uh, my my presentation I'm tool is actually uh, is is actually a poke code running. I just wrote a simple uh, uh, poke uh, pokelet, which uh, shows these things inside the poke. It's it's okay. completely okay. poke. Yes, it's very fun. Yes. I want to show the power of folk to people, to believe that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to remove this Git repository as soon as the talk finishes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so now it's time for questions. Thank you, Mohammed. It was very interesting. So basically, sorry, just to finish, the, something like this is what we will be suggesting to actually uh, introduce in the test suites in Binutils for things like instruction sets, like you saw with RISC 5 but also for DORF, for other formats and so on. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Matt, thank you very much. This has been an eye-opener and uh, nicely timed because in 10 minutes' time, you can hear the lightning talk about, about testing the ZC star extension for RISC 5 <laughs> um, And this would have made it a lot easier because there are hundreds of tests. And I think yes. what I... My concern is this is another test infrastructure, and I think mm -hmm. if you could take this infrastructure and actually use it to generate existing, in, within the existing uh, test framework, so I can just run mm -hmm. make, check, gap. That would really be helpful. I mean, we've created something like 500 separate gas tests, I seem to recall, for ZC star, because it is 10 different sub extensions with dependencies depending yes. on which other extensions and so forth. I think great to see it done for RV 32i. I think it comes into its own when you start to see some of the new extensions coming out there. So it's a really mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's also the good thing is that you can also document your extensions and it is there. If, if, and you can use, as you already saw, are using uh, 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 for loops to generate uh, more instructions. You can do it for your extensions and it did it, it work. It, 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 it's very nice tool, I guess, yes. Okay. So I have, I hey, my question is, uh, you said that you see the poke paper format used as a documentation tool? Not like really as that a... That you can use it for, for documentation? As a way to document, and, yeah, this kind of thing, <clears throat> yeah. In this area, I know Kaita is tracked. I don't know if you know about the project, which yes, also produces something a little bit similar, so... Is there a tool to maybe convert between the formats to use one or another, um, whenever you want? Or? Okay. Um, well, KTA Extract is a project that is used very widely used for generating encoders and decoders of, of, of all sorts of formats, right? And uh, Poke, the editor, is actually something else in that, that sense. We are not competing with KTA Extracts. Why I'm saying this? Because when you write the binary, there is not one description of a binary format or a binary struct for everything. If you write a Kaita struct description of a, of a binary format, you are writing it to generate encoders and decoders in C or in C++ or whatever. When you write a pickle in poke, for using it with the poke editor, you are writing the description in order to use it interactively and immediately, you know. Also, you can write programs, as you can see, but you write it differently. 
because you are not a C program, you are not a C parser, you know, and you are, so um, the way you write your data structures, there are many descriptions for the same structure, that's the thing, that's my point. Now, for documenting a binary format, um, you could use high tie struct descriptions, but my feeling is that if you do that for documentation purposes, the description you come up with is probably not the one that you want to use for generating parsers with it. You see what I mean? But yeah, yeah, sure, there are many ways of achieving the same thing. Yeah. Also, the POC, the POC language is way better than what they use. For sure. Uh. Yeah, David. I don't know if this is a good idea, but an idea possibly is would be GCC using POC. So in terms of we're spitting out a .s assembler file, and right now we're, um, we're omitting things the assembler understands. And you've basically expanded the world of what the assembler understands. Should we go a bit higher level in the assembly, or have an option to go a higher level in the assembly that we generate? Or like, for example, omitting the dwarf sections as, um, well, I mean, we put comments in already, I think, that documenting what the dwarf looks like. But uh, do you see what I mean, that we? Uh, not really. I mean, do no. you want ECC to generate the, the POC description of the data that it generates as well? Possibly, yeah. Like, for, for various constructs that we generate, which rather than ge yeah. Maybe it's not a good idea, but it's an idea. <laughs> but those are the best. Uh, yeah. The Plan 9 uh, project, uh, the compiler uh, generates this kind of data, data structure for their ACID debugger, which is a uh, GDB plus POC is kind of some asset, so uh, you can, there is ex at least one example in the history. Yeah, yeah, but, but Muhammad, wait, 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 but, wait. but uh, we are going very fast down the hill of generating yes, executable yes, yes. POC code so the debugger executes it, right? No, no, I like this, that we have GDB, so it's, it's better for us to use GDB to generate these kind of things, and we don't need the compiler to do these kind of things. But uh, there wasn't, I just wanted to tell that there was an example in the history that uh, the compiler generates some file for this debugger, the ACID debugger in the, in the Plan 9 project. Okay, so is Nick here? Uh, he told me he was going to be here. Okay, then, the, then, he, then that means yes, right? <laughs> so the GDB people, what do you think about this? What's, what, are, what, what are your feelings? Simon, Pedro? I mean, now we have a problem, which is that the, the, POC, the POC compiler we are using, the Bohem Garbas collector, or I would say the Bohem not collector. Um, and Gail is using the same one. So we can't compile GDB with support for both Gail and Poke because then it's a mess. Uh, but we are replacing it with an ad hoc uh, moving garbage collector in Poke that will, should be ready soon. Sounds very nice. Um, and the integration doesn't affect anything else. And no, it is, it is contained. Look, it is contained. I knew you would come with that. <laughs> um, uh. GDB, Poke.c. Here, it's all in here. Right, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it seems very interesting. Uh, even though it, it creates like two languages in GGB, so it, you would have to learn something else. But um, people learn it, and then it's okay. Uh, I, I like that you you're creating these bridges between data structures in like the symbols in GDB you can export and back and forth. So I, I, I haven't played with this yet, so I I don't have a feeling for how. It, how convenient it is to use. Hmm. But uh, I like what I've seen so far, and the, uh, I'll just, another comment is, like everyone in this row commented <laughs> it as you were showing the, the dwarf idea of the testing dwarf things. We do have something like that already in GDB. I'm, I think you know it. Hmm. Uh, we, we have our own, we call it dwarf assembler. Yeah, right. It's, uh, it's written in Tickle. Um, and the idea of replacing that with Poke is, it seems viable. Uh, even though I, I think it would need more than just uh, we do we do things like uh, compile the program and then extract uh, the addresses of, of symbols, the size of functions, and then re-generate things with those constants. 
uh, but it seems doable in Poke because it's a programming language. Uh, I would be interested to see whatever you come up with testing Dwarf uh, on the Binutil side and see if we can end up with something that's shared with GDB, even though what we have does work. We already. will probably start with CTF. I didn't catch that. That we will most likely start with CTF for testing CTF and CTF frame as well. Um, that, 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 those are my comments. I don't know if other No, yeah, but you know, as a, the first examples of using POC for testing. Uh, got it, yeah. Oh. The only thing I noticed in the example where you're in GB, you, you assign the, you had a memory address and, and assign the person to the memory address. And it's really just because I talked about this this morning is eventually maybe GDB will be able to uh, refer to different memory spaces uh, using that syntax I showed this morning. So, and now this address, I guess, was in POKE syntax, so. No. No? Actually not. I mean, the, 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 you can, in, in the alien token, right? Like, I was gonna switch to the scratch buffer, but I will not because you never know what, it, what, it, what you can, will find there. So here, so um, like for example, this thing, right? You have here address and foo. I, I think you had a, like a literal zero x and hexadecimal address and then you assigned said like, I want to. Ah yeah, but that is POC syntax. Yeah, yes. So. You don't like I, the POC I was syntax. wondering if we could integrate like the, the POC language more into the like GDB, like do like set variable, like have a set then an expression equals and then like a poke expression after that so that the poke language is more integrated into GDB's expression. Oh, uh, I see. But that would be a lot more complex. But. Mm, be easily done if you can add convenience functions like yeah. dollar poke and then pass it the string. The, the, only reason, pass the, poke. the only reason the integration is just is using those ugly looking poke and poke add types uh, interface is because of my own uh, incompetence, which is blatant and well known. My point is that, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I did it this way because for me it was the fastest way, you know, of integrating. But of course, is there are better ways, like integrating evaluation of poke expressions into GDB expressions? Awesome, yeah. And regarding the problem of having two programming languages, GDB, you can remove the Python and use poke. It's a very good option, you know? Yeah. No, but no, but the thing is that uh, I know that GDB is, is it's, Python nowadays is your language of choice for extending GDB, right? I personally would prefer C, but okay, it, Python it is. Yeah. But POC it does not intend to be an, ex an extension language for GDB, not at all. And actually, POC is not a general purpose programming language. And I will resist, personally resist with violence, any attempt to actually use POC for anything that is not its domain-specific uh, domain, right? Yeah. Uh, you, men you mentioned Python, and I was about to ask, um, is there a Python extension module so that people writing Python scripts and that, that whole ecosystem of development, I guess, the, you know, are there language bindings for Poke so that Poke's speciality seems to be here's a binary layout, so like a way of like... That's where the magic okay. is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so is, are there libpoke bindings for Python for... I guess Rust. Ruby, I so have no idea. So that people can, in those languages can reuse your binary layout descriptions. I don't know if there is a, if there are libpoke bindings, uh -huh. but if what you are thinking is actually to do to do poke in Python, I don't think that's going to work. I mean, we, we are not using a domain-specific language for for the pure pleasure of it. It's fun too, but. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there are Python bindings. Mohammed, you don't know? You know? No, no, I don't no. think. You can use PokeD, it's a better approach than using yeah. Poke if, if for other languages. Okay, we, yeah, yeah, we have to go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mohammed. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jose.
Okay. Good. I can. I'm still visible when I'm switching the yeah, slides, right? I, I can deal with the keys. I hope it doesn't turn off and I need a password. When I'm talking too long, the probably not. Is user, but, uh, okay. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Uh, good. Everything set? Yeah, I think so hello. Nice to see so many people again after quite some years. Uh, today I am going to talk about value numbering in GCC, covering work I've done I think four or five years ago, but I haven't yet talked about it. Uh, so. First, what is volume, value numbering? Uh, value numbering is the task of assigning values, value IDs to expressions to be able to identify multiple expressions as computing the same value. That's, for example, used in common sub-expression elimination. Right? So expressions that produce the same value, they should have ideally the same value number. Um, the process of assigning the value number can be very easy if the, if the expression is even syntactically equivalent or can be more difficult if it's a variation, like if you have a value multiplied by two or the value added to itself. Ideally, you would like to assign the same value number to those expressions, but it's of course more difficult to do that if they are not syntactically equivalent. And usually um, implementations use a form of hashing to um, equate the, those expressions. And before actually hashing a new expression, you, they uh, replace all operands by their value number so that you basically have expressions of values which you then assign either an existing or a new value number. So in GCC, we of course have a very many value numbers. And as I wasn't there when GCC was invented originally, but only joined like a few years later, uh, let me see, a wild guess might be 15 years later, could, could match uh, kind of that. At, at that point, we at least had the, the CSE lib. Um, which is used by RTL, CSE, but also some other passes in the RTL pipeline. For example, um, VAR tracking and let's uh, give the pending question. Uh, I, I think RTL SSE actually does not use SSE lib. It's used by other, all other places in RTL, but not not in CSE. CSE, yeah, it, it has its own hashing. Also, oh, so, so it, uh, yeah, okay. 
<laughs> so so, so what's, the, what's the main user of CSELib then, apart from VAR tracking? If you, if you remember. I don't know. I, I know about while tracking okay. because that's I cared about. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I checked and RTL PRE is also not using CSELib, but it's basically just using hash RTX and RTX equal, which is then probably also what CSE does plus some enhancements. Uh, so I was wrong. The slides are wrong. Um, and then at, at some point, Later, when I already was uh, working on GCC, we had uh, Gimple and SSA. And on Gimple SSA, we have at least two main value number. One is implemented in the dominator optimization pass. It's now uh, even abstracted into a separate file, at least, with some class thing. So C++, you know. Uh, it's called scoped trees there. It's basically the, uh, the expression hashing and e equality implementation of the dominator optimization, uh, expression equivalence tracking and uh, redundancy removal. And then we have the other value numbering that's used by the full, full and partial redundancy elimination passes. So full redundancy elimination is basically common sub-expression elimination. So it's, this, it's a different term for, for the same thing. Um, and that's now since GCC 9. Uh, the, it's a, a reverse post order, order walk based value numbering. And previously, there were two other ways of doing the value numbering before the current implementation. Uh, and then, of course, you could say um, we have more passes doing kind of value numbering, even if they don't really assign value IDs or value numbers to expressions. That's like uh, constant propagation, where um, the constants itself are the values. And you substitute them everywhere, uh, you simplify, and if there's a new magic constant coming out of the expression, then you have a new value. So it's also kind of a value numbering with just constant values. Or you have copy propagation, which is kind of, uh, it's, it, it's not, not really computing values, but, but the copies are also kind of values, where you basically substitute the, the uh, earliest source of the copy operation into the last destination. So all the intermediate registers have the same value as the original copy. So how does common sub-expression work, uh, common sub-expression elimination work? So for each statement, you, you try to simplify um, the, the expression using the value numbers of the operands, like if some value numbers are actually constants, then like with constant propagation, it can happen that you have a fully constant expression, which you can fully evaluate, or that you have special constants for special operations, like multiplication by one or zero, so that you can simplify the, the operation. Uh, after you've simplified the expression, you try to look up the expression in your uh, table of, of existing expressions you've already seen, to see if it's equivalent to an already seen expression, and you can use the same value number as the already seen one. And if you don't, uh, if, if, you, if you couldn't find the, the value in the table of existing expressions, you assign a new value number, right? And, um, you, um, and for the, the actual elimination of the common sub-expression, when you find an already existing value, then re you replace the later expression with a register that's known to hold this value, for which you need to track the basically availability of values in registers or where they are available else. Like constants are always available, depending on what your intermediate language provides. So, and if you do not find the expression, then uh, you, you you invent a new value number and record the destination of the expression as the register where that value is available. 
for later uses if you find them. So, um, and a few words about availability. There are actually different ways to track an update or query the availability. For example, the dominator optimization pass uh, can, can just keep a one-to-one -one map of, uh, available, um, of available, of available, can track, use a map from, from the, the, the value to the, the SSA name, where the, the SSA name is available during the dominator walk, and uh, when unwinding from the dominator walk, it can just basically use, use an undo stack to, to restore the operation, uh, to restore the uh, availability state. Um, the, the, uh, value numbering based on the re reverse post order walk um, does it a little bit different because there's no no easy way to to implement the unwinding step you can you can do with the dominator walk instead it records a list of um, leaders so re registers that are where a value is available and to, together with that, where uh, that leader is actually, yeah, so it, it records that list, and, and of course it has, when it then queries availability, it has to, from this list, pick uh, one of the candidates that's actually available at the point where the query is, and it uses a dominator checks for that. Uh, the, the reason why it's kind of that that complicated is because the reverse post, post order value numbering um, also allows optimistic iteration, which means it needs to unwind some of its state. And uh, this way, having a, a list of uh, leaders per value, it, it's very easy to unwind that by just stripping off the, 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 the leaders produced uh, up to the, the iteration point. So there's, there's one, one other way for availability, like the, the partial redundancy elimination pass for its data flow problem uh, to compute the anticipability. Uh, it, it actually has bitmaps of uh, values that are available for each basic block, which Basically, it, it, it needs quadrat quadratic uh, memory because every value that's available in a block that uh, dominates any other block is also available in, in, the, in the later block. And so it basically uses a quadrat quadratic amount of memory, which is sometimes a, a problem. So the uh, new reverse post order value numbering um, is, is specifically also using uh, these uh, available expressions when simplifying the expressions of values. Um, because if you like have two um, equivalent expressions, it can matter which of the actual available register you use when you simplify because in, in our Gimple SSA we have, at e for each register, attached information like a value range. And so even for two syntactically equivalent expressions that are computed at different points in the CFG, um, they, they can actually be different, differently constrained due to uh, conditionals, con conditions they uh, are dominated by, right? So it, it actually matters if you like throw generic fold or match PD rules onto an expression, which of the of the available registers you use as operands, because of co if you pick up one with the wrong range, you possibly uh, perform a, a, a wrong simplification. So that means before the RPO CSE 
does expression simplification. It substitutes um, available leaders into all the operands to avoid this issue. So the old implementation just cleared all the, uh, the flow sensitive information on all SSA names before well, do it performing the value numbering and restored it afterwards. <coughs> yes? Presumably, you're afraid of losing information if you, if you take one or the other SSA, right? With regards to ranges? So if you, if you get the wrong range, you get wrong code. Can you union them? Because now we have a way, we have fine-grained ranges in the global space, right? Well, now. if you if you would, you could probably union all of the available information, but then you have to walk through all of them, right? So if you have two instances of the same expression, where one operand for one expression is like always positive, and on the other side it's always negative, because you have a condition which right. just tests that and you do the simplification and it says, well, for negative values, this is always zero because it's undefined or whatever. And you are actually simplifying the other expression, but in, in the expression hash table where the expression exists only once with the, with the actual value numbers as operands, then it, then, uh, it of course, it matters which of the expressions you simplify. Because we, <coughs> we have a way of, well, not only union them, but yeah. any expression, we have ways of, of folding the expression without the overhead of the ranger or gory or anything. There's the range op tables. You can take an expression and you yeah. can do the operation on the ranges if that helps. So, so possibly if we were to find all the leaders of a value, we could compute the union of this kind of information and produce basically a, a master value range. That's, but that's probably effectively what the original implementation does, drop to varying, right? So the, the, the advantage of the, the new approach is that we can actually use the correct range information when simplifying, if it's there. And we are not generating wrong code if we happen to pick the wrong one. So the old implementation generated wrong code, which is why we then uh, resorted to clearing all of the information. So yeah, I already said everything on the slide. So this, the same uh, applies to, um, on, on the points to info, we now have the non-zero, which is uh, used at, at some points that's now also flow sensitive. So there's, there's more and more information that's flow sensitive that's attached to SSA names. So it's, it's, it was problematic in general to basically just use random representatives for the operands um, and, and not those that are valid at the program point, you're actually simplifying the expression. Yeah, uh, now, um, all of what I said before for syntactical equivalent expressions and assigning the same value number to them is a little bit more complicated when there's memory involved. Because, of course, a load of A is not the same as a load of A if you have them do them at different program points because there might be other statements in between that modify A, right? With the nice thing about SSA form is that if two SSA uh, variables appear in an expression, you know they have the same value, right? Because it's SSA. But with memory, that doesn't work. Um, so on Gimple, actually, we, we, we try to have also kind of SSA for memory, but we don't have it for the actual memory locations, but only for the global memory state. So basically, each time the global memory state is modified, we assign a new SSA name to the global memory state. So that is, we have a single uh, underlying variable, the dot mem variable, that represents, represents the memory state, and we write that into SSA. So for this example above, you can see we store um, zero to the A member of the object P points to, one into the B member, and then we do an aggregate copy of the aggregate into a different variable, and then load from the A member again. You see the two stores, 
introduce new uh, SSA definitions and actually record which of the memory state SSA variables is, if, is in effect before the statement and the definition describes the memory state after the statement, right? So how does um, value numbering work in, 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 in that case? So the, the most simplistic thing is uh, in addition to the expression, which would be, for example, for the last load, just x.a, uh, also uh, factor in the, the current memory state. Right, so the expression is not only x.a, but it's x.a at dot mem5. And then hash that and see if you have another x.a at mem5, okay, they would be equivalent. And then we can assign the same value number to that. <coughs> of course, that's very simplistic. And it doesn't get us very far, but it probably would help in some cases already. Um, instead, what we do is we basically query, do we have x.a uh, at memory state 5? And it's, well, no, we don't. Okay, then let's try follow the use def chain of the mems. Uh, from the version 5, we get to the store of x, the aggregate copy, and at that point, we see, oh, well, we modify x. So we, we, we can't trivially look further. But we have some magic in the value numbering, which can then see, ah, maybe I can rewrite the expression I'm looking up, the x.a, in terms of the right-hand side of this copy. And so we continue looking for uh, the a member of the object p points to. And we are using the memory state mem4 for that. And then we arrive at, oh, we, we don't have it in the hash table. So we, we walk one step further. We arrive at the store of uh, b of the object p points to. And we see, well, that doesn't alias what we are looking for. So we can just skip to the next statement. So then we look for p. Uh, dash a at memory state three, and then we can actually find that because when we visited the first store, we have inserted that into the hash table and assigned a value number to it. So right, that, that looks quite expensive, and it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically where in, in, in regular programs, it's 80% of the CSE time is spent in this kind of walking the program to find memory redundancies. But of course, those are the most important to optimize. <coughs> so for example, the, the dominator optimization, CSE, has a neat trick here. It actually records the x.a in, into the, so it doesn't work for this example, but imagine the, the store would be also to x.a at the very top and not via the aggregate copy. But it, it records the x.a into the hash table and at lookup time, even if there are intermediate statements that possibly clobber things, it will find that and the memory state that was associated with it. So it knows, oh, there is something, so it's worth doing the walk. And it basically just verifies, is that a correct answer? That's kind of clever, but it breaks down once you support the fancy things like the aggregate copy, because, because. But it's still on like the to-do list. Try to do something like that, also for the complicated thing. Yeah, well, the obvious improvement would be to record stuff also on the, when you see an aggregate copy, right? You would then walk through all expressions that are available for the dereferenced right-hand side and optimistically record something also for the left-hand side. Then you, would, yeah. then you would find it earlier, but that of course comes at the expense of memory because your hash tables yeah. become larger and larger without guarantee that you actually ever look up yeah. whatever you recorded. So 
that that's the two things yeah. right, you can do. So, but we, we are doing this for quite some years now, and um, since since all of the walks like this are, are limited, so we do I think at max walk thousand statements or five hundred. So it's constant time. You know, we win. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's the trick, you know, you write a paper. It's a constant time value numbering <laughs> for not too big programs. No. Okay, yeah, that's, that's what I told you already, right? So the, the, there's the list of the fancy tricks. The, one of the tricks that was in the example was the, the aggregate copy, but there's of course tricks like if you have um, like a, a memz to some value, and then you have a read of just a piece of the memory the memz touched, we can actually basically reinterpret some, some uh, byte sequences as the, the type you are looking up. Or like if there's a mem copy, we can treat it similar to the, to the aggregate copy. Or that's the, I think the most recent uh, improvement there is collecting the value we are looking up, like for example, imagine you load a vector of integers, uh, but you only have stores that store the individual elements. But we can now pick them all up and produce a vector as the result of the load. That works nicely if it's a constant vector in the end, because then we have a value number by itself. But it's, it, it helps to, to remove abstraction that's, for example, used by Firefox because they do vectors manually, at least in the that's gated with MI, not LLVM. Yeah, and as I said, the memory handling consumes all of the compile time of the CSE. So uh, I didn't yet get to motivate why did we re-implement the value numbering methodology again. Um, so the, the, the previous one before the reverse, reverse post author walk based was um, uh, one working on SSCs of SSA, of the SSA graph, which is quite nice because if you have cycles, in the SSA graph, the, the iteration that you then perform when you have a, a value numbering that iterates, I will have an example later why that's even a thing, uh, then, then you get the, the minimal set of statements you need to iterate uh, the value numbering on. Um, the difficulty is that if you are working on the SSA graph, um, then it's, it's difficult to exploit things like conditional, um, conditional predicates, conditional equivalences, because it, it doesn't match to the CFG, right? But it's, it's difficult, it's not impossible, because I actually managed to bolt on something like that on the old implementation. But it's a little bit awkward. Um, and so the, the, the main motivation to, to do the rewrite was actually to, to make the whole thing also work on regions of the CFG. Because again, when you work on the SSA graph, it's difficult to map a region of the CFG to a region of the SSA graph, right? Because it, it's just not a natural fit. And of course, there was talks for some years, well, that we need to replace the algorithm with a reverse post order work one. So that, that's another reason, but it's not a good reason usually. So what can this new value numbering now do? So it, it can actually operate in, in different modes for this memory handling, this ex, uh, expensive one. It can actually do this, this very trivial one, not do any walking at all, and just use the exact, uh, look for the exact same memory state. Right, so then it's, it's quite cheap. Um, it can do the walking, but not the fancy tricks like the, the aggregate copying. 
So for that case, we could actually implement the same trick as the dominator optimization, which, which might be a good idea. Um, it can do iterating or non-iterating mode, um, especially when doing the non-iterating mode, it can do uh, all the value numbering and the elimination in a single pass over the statements, which is quite cache-friendly in that case. For the, with, in the iterating mode, it basically performs value numbering of the whole function with iteration, and if all the value numbers are found, it needs another pass over the function or, or the region to then do the elimination, which is, yeah, so at, you at least have two passes over the IL with the iterative mode in that case. And of course, it can do, it can work on regions, actually single entry and multiple exit regions. In theory, handling multiple entries should be possible, but I'm currently disallowing that because, because, because I didn't test it, probably. It's like also the, the region mode currently disallows iteration because I also didn't test it. There, it, it might have bugs to say. So uh, why is this iterating thing, what, what's that about? So the, the, this is the, the classical example, you have a loop, that's, I should have put the C code on the side, but I was learning new uh, slides, tools, and I didn't figure out how to do that. <laughs> um, so it's actually a quite simple example. I will just uh, describe the, program, the source program with words. It's a loop that will actually not iterate, right? But we don't know yet. So uh, what happens if you do not iterate, uh, then you come from function entry and you run into the basic block three where you have two incoming edges, right? So for the back edge, the back edge value on, on the fee nodes where, the two, where two SSA versions are merged, you don't know the value of the uh, SSA name on the back edge. So it's still varying, kind of. It's actually top, but in non-iteration mode, you have to treat those as, as, uh, as varying. That means you, you don't know the value of i and well when you enter the loop, which means you don't know if the jump at the end of the loop is taken or not, which means you can't eliminate it. When you are iterating, uh, then, you can treat the package as optimistically as not executing. So you can ignore the values from the package and you can constant propagate the, the zeros from the indexation variable. Uh, that's actually the, the important value we have to, to value number here, right? And then, so if you get further, it, the i1 is zero, then the i7 is two, and n is one, but that doesn't actually change. So you know, we know that we will exit the loop. And then we will arrive at a function end and we are done. And we have not made the back edge ex executable and can statically optimize this branch. When we change the example to make the loop actually iterate, right, then we would statically determine that the back edge is taken. And then uh, we see, oh, okay, we're actually going back in our reverse post-order walk with this edge, and then we, we iterate this region of blocks. Basically, we start again and see, oh, now we have a value for i7 and val8, and the edge is executable. We merge it with the original one, and we see, well, merging zero and, and one, yeah, that, that gets us varying, which means we, we, we discard the old value of i1 and have it, it the value, a, a new value number. We are using the SSA name itself for the varying here. And then we can't statically determine the condition anymore, so we need to make the loop exit edge also executable, 
and finally value number the rest and well then we, we know nothing if the loop iterates even if it iterates exactly twice right so the this most interesting case oh, is only interesting when the loop doesn't iterate it doesn't help us if we know it iterates twice or three times it was all it would also help if we know if the loop always iterates and never exits but yeah so the, actually i think there are not very many cases where the iterative value numbering really helps but i'm curious if somebody can uh, think of other cases at least on my my, my to do is i should probably try to instrument that and see where it produces something useful because iteration is another source of the time sink of the path because it actually scales with loop depth right so like if you have a loop depth of five you will iterate five times at least because you need one iteration to make a package executable if you have n packages you iterate n times but of course it's limited to a maximum loop depth so it's constant time again so for the for the outer loops we then force varying to the loop back edges and so we don't get the iteration if, if those beyond the maximum loop depth so we only iterate the innermost loops where it's the most interesting thing to discover that it won't iterate so i have a slide on the iteration scheme interesting so yeah uh, so one one um, important thing for for iteration is so if he had the old uh, value numbering implementation on the sccs of the ssa graph it would just iterate until nothing change, changes basically right uh, for for each element of the scc compute value numbers and if they are still the same then you are finished um, that's reasonable for the ssa graph thing because the cycles are small uh, but with if you always visit all statements in a basic block even if you are just interested in in a few variables then it's sometimes a little bit excessive and if you use a, a random reverse post order so there are many reverse post orders depending on how exactly your depth first walk uh, walks the function uh, then then the region of the blocks in your reverse post order you need to iterate can actually be quite large so the the uh, I attempted to optimize this first question. I, I just want to mention that if you remember that the, the SCCs in the SSR graph, well, no, the SSCs of the SSR graph were not always small. Uh, with the memory operand, yeah, it basically covered whole loop nests. So the that's, argument that's true. Uh, for, the, for, for, for the memory, that's true. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still just a part of the function part of the loop and not all statements right uh, what did i yeah um, so the first thing was to try to optimize the reverse post order in a way so that the the consecutive blocks in this reverse post order um, are basically um, are consecutive to form regions of the, the smallest iteration. Uh, so how, how would one say this? Mm. Basically, um, blocks inside of the same loop should be uh, after each other, and only then blocks from outside of the loop were visited. So basically, when you do the, the depth first walk, and if you have the choice to exit the loop or stay in the loop, you exit the loop first. So that's counterintuitive, but you exit the loop first. 
So, and for this, because we have this reverse, right? So, um, but for this, of course, you, you need to know um, whether you're going to exit the loop or not. You can say, well, we have loop information. It, that's true, but uh, there are other kinds of cycles, like the irreducible regions, which our loop structures doesn't cover, but you still, of course, need to value number them. Um, for this, there was a paper, I think, actually Michael found at some point, um, about some new loop discovery thing um, that's now used by this rev post order end mark DFS back ZME function, which is uh, computing this kind of um, reverse post order that's optimized for iteration. And when you ask it to do that, then it first does this kind of loop computation. So it performs two DFS walks in that case. And it also um, can compute the, post, the reverse post order of a region of the CFG, which is important if you try to limit the compile time to the region size, basically, to be in the order of the region size. Um, yeah, so, and uh, the, the actual value numbering, it, it doesn't actually iterate until nothing changes, but it tries to anticipate if, if we were iterating, if any value would change. And the obvious candidate is, of course, to look only at the, the, the fee nodes of, uh, at the fee nodes in the destination of the back edge, and if, if you can compute whether the values of those will change, then you know, of course, there could be downstream changes. And if you can compute that they don't change, then you can say, can you, you can say they won't change. And that works actually quite well, but it's a little bit more complicated than I said, because it's always details. Um, you can look into the implementation if you like. Um, so to optimize the cost, it was um, important to, to design all the data structures in a way that we can actually unwind to the block we, we are restarting the iteration from. Um, for the value numbering, what you actually unwind is the hash table contents because you might have inserted expressions that are not uh, valid or that are basically wrongly optimized. Um, and the, the availability, because you're, yeah, you're basically, the availability needs to track the, the state of the iteration. And, but the, the, the values, they are kept the same. So basically, you could also iterate until nothing changes on the, uh, in the value table. Um, yeah, so, and so the, the data structures are implemented in a way uh, that, that the cost of the unwind to the iteration start, to the iteration restart point is of the order of the, the size of the iteration, basically, of the work done for, uh, from the last iteration. And I already said, the dependence on the loop depth. But yeah, and so we are iterating the inner cycles before iterating the outer cycles. One could also try to always iterate the biggest cycle, but that was actually slower in, in, pra in practice on CC1 files, which is everything that matters for writing papers, because spec 2000 is no longer a thing. So the, the more interesting uh, mode, at least for the, the original purpose of the value numbering is the, the non-iterative mode, uh, because that's what you want to use when you're um, doing the CSE on a region, like we are now doing in, in many places. I have a slide on that. Um, and that's basically doing a greedy walk from the anterior edge, doing the value numbering, doing the elimination, and at each control statement, um, determine, can I statically determine the branch or not? And basically, all edges that might be executables are then queued into a work list, and we pick from that in the reverse post order to 
produce the optimal result. <coughs> and <coughs> so as I said <coughs> in the example, <laughs> the um, package values we have to consider are uh, varying because we, we didn't yet compute a value number for them from them when we are not iterating. And so we have to be conservative on them, which means we, compared to the iterative mode, we might miss some of the optimizations. But if you have like um, CFG merges, those fees, fee nodes are of course uh, used optimally even, so when you statically determine a condition always going to through the true edge, and then you reach a CFG merge after that, uh, we can still ignore the, the known not taken incoming edge from the, from the other fee argument. So the, the, one of the main uh, reasons of the, the rewrite was that we kind of needed more and more places where we want to perform some kind of scalar cleanup, uh, like after loop unrolling, after some high-level loop transform that doesn't also want to deal with uh, replacing all the redundancies in, in data references. Um, and so we now accumulated quite a number of places where we do CSE on a region, basically on some pass applies a transform, and on this region we then apply, well, CSE, clean things up. And the, the first use was on loop unrolling, where the, the loop unrolling pass starts with unrolling the inner loop, the innermost loop of a loop nest, and then if that's completely unrolled, sees <coughs> is it profitable to also unroll the outer loop. And if you don't clean up the unrolled code, then all the size estimation is of course slightly off. So the fix is, well, run CSE on, on the unrolled body. Then you have nicer code, which you can just do statement counting and apply your limits to. And then you get much better heuristics for whether you want to do outer loop unrolling or not. So the, the last edition was, I think, the, the early uninit analysis. You now uses the uh, RPO value numbering to compute reachability on, in the unoptimized code. So it's basically only for O0, but it only computes the value numbers for that. So it doesn't do any, any elimination because it's O0, it shouldn't optimize, right? And it can do that, and, and the only output that's used currently is basically the, the state, the executable state of the edges that allows to avoid diagnostics in that code and also avoids, uh, also allows it to diagnose more cases that were previously not diagnosed because they were conditional, but they are not really conditional in real. And of course, you know, C++, lots of abstraction and templates and yeah, the, the, the code that's fed into the early unended analysis is kind of big most of the times. But yeah, so the, the value numbering doesn't yet do inlining, so it doesn't help that much for the abstraction, but it helps a little bit. And that's actually the, the API that you can use to perform value numbering or common sub-expression elimination on uh, a region of the CFG. First, you need to specify the CFG, that's basically the, the function. Uh, an entry edge, and you have a bitmap of basic blocks you exit to. So that's not the basic blocks where the exit ed edge um, starts, but where it ends. Because uh, basic blocks of edges, uh, bitmaps of edges are kind of not possible. This is why I use the blocks we exit to. It works nicely. Uh, and it, you, you can specify the mode, whether you want the iterative mode, whether you want to perform the elimination, and how much effort you want to 
uh, do on the memory, right? We have the, the simplistic, this is the no walk. We have the walk, that's basically what the dominator optimization does. Just skip the non-aliasing statements and look for exact matches. And then we have fancy, it's called walk rewrite, which does the fancy stuff as well. And then as, as part of the development, the, you know, there is now also these, this RPO compute thing that works on, on a region and that also marks DFS edges on, on the fly because we are doing the DFS walk anyway and then you know the back edges are those that actually correspond to the DFS walk that specify the, RP, the, the reverse post order and not some other back edges in, in, irredu in irreducible regions that might actually matter that we perform the same DFS walk. Um, and uh, also as part of making this basically constrained to uh, complexity of the region size, there is now the auto basic block flag and auto edge flag where you can allocate bits of the uh, edge and basic block flex bitmap, so the, the integer that's there in the data structure, where there's, for example, the edge DFS back uh, statically allocated bit. And that with that, you can, for example, replace uh, things like the S bitmap that's used in the, in the other RPO compute function, which, of course, has an initialization time that's at the order of the function size and not the region size. And it's also quite cache friendly because you're testing the flex of the edges and blocks anyway, or at least the numbers because those are near to them. So it's, it works quite nicely. The, the only disadvantage is that you have to clear all the flex before you finish. So a little bit about uh, efficiency. So the, the startup cost should be linear in the size of the region you process. And if you do the no walk um, memory thing um, and not do elimination, then uh, I have actually done the measurements on CC1 files uh, by instrumenting the full redundancy pass to first perform the region thing on each individual basic block um, compared to doing the same analysis on the whole function. So that was the only thing I could come up with that compares apples and apples because once you do any elimination, you then compare, well, already eliminated, so it's, yeah. And then if you use, uh, look at the CC1 files, you get an overhead of 15% which isn't too bad, I think. So it's basically, um, it's, it says that the, 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 ex, the startup cost and the cost of, yeah, basically it's, it's not existent or it's very slow, it's, it's very low. Um, there's, there's one outlier, which is the instant utter tab, which has very many empty basic blocks, which, um, is 280% slower because, of course, for the empty basic blocks, it's totally only the initialization overhead. It's, it's of course, there because we do something, right? We allocate memory, we compute the reverse post order of the single basic block because I obviously didn't optimize for the single basic block case. So it's, it's quite okay. Um, when you do not the no walk memory handling, but the normal walk, you can't really compare this anymore because the, the single basic block value numbering will stop the walking at the boundary of the region, but the whole function thing will go very much up. So it will have, it will be a lot cheaper to do the per, per basic block operation in that case than the whole function thing, which is of course backwards. But it would also catch more optimization in theory. Right, so uh, w what this tells us is that when you have some high-level transform and you think, well, we should do scalar cleanup afterwards, then it's a good idea to not schedule another 
full redundancy elimination pass after that pass, but instead run the region-based CSE on the, like the loop you transformed, or maybe get also the pre-header block into it and the exit block, so you can enlarge it slightly to, to, to get some more opportunities. Do that, even if you think, oh, but what happens when I have a loop uh, function with very many loops and I do this very many times? So that shouldn't be an issue in practice, right? And it's still a lot better because usually your high-level transform doesn't trigger on all of the loops. So there's, there's one thing missing, of course, in the scalar cleanup uh, when you do common sub-expression elimination. Um, it actually does perform uh, removal of the no longer needed statements, um, including rematerializing um, values it removed on, on the exit edge because not all users can always be replaced in region-based mode because I, I'm not replacing outside of the region. So it, 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 it can happen that uh, the region-based CSE will insert copies on that edge for that reason, because I didn't replace everything. Um, and yeah, yeah, so what's missing is uh, basically that code elimination. There we have some work list-based simple D DCE, but you need some seed SSA names for that to work. And uh, that store elimination is also, also not uh, available uh, region aware. So those would be two things to tackle for the true scalar cleanup, right? Um, yeah, so the, the, the new reverse post order um, CSE has kind of, so, so the, the code says it's predicated values but so it's it's basically a, a, um, a hack to to have relations doing the value numbering. So basically, what what Ranger now can do um, to if if you have um, a, a comparison, i is less than than j, and later you have a, a check is i less or equal than j then value numbering can, via this predication, figure out that uh, the, the later condition is true. It basically, it does that by, by inserting on, 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 on the edge into the expression hashes uh, the value for i is smaller than j with the value true, right? And, and at the conditions, it looks up do I have an expression for i is less than or equal j? And it will find one of these with the corresponding value. And like just an abstract, you know, x and y. You could just use the the, the relational oracle we use, and you don't need to bring in the full ranger if that helps in any way. You know, the path where x is greater than y, and then you ask if x is greater than or equal to y, you can do that without the full use of the ranger, with just the relational oracle. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, it's, it's basically on the list to see how ranger can be used there. So it's, it's, it's mostly an, an issue only for the very first uh, full redundancy elimination pass, because afterwards we have the value range propagation, which will optimize all these. So it's basically to get as much optimized early as possible. Um, and originally we didn't have the capability, so it was really required. So one idea is to just kick it out again. And the other idea is to see what we can leverage. I think for, for the non-iterating uh, non iterating mode, I can just even fire up Ranger, right? But when I do the iteration, I would have to somehow also unwind what Ranger thinks it has for state. That's going to be more difficult. So, yeah. 
And it's, it's, it's always bad if you have the, the weaker mode do more than the stronger mode. So that's, yeah. And there, then there are, there, there's a pending change that I actually reviewed this morning on the bus, at least uh, offline, so I didn't send out a review yet, uh, to add even equivalence tracking in, in the same awkward way I did the predication, which I'm, try, I, I, yeah, I'm pushing this for like one and a half years now because I don't like how I did the predication. And so, of course, I don't really like to bolt even more on top of that. But yeah, so equivalence tracking is another thing that Ranger can do. But I would also need to see how that can be used, if that's useful or not. And, and I'm not sure. Yeah. You feel free to experiment. <laughs> now you know everything about value numbering. <laughs> so I think I only have one more slide. Yes. <laughs> Questions? And I think we are also out of time, right? Yeah. yeah. Is there a last question? No? Then uh, thank you.